Can I start? Yes. Okay. Namaskar, everybody. It gives me great pleasure to invite everyone for this first ever Indica conference on Hindu arts, architecture, and artisan traditions. It is a subject that has been very close to my heart personally and uh, to the heart of everyone at Indica. And this is largely a labor of love. I've had a huge learning curve in going through the papers, in, uh, in deciding what to take and what not to take. And I have tremendous respect for all the scholars who have participated in this conference and the topics that they have chosen. Just reading the abstracts of those topics was a huge, tremendous learning curve for me. Because we all know that in India, arts, architecture, and artisan traditions are not meant for the sake of art itself. They are meant as an offering to the divine. And this is what we have seen in our scriptures. This is what we have seen in the day-to-day -day activities of our uh, artists. I have gone to many places, many weaving clusters, many arts and craft clusters. And when I've seen artisans at work, there has always been this feeling of dedication, this feeling that this is not just a job I'm doing, but that this is an offering that I'm doing. My art is an offering. I am Vishwakarma's child and my art is an offering to the divine is the feeling that we have even today. And it does not matter if in the course of time, the people practicing these arts have changed their faith. They are not worshipping probably the same gods that they used to worship. But this feeling that the loom is Lakshmi uh, is the same regardless of what is the faith of people. And I've seen that. I've seen that in Muslim weavers also who treat the loom as Barkat. And they also have their own version of uh, sort of, uh, you know, looking after the loom. and. There are rituals everywhere. In Orisha, for example, in Gopalpur, there is a festival called uh, on, on the day of Ghoda Navmi, where all the children in the village, they make straw horses and they do the puja to the looms. And the first naivedyam is offered to the loom that day no weaving takes place, that day the loom is given rest because the loom is treated as Lakshmi. And every article that is woven by the weavers is an offering to that Lakshmi. You know, years ago, when we built a house, when we built our own house in Pune, we had a carpenter who was from Rajasthan. And every single day when he started work, before he started work, just once, give me one second, please. I'll just share uh, the live. I'm not able to see this on Facebook. Is it live? Yes, yes, ma'am. It is on live on Facebook. We shared on the chat box. No, I can't access the chat box because my phone is the screen. Just give me two minutes, please, till I sort this out. Yeah. Okay. Sorry about that. So as I was saying, when I built my own house uh, for the interiors, I had a carpenter from Rajasthan. And every single day before he started work, he would put all his implements in a line, put a flower on them and just stand in silence for about a minute or so with folded ends every single day before he started work. And on Amavasya, he didn't work because he said that that was the rest day and that was the day they do Vishwakarma Puja. That's when I realized that this tradition of worshipping Vishwakarma and doing everything that you are doing as an offering to the divine and the spiritual basis to Hindu art, architecture, sculpture and artisan traditions is very much alive today despite so many disruptions in our political scenario, despite the colonial rule, despite so many assaults on our traditions. And that is a thing that we still carry. And you see that everywhere. So even today, when you go to Kanjipuram to do wedding shopping, most of the weavers and even the big shops in Kanjipuram, they'll have a small temple in their store 
and when the bride and groom go there for their wedding shopping when their clothes are finally chosen the weaver or the owner of that shop will do a small puja a small ritual kind of a thing they will bless those clothes and they will offer those clothes to the bride and groom the feeling is we Clothing, it to you. It's not just it as a good and auspicious thing. And we hope that this article of clothing that we have woven with love and devotion will bring you the same kind of happiness. And that sort of feeling is there everywhere. Even today, we have sculptors, we have sculptors. Before they start any new job, before they start carving any new murti, and of course, you will learn about it later as you as we see the papers. They will pray in front of the block of wood or block of stone before even putting, uh, touching their implements. That is the sort of faith and reverence that our artists, artisans, tapatis, sculptors have for their work even today. And it's remarkable. Nowhere else in the world would you see a traditional sculptural, uh, a, a cultural capital like this that we have in India, which is reflected in art even today. And you see that in pretty much everything, even the articles that are used for our everyday use, even the strictly utilitarian articles like quilts, like brooms, like uh, like the mortar and pestle, even those things, nobody really looks at them as works of art, right? But if you go to the traditional artist and if you see uh, a lady in a village who is doing the quilt, you will see that she's not just doing it as a utilitarian object. She's doing it as a labor of love. It's a story she's telling. So the way she'll put those old pieces of sari together, there is a certain aesthetic behind it. There is a certain feeling of this is what I'm offering as an act of love for my family. This is an act of love this is an act of devotion to the divine that feeling is there everywhere recently i went to odisha and i saw brooms there selling outside the temple these are ordinary brooms okay which people use to clean their houses they don't have to be a thing of beauty in cities you don't find beautiful brooms nowadays when you see buy custom made brooms from factories they're not beautiful and nobody wants them to be beautiful either but when you go to a village, you will find that even the brooms are woven in such a way that the top of the broom has got a definite pattern. It's got a definite uh, beauty to it. And that is what dharma is. Dharma is doing everything that you do, creating everything that you create as an act of worship, as an act of offering to the divine. And that is why it is sacred. That is why it is an act of worship. And you see that in our weaves, you see that in the jewelry that we make, you see that obviously in temple architecture and the murtis that we make, you see that in the, in, the, in the way spaces are planned, in the way our architecture is planned, you see that in how our clothes are woven, you see that in the rangoli that we draw every day outside our houses, you see that in every article that Indians have been creating traditionally and considering themselves Indian artisans as Vishwakarma's children and that everything that they do has got a scriptural basis to it. It's a journey from secular to the sacred. Everything is not what it seems. The broom is not just a broom. It is an implement to basically uh, turn your spaces clean to ensure that uh, you're moving from from, cleanlin from uncleanliness to cleanliness, from darkness to light. And therefore, it is an offering made to divine. Stella Kremrish had talked about it. I'm going to quote her. She describes the ways of Indian craftsmen in the following words. She says, the Indian craftsman conceives of his art not as his own, nor as the accumulated skill of ages, but as originating in the divine skill of Vishwakarma and revealed by him. This is how our sacred texts, the Agamas, the Puranas, the Shilpa Shastras, the Vastu Shastras, trace the tradition of craftsmen back to Vishwakarma, the fountainhead of all knowledge. The awareness of this tradition exists even today among our artists, sculptors, tapatis, weavers, artisans, even performing artists. All creative work is offered as a sacred offering to the divine. And in all parts of India, that's why to this day, all the craftsmen worship their tools on Ayudha Puja day before Vijayadashmi, and they perform Vishwakarma Puja on Vishwakarma Jayanti. And it's not just the 
the just the the material that you use to make your craft that is considered as sacred but both the materials as well as the tools of the craft are considered to be sacred the tree which is to be felled by the carpenter or the sculptor to do his work is propitiated first with offerings he lays his hand on it with a mantra asking pardon of the spirits residing in the tree only then that the wood is cut the loom that the weaver uses is worshiped and offerings are made to it before a ceremonial textile for a wedding or a puja is taken up for weaving before a craftsman sculptor weaver or artisan takes up his tools for new assignments all the instruments are worshiped with incense flowers and offerings of food the tools are considered to be the extension of the artisan's hand the means by which he transforms elements from nature into a work of art that is not just an end by itself but that work of art is a is an offering to the divine this kind of tradition is not there anywhere in the world i'll end with an anecdote years ago more than 20 25 years ago that time i was not as well read in our scriptures or in the civilization knowledge that we have of this own country but i was in rome i was alone and i was going through the sculpture galleries and i was at uffizi and marveling at david which everybody knows is is a monumental sculpture and even when i was doing that there was this thought in my mind that if an indian traditional sthapati had to interpret this story of david how would he how would he visualize or how would he uh, perceive david and how would his david be would it be very different from the way uh, the david was created in in and and seen in that uh, gallery would it have a completely different facial expression would it have a completely different stance would the ornamentation be different how would it be and around that time i got to know a, a local sculptor italian sculptor and he was also traveling alone so we started talking we got quite friendly and after the after the visit to the uffizi we were having coffee in a small cafe near the gallery and he had been to india so i asked him this question that how do you perceive indian art you are trained in contemporary art in your country so he smiled at me and he said your art is very religious so i just looked at him incredulously and said what did we see in the uffizi so far all the paintings of madonna and the child and all the statues they are also religious you know whether they be of roman gods or greek gods or christian gods so your art is also religious he said no no that's not what i mean i mean to say that our gods look human your gods don't look human so i told him our gods are not meant to look human because our gods are meant to look like gods that is why they have ornaments that is why they have ayudas that is why they have all the features that the murtis are supposed to have and that is a fundamental difference between the way our sculpture or our art is exists uh, as opposed to the way uh, the western world sees art the western world especially the contemporary western world sees art as the creative expression of an individual artist and it ends there it doesn't have to have a greater purpose the work of art is an end in itself but when a traditional sthapati or a traditional sculptor or a traditional weaver in india creates something out of his uh, accumulated knowledge he that uh, the manifested article is not an end in itself it is a symbol of so many things that are unmanifested which is why all the motifs used are sacred all the motifs have a meaning the way uh, things are done in a certain way it has a meaning and there is so much that is still unsaid then what you see actually in front of your eyes and that i think to me i may not be i am not a scholar but that to me is the fundamental difference between uh, hindu art architecture and artisan traditions and the western way uh, people perceive art this conference is a way to find that to explore those roots those scriptural roots of our art and to understand for ourselves what does it really mean to have hindu arts architecture and artisan traditions it is something that the lay person has forgotten not the practitioners the practitioners are still very rooted but it is something that modern indians have forgotten it is time that we reacquainted ourselves to the basis behind our art and try to understand the bigger picture try to understand what it really means to create art 
thank you so much for listening to me so patiently and now i request uh, the uh, the curator of this conference shri nagraj paturi ji to talk about the idea behind this conference thank you so much namaste shepali ji uh, shepali ji has been uh, the actual curator uh, of this conference uh, i was only uh, uh, trying to join her uh, she is passionately dedicated to this field of uh, art architecture and artisans and she has direct connection uh, of uh, study and research and uh, interaction with many artisan groups of various kinds all over the country and uh, yes uh, this uh, conference became necessary because we have been talking about all these issues art architecture and uh, artisan groups with uh, a shyness of using the word hindu we have been shy to use the word hindu we have been uh, while analyzing uh, the art available in india architecture available in india and artisan groups and their practices we have been <coughs> hesitantly always using words like indic indian uh, indian art indian architecture and in that probably there is some amount of uh, we focus on for example if there is an archaeologist who is studying uh, the murtis of uh, who, the temples from various periods of history then he would go and say iconography and uh, then he uses iconography of sadashiva for example he focuses on iconography of sadashiva Uh, for example ik sharma ik ingu uh, kartike sharma a famous archaeologist he has written about the iconography of sada shiva then he uh, goes on talking about it and then the student and the researcher thinks yeah he is talking about it because sada shiva belongs to a certain uh, iconographical framework and he is talking about that but he is shy of uh, talking about the hinduness of that uh let me uh, actually uh, share my excitement that uh, i am able to see so many sthapatis uh, uh, who volunteered to present their papers and share their experiences and all these people have come here and uh, an archaeologist who uh, was talking about uh, the iconography of uh, sada shiva or any other he was learning from these sthapatis uh, the ideas behind uh, uh, how uh, for example if it is nataraja or dakshina murti or uh, some other uh, idol uh, vigraha murti that was being made what is the process through which it comes in and all that but actually the archaeologist would uh, talk about the external manifestation and the details but he does not talk about the process behind creation of that uh, murti only when you talk to the sthapati you would understand that uh, the murti has come out of a tapas he he does tapas he does meditation the murti appears in the meditation and it takes form through the chisel and uh, the uh, sthapati is able to see the uh, murti already inside the stone and he is only bringing out the stone which is already uh, the, the murti which is already there inside by chiseling out what is not murti he is not creating the murti and all the tapas uh, has a lot of uh, background let me share a few more academic issues that uh, have been there around us um, one of the anthropologists mn srinivas uh he uh, created a word called sanskritization in anthropology that became a very uh, discussed concept and as per that idea of sanskritization the vishvakarma families the vishva brahmana uh, families of india have been having the vedic uh, insignia on their body like agnopavitam and other and uh, they have been having in their name endings uh, names like shastri sharma achari acharya all these because they wanted to imitate brahmins for the sake of upward mobility social mobility but you are going to hear 
from umapati stapati ji and uh, shelvinadan uh, stapati ji there are many stapatis who have come to present here you would then you will understand that uh, mn srinivas was completely wrong he did not understand that the vishwa brahmana tradition the vishwa karma tradition was inherently organically was vedic the, there was a long vedic tradition of uh, they why they learn veda why they learn mantras why they learn agamas why they learn uh, all the shastras has got to do with the hereditary traditional occupation that they have uh, he did not recognize this he did not uh, mn srinivas did not recognize that it was organic he uh, probably because he was coming from a very urban and uh, modern perception of things he thought that it was an imitation of some other varna uh, or some other community it was it is not actually not and if you see the other communities also like the patmashali community or for that matter though we don't cover them under artisans the music uh, making community though, those who make music for the temple uh, the mangala music the auspicious music for the temple all of them had got to do with the temple all of them had got to do with the religious tradition uh, all of them had got to do with the veda with the agamas with the shastras so they acquired that command on the shastras traditionally from generations from uh, probably from the beginning of the time of the vedic culture uh, they they have been doing this so it was uh, not acquired by them from outside or it was not an imitation of any other community and uh, let me also share a few academic uh, observations uh, that uh, we need to have uh, what we call hindu culture is actually a a uh, syncretism or a combination of vedic folk and uh, tribal uh, uh, streams of culture in in this country and if uh, you go to the tribal culture also you have those uh, tribal sculptures and the tribal sculptures and including the palm leaves on which the art is made Uh, for example there are some fortune telling tribal people soothsaying tribal people they bring uh, palm leaves and using those palm leaves they do the fortune telling if you see what is uh, drawn on those palm leaves it is all hanuman uh, rama and all the uh, hindu gods and some uh, gods uh, from the tribal perspective which are linked to the hindu uh, gods and goddesses devis and devatas and uh, uh, all that is reflected in their day to day art architecture and uh, artisan practices within the what we call tribal or forest dwelling uh, communities and if you go to folk uh, groups also you have tie making artisan groups you have doll making uh, artisan groups you have scroll painters uh who make uh, uh, scrolls uh, particularly here in uh, telangana where i live there are these uh, uh, there is this cheriyal uh, scroll, scroll painters who paint uh, uh, various puranas on scrolls they are not just uh, the traditional classical puranas most of them are kula puranas they are caste uh, mythologies caste origin mythologies and uh, there is a particular performing art for narrative performing art which is called the scroll uh, in telugu they use the word patam uh, so that kind of performing art form is called patam katha patam katha forms and for the benefit of these patam katha performers these scroll painters create them and actually nowadays it has become a fashion to buy some of these frames on cloth and hang them in the hotels and in the malls and in uh, affluent houses and all that uh, interestingly they uh, the those who buy these uh, uh, frames uh, cloth frames uh, as a decorative piece in their house uh, they do not know 
that this comes from a very deep rooted folk hindu tradition of folk puranas which are which are kula puranas and the content inside is all highly hindu and uh, these cherial painters when they create a scroll they celebrate uh, a ritual of birth ceremony and when the performing art uh, performer the artist comes back to them saying that my scroll the old scroll has now become old please create a new one for me the old scroll uh, the entire uh, bundle of the scroll is given death rituals it is treated as though it is a living person and uh, then only a new one is uh, created in uh, folk forest dwelling and the classical vedic tradition in all the three drawing an art is invocation of divinity to that space drawing a, even kolam even the muggu even the rangoli rangavalli and any other drawing is invocation of the divinity to that place in most of the folk performing arts and rituals this uh, drawing powder drawings are created for the purpose of invoking the divinity to that space and uh, dispersing this art this dispersing for example that powder drawing is dispersal of the divinity back into the space from where the divinity has come in to that space and uh, they uh, and even the uh, three dimensional sculptures also they are created in folk rituals when they are created that creation is invocation and that idol mud idol for example uh, in tirupati in ganga jatra it is broken into pieces at the end of the ritual so that the divinity is again sent back into the space from uh, time and space from which it has entered that part through the sculpture the sthapatis when they create a sculptor a sculpture uh, murti there is a whole process of jalavasa dhanyavasa and all that and the uh, sculpture is also completely blindfolded so that the onlooker is not affected by the divine power of uh, the uh, sculpture and the inauguration of that murti itself is a huge ritual and uh, only the sculptor can face the sculpture for the first time not anyone else and there is a whole process of uh, uh, looking on uh, the uh, sculpture and the uh, doll makers and toy makers make uh, the shavatara murtis uh, the rama set there are these words like the uh, rama set the rama set is uh, the whole set of uh, figures uh, of rama patta vishaka and if, if you go to those uh, customers who go to these doll uh, uh, and toy makers for buying dolls and toys what they ask for is also these they ask for is there dashavatara is there rama set is there krishna set is there shiva set and uh, all those have their own styles each artisan group each toy making or doll making group has its own style of making it and uh, every time those which are created or looked at as uh, divine entities which have brought in the divine power into that space and, uh, and time so uh, how many such uh, communities are there if we have to conduct this conference on each of these artisans we have to have one month or two months time because we have thousands of them literally literally i can tell you i can even give you a whole list of these names of artisan communities uh, uh, from folk and tribal groups i if i just recite a few names from my just a region it is going to run into some hundred of these communities uh, so if you travel across india from kashmir to kanyakumari from gujarat to bengal you have in each of these small regions some 100 to 300 uh, such artisan uh, communities which are involved in this and uh, if we give time uh, for each of these artisan group to represent itself in a conference like this it is going to run for months and months of months so many uh, artisan 
and uh, architectural, sculptural, and uh, uh, artistic uh, groups are there. Luckily, uh, we were doubting if we could get one person talking about art at all, but there is a paper going to be on Hampi murals uh, in this conference uh, in Virupaksha temple, the murals on uh, the Virupaksha temple uh, one is going to talk about. We could uh, probably get a paper on Tanjore, uh, Bhagadishwara temple uh, art, and uh, there are many such art uh, areas where uh, Hinduism is involved. So if this conference is going to remove this hesitation on our part to use the word Hindu as an appendage before the words art, architecture, and artisans, our conference is successful. So uh, with this, uh, um, sharing my excitement that we could get uh, so many wonderful uh, sthapatis and uh, sculptors and Vishwakarma families and uh, uh, artisan families. Uh, I uh, take your leave and uh, welcome uh, Madam uh, Dr. Jaya Jaitli Ji uh, to this conference. Uh, we are so lucky to have you, ma'am. Uh, the uh, icon of uh, a craft study in this country. Uh, your own service to the uh, craft community of uh, this country. Uh, we are all indebted in behalf of uh, Hindu society uh, for uh, your service. Um, I request uh, Jaya Jetli, ma'am, uh, to give the inaugural address uh, for this conference. So, one Madam. second, let me just introduce uh, Jaya Ji. I think she deserves a longer introduction, and then I'll hand over the please, microphone please, to her. Please. Yeah, yeah. Uh, when, uh, when we thought of actually uh, doing this conference, the first title that came to my mind actually was Vishwakarma's Children. And that was inspired by Jayaji's book by the same title, Vishwakarma's Children, because I thought just these two terms, Vishwakarma children encapsulate everything that is uh, th that we are trying to do in this conference. So uh, when we were talking about who is going to do the keynote address of this conference, I told Hariji that I want Jayaji only because uh, the idea of this conference is something that she will get, and uh, you know, I can I couldn't think of anyone better than her to give the inaugural address of this conference. Jayati is a provocator of a silent revolution in the traditional arts and crafts of India. She has inspired the Karigars who in turn have inspired her tirelessly for decades. Even now, I live in Pune. Jayaji has a uh, has a Dastakar exhibition going on in Pune. And I went there on the first day and I had my whole fill of, uh, you know, arts and crafts and traditions. She has worked tirelessly for decades through Dastakari Heart Samiti, and she has created viable platforms for artisans, craftsmen, and weavers, echoing the need to build a market for their work and saving the dying arts. She has worked at the Gujarat State Handloom Development Corporation, nourishing the old embroidery in Kutch in Gujarat, where stories of economic success and financial sustenance sprout amidst despair, where the craft has turned into the savior, particularly post the devastating earthquake in Kutch. In, in Kutch. It's the embroidery of uh, the embroidery skills of the women, which basically saved them from abject despair. Jaya Jaitliji's passion for cultural expressions has infused life into a number of efforts and initiatives meant to preserve and promote our cultural heritage. Her deep understanding of the community of artisans and what they need and her inherent respect for the artistic traditions as well as for the soul of the artist and the craftsman is what sets her apart from other people who have been doing this kind of work in India for a while now. She has written several books, including the Crafts Atlas of India, which I think everybody who is interested in arts and craft traditions of India should buy and keep it's a reference book. And Vishwakarma's Children, the title that, and uh, Jayaji, believe me, I had read the book and the title had stuck to my mind subconsciously. It wasn't that, you know, I was trying to get the title from your book, but when I thought of this, this uh, conference, the first thing that popped up in my mind was Vishwakarma's Children. I, I think it's thanks to you. Uh, she is, uh, these books showcase Indian arts. She has helped evolve the language of arts and crafts by blending them with other facets in her continual engagement with culture. 
I request JIG to give the inaugural address of this conference. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Chef Ali and Angraji before that. I don't deserve all this because I really am feeling like a child among all you scholars. Um, I've really been only a student of the craftspeople and whatever books I've written, I haven't written from my mind or from any research from books, but from my heart. And it really comes out from their little gestures and their thoughts and the, you can say Hinduness in them. Although I must over here be fair, there are Sikhs who are doing very interesting craft. There are Muslims who have enriched the crafts with a lot of fine arts and we, as we see in Kashmir, which are being practiced now uh, in Kashmir, but not anymore in Iran. Uh, but the basic Hinduness I feel goes beyond any religious Hinduness. It is something which um, fills our whole universe. If we are selfless and we are uh, connected, we feel connected with the universe, then there is no way we cannot accept the philosophy as practiced by our simple artisans. And um, I don't deserve to be the inaugural speaker as Chef Ali has said, and I'm surprised you didn't meet me at the bazaar on the first day in Pune. I was sitting there fully on duty till late. And I, when Harikiran rang me up, I said, oh my gosh, my mind is going to be somewhere else. I'll be half jet lagged after staying 10 hours on duty with the craftspeople. What will I say? So he said, no, no. Then he mentioned that you are referring to my book. The book also, the title came from my heart. Because Vishwakarma, how did I really come across the awareness of Vishwakarma? It was because I saw craftspeople on Vishwakarma Divas, just after Ganesh Chaturthi, putting down their tools and their implements and praying to them. And interestingly enough, people of every community, workers, laborers, construction workers, and especially, of course, craftspeople, uh, for them, this day is extremely meaningful. It is very silent. They don't make a big noise about it. But that silence is what is beautiful. The fact that they stop work and honor what helps them to excel, to focus, to create what they are doing, for me, is was one of the most important things. And as I've mentioned somewhere, it is far more important than what the West has roughly an equivalent, which they call Labor Day. Labor Day is very um, dehumanized. But the prayer to Vishwakarma and Vishwakarma Divas uh, recognizes what Vishwakarma was or symbolizes even till today. That there was this, there is this divine skill which has created this universe. And of that, he is the architect of the gods who has, uh, whose divine spirit is really inside our craftspeople. It remains there whether they are conscious of it or not. This is what I find so interesting because through the ages, how have our crafts survived? Survived the British, survived so many droughts and storms and earthquakes and oppression, including caste oppression. How has it survived? Nagaraji was mentioning about how powders are used to create images and things are dispersed. The interesting thing which I studied uh, in my mind and also wrote a long chapter in a book called Gods Beyond Temples, that there was a time when, even today, when certain castes are not allowed inside temples. So the craftsperson, that Hindu, part of the whole pantheon of people who are in our country, and who have been recognized by the Shilpa Shastras, which was a time of great egalitarian, scientific, sophisticated thinking. They are the ones who have carried on and not worried if they were allowed in a temple or not. The beauty of their work, they did in powder, they did in mud that could dissolve. They could do it by lighting a lamp under a tree. And 
it's remarkable actually i'd like to cover a few of the thoughts on how we have made nature itself divine and that nature today is how it is worshiped how if you see in artisans paintings never will they be without beautiful forests beautiful plants animals they are all revered equally amongst us because we are we recognize that we are part of that universe the shilpa shastras have delineated the number of people including barbers and potters anyone who is actually doing something manifesting with their hands all those have been listed and scientifically in edicts it is explained how it should be done the vastu shastra the natya shastra everything has a specific and sophisticated direction of work i don't think any other civilization has it in such a sophisticated manner perhaps over the years all the oppression from other uh, civilizations that we've had to suffer have rubbed them off but they don't kill them at all they remain in the hearts and today even a non literate crafts person who does not know mathematics and measuring that dil ka andaz the 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 knowledge within him in his subconscious of how much measurement to put to get a certain color dye dye stuff is is remarkable how does he know better than a professor from thailand who works with dye stuffs and is almost considered a national treasure over there we have these national treasures and we ignore them because i think we don't bring them into this mainstream of respecting hindu philosophy in its essence and which tells us we should recognize the value of the universe the trees the plants the water the rivers each one we attribute divinity for instance in a tree brahma is the root vishnu is the trunk and shiva the leaves every god every prominent deity has an animal who is part of the vahan uh crafts people just now in pune i saw one metal worker dokra craftsman had brought a lovely piece a platform with ganesh ji standing like a teacher with a stick and a blackboard and he was teaching little mice the odia alphabet how more beautifully can you convey divinity within the need for education and they are conscious they are sophisticated they are very advanced even if they can't sign their name in odia or english or hindi to convey such a depth of an idea and this is why i dedicated my life to them because i feel they deserve that kind of respect which otherwise the world has not accorded them and in some way we have also denied them because from the time of the shilpa shastras which was very egalitarian which accorded a, a honorable place to every person in society there was no difference in gender all these we actually made it hierarchical and at some stage some of those practices still continue i do believe though that if if i'm given this very honored position of of uh, speaking to you at an inaugural address to talk about the relevance for the future because our hindu philosophy and our shilpa shastras and our vedas have taught us the value of the universe as such universal thinking selflessness everybody being part of the same integral living beings we need the sustenance of this earth whether it is the potter or the cot farmer who grows the cotton for the yarn for spinning all these people need the earth to be sustained the block printer needs clean water every person who is doing any kind of dyeing of grasses needs those grasses to be replenished and to grow rejuvenation recycle reuse regrowth is all part of the same hindu philosophy where we talk about reincarnation one beautiful story that nobody less than modi ji once uh, told us in a big audience of a swachh bharat program in fact he said the indian woman is the most conscious 
and most careful reuse and recycler. If you give her a sari, a new sari, she will wear it. When it wears out, she will cut it and make a baby quilt. After that, she will make it a cover for a table. Then she will, if it's even less, she will make it into a cloth to cover some vessels. And after that, finally, until it is used as a floor cloth to clean the clothes, that piece of cloth does not attain moksha. I thought that was such a beautiful example of how a woman and the whole idea of reincarnation and moksha are all intertwined and presented in a way that it is necessary to not waste, but to reuse and to make everything in life useful. So these, these concepts today, when everybody is talking about climate change, I believe that this beautiful Hindu philosophy, which encompasses not just one society or one group, but the entire universe, where the rivers flow from one country into another, forests expand over national borders. These should be, which are revered by us and which need us to need us and we need them to sustain life on this planet. If there is no trees, there'll be no rain and there'll be no water, there'll be no rivers. And we would all uh, be finished off as we all know. And we don't need these Greta Thunbergs to tell us that we have our practitioners among our artisans who practice this all the time. They need clean water, they need forests. Whether it is Hanumanji who goes and brings the whole forest, the whole tree hill, because he could not find the medicinal plant in the forest. From that to us naming Brindavan, the Madhuvan, one is such an important forest, a word for us because Forests are sacred and forests are precious. The dance form in Kerala, the Teyam, they have 436 or so uh, forms. And in one of them, the goddess comes out to comfort people who have been affected by floods. Such sophistication of thought, no other country and no other philosophy than ours can ever offer the world. And I think, um, instead of looking back also into our scriptures, since they are imbibed in the hands of our craftspeople, we must uh, respect that and recognize that and carry them along, this whole community, as part of the, uh, I won't say battle, it is not a gentle word, but the movement towards preserving the planet for future generations. And for climate change, therefore, uh, there may be international conferences and big words, but just the watching the life of a practitioner of our crafts will tell you as much as what the world leaders have to learn. The beauty of also how we start is to dedicate everything we do to a higher being. In the early days, we never, never had a signature. Anonymity was what was beautiful. It was the um, offering to our deity, which was the prayer. That is itself a meditation. And even the painters, the Hindu painters who used to go and paint the interiors of Buddhist monetary monasteries, they never signed their name. Today in the West, the whole way of thinking is that everything is about oneself, everything is about one's brand, everything is about one's signature. And the item value may be 200 rupees, but it will become 20,000 because the person's brand is important. Everyone sells themselves. Unless we get away from this kind of thinking and we learn from our craftspeople that they have, they get very shy when you tell them apna naam is me likdo. They, that beauty of that humility is something I think we need to retain and we can learn from them. Um, in their hearts and in their work, the, everything they do is for the God. Even the credit card uh, man who was at our bazaar in Pune, he would have to, he took a little ceramic Ganesh from one of the stalls, he lit his agarbatti, and he would always say a prayer before he started his work in taking the uh, customer's credit cards for swiping. And, and in another stall, uh, Chef Ali would particularly like this in the Kotpad stall where the weaver was there. 
as I was going past in the morning to see if they had had a comfortable night and they were all all right, I saw the wife putting a beautiful tikka on the husband, like a blessing from the wife to the husband before the start of the day. It was such a beautiful gesture. I didn't want to spoil the mood by taking a photograph. And I felt so um, humble in front of her that she was so sweetly honoring her husband as the God. We don't, we want uh, equality, but then the woman also has to be treated like a goddess by the husband. But I thought that more than the credit card man, this uh, wife of the weaver who helps him in all the dying and all the work, um, that was such the most beautiful gesture. The little, little sparks of the Hindu philosophy that shows up in our artisan's work, the national and international importance of what they're doing, all this is something from which we can learn. And I'm so grateful to you for organizing this conference that we can be conscious of these things and from our past, build our future. Thank you so much for calling me and I look forward to listening to some of the others a little bit. Um, thank you again. Namaste, ma'am. Namaste. Thank you so much, Jayaji, for that stirring address. And when you talk about that it is the Hinduness, not so much of the religious philosophy, but it is the, it is the spirit uh, that's behind the crafts everywhere. And I understand that because I have seen even Muslim craftsmen from Banaras, if, they, if you buy something at their stall, and if you're the first person, they will tell you that boni to karo. And uh, if you want to do the credit card transaction, I have been asked by a very senior Muslim weaver from Banaras that, okay, you do the credit card transaction, but you give me that one rupee as boni. And he takes that one rupee coin and he puts it as uh, his faith doesn't allow it. But the spirit is the same. It's the first Lakshmi of the day. And that is something that we have seen throughout. Doesn't matter what are the crafts and what are the craftsmen. Nagaraji spoke about the tribal craftsmen. We recently went to Chhattisgarh and saw the Dokra craft of Chhattisgarh. And most of the things that they create are actually murtis of Vishnu, murtis of Lakshmi, murtis of Shiva, murtis of Devi, and they are tribal gods and goddesses. But nowhere is this feeling that we are, you know, separated from uh, Hindu Dharma or anywhere. The craft is performed as an act of worship. And even the bhatti has been prayed to, even the furnace, before the guy actually puts the stuff, the lost wax things in the bhatti, he actually prays to the bhatti and this happens every single day and I think it's really remarkable that we have managed to be connected to our roots despite so many disruptions despite so many political upheavals now I request Nagarajji uh, to go to the next part of the conference which is basically the reading out of the papers now we'll move on to the first session of the conference cultural and architecture traditions uh, Dr. Vinay Kumar is uh, going to present on philosophy and culture behind the Hindu temple architecture in India. Vinay Kumar. Dr. Vinay Kumar. So can you hear me? Yes, you are audible, Dr. Vinay Kumar. And what about please. my presentation, sir? Is it yes, visible? Please go to the slideshow mode. Yeah, just a moment, sir. Can you see the slides now? Slides are visible, but okay. please. It, it can be made full screen by using slides. Okay, sir. Is it fine now, sir? Not yet. Uh, please go to the top. Uh, yeah, now no, it's, a, it's okay. So a very good morning to all of you. I am Dr. Vinay Kumar from uh, Banaras Hindu University, Varanasi. And today I am going, going to talk about the philosophy and the culture behind the Hindu temple architecture and, uh, in, the, in India. Uh, before I start my talk, first of all, I would like to express my gratitude as well as my acknowledgement 
to Sri Nagraj ji Patori ji and who is the senior director of Indica and uh, Sefali Vaidya ji and these people they have invited me and given me a chance to express my views before all of you. For that I am very much thankful to both of you. And before I start, just I would like to uh, give a quote by Frank Lloyd Wright. He is an American uh, architect who is of the view about the architecture. He's, he says that architecture is that great living creative spirit which from generation to generation, from age to age, proceeds, persists, creates according to the nature of the man and his circumstances as they change. That is really architecture. And according to George Michel, when we talk about the Indian temple architecture, the temple is the most characteristic artistic expression of Hinduism, providing a focus for both the social and spiritual life of the community it serves. And we know that this word temple has been derived from the Latin, Latin word tempanum and templum, which means a sacred precinct or a space. And according to the definition, a temple is a structure reserved for the religious or the spiritual activities such as prayer and sacrifice or analogous, analogous uh, rites or activities. And traditionally, this temple is a sacred structure and also an indicative of a word of God. And as we all know, temples are not only a place of worship, but they play an important dominant role in cultural, social and economic life of the people. And of all the construct, uh, constructional activities, which was prevalent in the in our past of the early in India, early India, the temple building was the foremost. And in all ancient literatures, whatever we talk about, we find the mention of the term for the temple like Devale, like Devayatan, Devakur, Devagri, and so many other terms are there. And all these indicate that the ancient temple was the house of God. And the earliest temple, when we talk about the historicity or the beginning of this temple architecture, so the earliest example are in temple in India, they are assigned to the second and the first century BC. And the Brahmi inscription of the second century BC, which has been found from a place of base Nagar in Vidisha, in Madhya Pradesh, and it commemorates the creation of a religious column in honor of Vasudev by the Heliodorus. And besides that, an inscription found in the Rajputana regions, that is the Gosundi inscription, it tells us about that Bhagavatabhyam Shankarsanam Vasudevhyam Ahitabhyam Sarvesarabhyam Puja Sila Prakaro Narayan Vatika. So the, here we can find out the recording of the construction of a stone enclosure for the worship of, worship of Sankarshan and Vasudev by a chieftain whose name was, was Jay, Jay, Jayaran. And he is ascribed to the first century. This particular structure is uh, ascribed to the first century BCE. And beside that, Kautilyas in his Earth Shastra prescribes the building of the temple on the dimensions of the Vastu. And not only for the site divinities, but also for the deities like Aparajit, Jayan, Shiva, and many others. Moving forward, the Karvel is record, recorded to have repaired the temples of the different sects for the ramparts of the and the towers had also been flown away by the wind. We know about that one through the inscription of Karvel in Orisha. And the Bilsad inscription, it mentions about the temple of the Skand Mahashain. So on this basis of the above evidence, we can see that, or we can easily say that, that the temples were existed before 6th century BC in India. And the earliest group, group of the temple, Gupta temples, these are the Gupta temples, which date us around 5th century CE. And these were of a single cell sanctum with a portico, the mandapas resting on the four pillars, that is the temple number 17 at Sachi, Tigwa, and Aaron. And the earliest structural temple that have survived is brick structure that is devoted to Lord Vishnu. 
and assigned to the 5th century only itself, it is credited to belonging to the Gupta dynasty. And another temple ascribed to the same period is of the Dasavatar temple at Devgarh, about which we know. So now coming to the, our main topic, what is now about the philosophy behind the, these temple architecture in India. So I will be just uh, talking about the philosophy. What was the philosophy of the temple construction in ancient India? The temples, they are built to establish the contact between man and God that we know. And the rituals and the ceremonies, they are performed in the temples and they have primarily influenced the forms of the temple architecture. And the identification of the divinity with the fabric of the temple and the reflection of the form of the universe with that of the form of the temple is of supreme importance in Indian architecture. And hence the importance is given right from the selection of the site of the temple to formation of the ground plan and also to its vertical elevation. And this symbolic representation of the cosmic idea is well reflected in the construction of the temples in India. So the symbolic representation of this cosmotic idea is formalized by the creation of the sacred mathematical treatise with precise measurement system and the plans of the temples, they are based on the sacred geometric diagrams, which is known as mandalas, which is symbolized as a miniature image of the universe with its Hello, Srinivas Garu. Koti Garu. Hello, did we lose uh, connection with the neck mark, uh, Koti Garu? Please check. Sir, he joined again, I think. But yeah, yeah. Sir, can you please unmute yourself, Vinayji? I think we lost you. But uh, I don't know how it happened, sir. Can, uh, is my, uh, this uh, slides visible? No, no, sir. Can please share again. Sir, just a moment, sir. You were on the mandala slide, Vinayji. Yeah, just, 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 I will be just. Yeah. Is it visible? No, not yet. Now it is. Is it visible now? Yes, it is. But turn it to slideshow, please. And uh, you were on the mandala slide when we stopped, when we lost you. Is it okay now? Yes. So I was talking about the Vastu Purus Mandal, which explains about the symbolic diagram that is the mandala. And uh, the gods, in seeking to impose the order on chaos, forced the primal man, that was the Purush, into a square grid, the Vastu Purus Mandala, and whose basic unit is the square path. And Hindu temple is the dwelling of the gods. It is based on the grid system of 64 and 81 squares. And a square is the perfect step for the ground plan. And here the priest perform ritual of the consecrations, which connect between the sexual rites and the fertility in Hindu architecture that we know that I will be talking later on. And the Hindu philosophy was among the first to re relate the human figure as the basis of a system of the proportion. And in Hindu philosophy, the form of the Purush, that was the human body was made to suit the abstract idea of the square as the supreme geometric form. And the Vastu Purush Mandal is derived from three separate words, each having a specific meaning. The Vastu refers to the physical environment, Purush refers to energy, 
power or cosmic being and the mandal is the diagram or the chart so the basic form of pasthi purush mandal is the square and the square is the important and ideal geometrical form in hindu philosophy which represents the earth all the necessary forms like the triangle hexagon octagon and circles can be derived from this square and the four sides of this square they represent the four cardinal directions the square also symbolizes the order the completeness of the endless life and the perfectness of the life and the death according to hindu belief means everyday life is also governed by the number 4 in four classes varnas four varnas four phases of life that we know about the brahmacharya banprast and sanyas ashram and four great eras also are there four head of brahma the creator god and the four vedas we know so similarly the circle represents the universe and is considered as the perfect shape without any beginning and end suggesting timeless and the infinity and the typical heavenly feature so in the form of the grid which is squares the unit clearly make the areas of the respective god in case of the this mandala and the most commonly used mandala is the square divided into 64 and 81 square mostly the square of the mandala on its outer periphery are divided into 32 smaller squares in accordance to the astronomical calculation which is known as nakshatra representing the constellations or the position of the planet through which the moon passes in its monthly path and the cloud polygon of this 32 squares is symbolical to the recurrent cycle of the time as calculated by the movement of the moon the four direction outside the mandala which represents the meeting of the earth as well as the universe as well as the movement of the sun from east to west and its rotation to the north and south hemisphere so the central position of the mandala is the place for the brahma the creator the rest squares are position of the other gods as per their relevance in hindu architecture so you can see here in this diagram about that one which i have already talked to you so this vastu purush mandala they are of various types uh, they are from the fundam because of their fundamental shapes as well as the that was the square and the smaller squares in the grid they are called as the one path and they may vary from 1 4 9 16 25 5 and so on up to so many infinable number follow which follows a geometric progression series of 1 2 3 4 up to 2 with the common factor of 2 so there can be even number of path and odd numbers of path in a mandal and they are called the yugma mandal as well as the ayugma mandal respectively and the vastu purush mandal has different names according to these numbers of the path path within the grid this mandala having the 1 4 9 16 25 25 30 32 numbers of the path within the grid are known as shakala mandal pechak mandal pitha mandal mahapeeth mandal manduk chandita this uh, chandit mandal and the paramashrikiya mandal respectively so you can see in this the various types of this vastu purush mandala this is from the source from the book of the riyan and here this vastu purush mandal having all the geometrical astronomical and the human properties was the basis for the ground floor plan for all the hindu temples and the basic shapes acquired by these temples plans is the outermost ring of the square of the mandal which forms the thickness of the wall of the main shrine and the central four square it acquires the place of the main deity and the inner ring of the 12 squares from form the walls of the garbhagriha and the next 16 to 28 forms the pradakshina path of the temple architecture and these simple div divisions of the square with many permutations and the combinations became the basis for the complex structure of the temple architecture in ancient india in the form of orthogonal as well as stilet plans of the temple which we can see in the extreme south india therefore the large squares of the mandalas they were divided into the thousand squares thus virtually forming a graph paper for the architect to facilitate him to add a unit at one side and setting back on to the other you can see it here these are the different names of these mandalas which i have already told you and you can see this vastu purush mandalas and the division of the particular space and the creation of different architectural unit according to this square division so now coming to in hinduism the attainment of the is a spiritual perfection is through this progression of the various stages of consciousness that we know and thus the temple is a place of transit as well as a fold or a passage and the symbolism of the passage 
through the doorway is represented by the idea of change of our from temporal to the perpetual world. And the sacred deities, they are placed in a small sanctuary within the temple, which is, which is known as Garbhagri or the womb chamber of a temple. And the interior space of the temple are arranged to promote the movement of the devotee from outside through a series of enclosure, uh, through the series of enclosure, which became increasingly sacred and dark as the enclosure is approached. At a general level, when we talk about the nomenclature of these spaces as one pass from outside to the inside of the temple is known as the antral. For example, when we talk about the different components or the elements of the Hindu temple, you can see here the sanctuary as a whole is known as the Biman that consists of the two parts. The upper part of the Biman is called the Shikhar and the lower portion inside the Biman is called the Garbhagri, Shela or the inner chamber. And these, these are another other uh, this uh, component or the elements of the Hindu temple. It is the Garbhagri, which is the nucleus and the innermost chamber of the temple where the image or the idol of the deity is placed. And the chamber is mostly square in plan and is, it is entered by the doorways on its eastern side. And the visitors, they are not allowed inside this one. And another component or another uh, this uh, uh, element of this Hindu temple is the production of earth which means the ambulatory pass for the circumpolation. It consists of the enclosed corridor carried, out, uh, carried around the outside of the Garabhagri. The devotees, they walk around DT in clockwise direction as a worship ritual and symbol of respect to the temple god or goddesses. Mandapa is the pillared hall in front of the Garabhagri for the assembly of the devotees, devotees and it is used by the devotee to sit, pray, chant, meditate, and watch the priest performing the rituals. And it is also known in other parts of India or in, in regional variations as the Nat Mandir, Mandir, meaning the temple hall of dancing, where it in olden days, ritual of music as well as the dance was performed, which has become the part of my next part of my lecture, that is the culture behind this temple architecture. In some of the earlier temples, the mandap was an isolated and the separate structure from the sanctuary, like in Mahavalipuram. Antral, meaning the vestibule or the intermediate chamber, it unites the main sanctuary as well as the pillared hall of this temple. In some temples, we also find the structures like the Ard mandap, meaning the front porch of the main entrance of the temple leading to the mandapa. You can see in the diagram, you can see all these components or the elements of the Hindu temple architecture. So these are the Bhog Mandap, Nat Mandir, Jagmohan, Rekha Doil, and this is the plan of a temple of the Anantavasudev temple at Bhubaneswar here. For example, when we enter inside a temple from the outside, the first step or the first space which we encounter is the Bhog Mandir, which generally means the offering space where we offer the food basically the meant to which is basically meant for the dt and when we come to the net mandir the next component here which is the dancing hall it is usually used for the performance of the dancing as well as singing to the god dancing in hindu philosophy we know that is a prototype of the cosmic dance that is it brings into play every portion of the body in movement, which symbolizes precise is a spiritual state of any individual. And they return to the soul being from whom all things have been just originated and to whom all things return to the ceaseless and the flow of life force is being just begin. And the space that comes next is the Jagmohan, which is used as an assembly space to look at the DT and after that comes the threshold that is the antral to the sanctum sanctorum that is to Garbhagri. And the nomenclature of these spaces also describe the philosophy behind all these things. And one has to pass through while attaining the absolute knowledge of the Supreme God. As one enters the temple, he has to come to the bhog mandir. The term bhog in Sanskrit means that anything or any object for enjoyment as food, as festival, and also as experiencing, feeling, percepting, and so many more. And this space signifies the first tier of a spiritual upliftment when the aspirant starts realizing that 
the world is a place of feeling of pleasure and pain and all these are temporarily in nature so this symbolizes that this bhog mandir mandap next is the nat mandir which symbolizes the next level where the aspirant or the devotee he realizes the rhythmic dynamicity of the nature and the whole universe is thus engaged in endless motion and activity in a cosmic dance of energy the next st stage of spiritual upliftment is where this aspirant realizes that the whole universe is just a infatuating just para paraphernalia only and this space is jag mohan jag in sanskrit means the universe and the world and the mohan means the depriving of the consciousness that is the bewildering confusing perplexing and leading astray infatuating and this progression is spirituality is also reflected in the increasing volume of the space as one pass from the bhog mandap to the jag jag mohan and beyond this is the womb chamber that is the garbhagriha which is approached by a small doorway or uh, that is antral where the, this devotee is free from all the confusions pain and pleasure a complete state of just uh, transcendence and this garbhagriha is a small and dark imitating the confinement of a womb and this progression is symbolized as retracing the journey of the womb of that is prakriti an embryo in the mother's womb is just like a threshold between this formless and the form and this embryo is thus the closest physical form nearest to the divinity that is being one with this purush and the next level of spiritual upliftment is symbolically represented by the movement of spiritual energy upwards as vertical tower of the summit of this uh, this temple that is the sikhar this mandapa i have already explained this is the that sikhar and this is the mountain like the spire of a free standing temple and it is found in the north india and the biman we generally found we find in south india and this these sikhars have a curving shape while the biman has a this curving shape structure and the capping placed at the top of the temple is known as the amlak kalash and it is stone dikes like a structure at the top of the temple and they are common in the north indian temples found at the top of this sikhar and here it is just like a ring stone with a three dimensional shape uh, if the filaments of the lotus or of a halo with its rays in sanskrit amlak means the fruit of the emblic marablam which is used as a medicinal plant in folk and ayurvedic medicine in india and this is reflected in the suffix of the officinalis and perhaps it was the healing effect attributed to this fruit that should be passed to the architectural Thank amlak you. as a kind of Yes, sir. Can you uh, just 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 uh, I am concluding, sir. Just I am coming to okay. conclusion. Thank you. And just it symbolizes the passes of the exit from the world and entry into the heaven. This is the topmost point of the temple and commonly seen in North Indian temple. That is the kalash also. And this architectural and the sculptural motive in different sizes that appear on the body of the temple along with the temple form itself represents the rhythmic cycle of the time and the repetition of the cosmic. era so now coming to the conclusion this ideology behind the designing of the hindu temples was to link man with the gods hindu temple is the place where one can feel being close to the god and it is depiction of the macrocosm that is the universe as well as the microcosm the inner space and has developed over 2000 years from right now and according to this hindu religious philosophy a man's life is assumption of countless individual life spans bound up in the cycle of rebirth and one can from one can from achieve enlightenment so the pure deeds thoughts and the dedication thus in this world the temple is the symbol of enlightenment it is the place where god's presence can be felt and and through rituals and ceremonies men can discover the divine knowledge thank you very much for your patience listening thank you uh, vinay ji uh, as per questions we have an a small request from one mahesh busari i think uh for sharing the slides uh, with the audience so that they can further study uh, the matter i uh, mahesh ji i think uh, vinay ji will be available to you on his email id he can share uh, the slides and this whole recording is available on youtube so there also you can see the slides and make notes uh, whenever you want you can go back to the recording 
and uh, take notes. So with this, uh, I think there are no further questions. Then let us move on to uh, the next uh, presentation by K.P. Umapati Acharya, Veda and Architecture in a Vishwakarma Family. What an exciting topic. <clears throat> uh, actually, I am excited to have Sapatis uh, directly here. We use the word from the horse's mouth, from the Vishwakarma's mouth, I should say. Uh, these are all incarnations of Vishwakarma themselves. When I heard of uh, Ganapati Stakati's demise, I was so depressed. I thought that the whole uh, Vishwa Karma uh, level of uh, creation is all gone. But I am uh, happy to see that uh, so many Stapatis have joined our conference. They are going to talk. And uh, one of the most senior uh, Stapatis, Umapati Acharya Ji, has uh, you know, volunteered to uh, present his own personal experience. Uh, he runs uh, a Gurukula uh, residential institute for teaching Stapatya. Uh, he is going to share his experience uh, from an anecdotal and a biographical, autobiographical experience uh, from uh, a Vishwakarma family. That is going to be eye-opening for many who uh, do not know how organic uh, the Vedic culture of uh, Vishwakarma family is. Sir, uh, KP Umapati Acharya ji, please go ahead. Namaste. Uh, please share my P PDF. I sent the PDF, please share. Srinivas Garu, please share his. Uh... Okay. Om Namah Shivaya. Sinduram, Panjavatram, Dasabujabayam, Pustakam, Liki, the Katkam, Katwangam, Bijapuram, Amrita Kalasam, Kandiham, Achamalam, Trisula, Janamudra, Asura, Sura, Guru, whom Vishwakarmam, Namami. My humble pronouns and respects to my ancestors who have built thousands and thousands of uh, temples in Bharatavarsha, not the present political boundary, but our bo cultural boundary extended up to Iran, up to Cambodia, from Kashmir to Kanyakumari. My humble respects and pronouns to the great kings, saints and queens who were responsible for the construction of thousands of temples. My respects to Shifali ji and Sri Nakhraj ji and Mr. Raghavan and the senior architect Sashikala ji. The theme is so good and very needful also. I am very much interested with this conference because it is going to open the eyes of academicians as well as that of the people having the Hindutva in their mind. What actually happened to the Vishwakarma tradition and what about the relationship between the Vishwakarma and the Vedas? Mr. Nagarajan ji explained in brief. Vigas my community, Vishwakarma community. We are the ancient temple builders since the time of more than 2,000 years, 3,000 years. We called us the Stapati. The Stapati is the caste surname for the Vishwakarma community and not as your professional name. Nowadays, it is the most perverted and it is used very loosely. So that I focus my idea towards what my family tradition and what is the connectivity between the Vedas and the Vishwakarmas. Nowadays, very, very few, I do not know how many numbers, having such a tradition so that I have to, what my experiences and what in my family tradition I have to focus. 
Kasapanit. I hail from a family of Vedic and Silpa Sastra scholars and temple architects. So I was fortunate to hear and learn the Veda mantras since my childhood. My father taught me the Vedas and the Silpa Sastra in a very interesting way and helped me to understand the supremacy of Vedas in every branch of the knowledge system in our country like Ayurveda system, the astronomical system, etc. While prescribing the qualification of your the Vishwakarma, the hereditary architect Stapati, Silpa Sastras emphasize the knowledge of Veda. Mr. Nagaraj in briefly told that why the Western people do not understand it and they are writing again and again that there is a no connectivity between the Vedas and the Vishwagarmas. So it is a not at all true, that is all are the academic gimmicks. Since the time of Stella Karabrich and till now people are again and again repeating certain things and it is not at all true. They are all us a meek criticism regarding our Indian traditional knowledge system. While prescribing the qualification of your Vishwakarma, hereditary architect, Silpa Sastra says that Stapati he is Stavanatyaha, Veda with Sarva Sastra Vicharadaha. What it means of Veda with? Veda with means knowing the Veda, being conversant with the Veda, knowing the Veda, etc. No, not at all. But the meaning is more profound and it leads to enter the wonder world of uh, sacred and spiritual architecture. Veda which not to recitation of the Veda again and again. The Vishwakarma community having the unique way to understand the Veda as well as interpreting the Veda. Vishwakarma is having the capability to in interpret the Veda in their unique way. Why? Because our temples are, our temples, even the cave temples are not mere the temples, they are the expression or the interpretation of the Vedas. That is a visible form of Vedic interpretation. So, Ananda Kumaraswami says that if we consider such an architectural treatise like Manasara, the, my uh, PPT is not coming. Please show it. Not visible. Ananda Kumaraswami says that if we consider previous, previous, go. Yes, yes. Please come. Come down. Come down. What Ananda Kumaraswami says that if we consider such an architectural treatise such as Manasara, we find in the first place clear evidence of the direct dependence upon the Vedic sources. So, the Stapadi, not only the mere knower of the Veda, but he must depend upon the Veda for coming out of lot of things. What it is coming out? That is the inspiration and the impulsion. What impulsion but in the Vedic world that is issue. As well as it is coming out of the Ripus also coming. So that the Kumaraswami very excellently told the we consider such an architectural treatise as a manasara, we find in the first place the clear evidence of direct dependence. We are not depends upon the Purana. We are not much depends upon the any other text. 
वी आर ऑलवेज डिपेंड्स अपॉन द वेदा इन माय फैमिली माय फादर टोल्ड अगेन एंड अगेन एवरी डे वी मस्ट रिसाइट द वेदा सम ऑफ द एक्सेलेंट सुक्तास आर देयर एज वेल एज वी हैव द स्पेशल एज वेल एज द सीक्रेट प्रेयर फॉर व्हाट फॉर कंस्ट्रक्शन ऑफ द टेंपल i want the clear intuition i want the perennial institution it must come in my mind because i am very clear that i am not a scholar i am not a architect but i am receiving it only from the divine source it is a inherited idea that is why we are depend upon the vedas and the direct dependence provide unique experiences to the great architects of yester years assisted in creating and achieving the intended spiritual experiences for the people who will visit for thousands of years to come why because of veda veda are the root we are constructing the temple for what purpose for not for 100 years or the 200 years or the 300 years but it is for the thousands of years it has to invite the devotee as well as each and every part of the temple give the message having interaction with that of the human being that is why the more ancient sculptural art of india is embodies in visible form what the upanishad throws out into a inspired thought that is why stay ara window the sculpture like architecture springs from the spiritual realization and what it creates and expresses at its greatest is the spirit in form next page the soul is the body the sculpture like architecture spring from the soul spiritual realization how it is possible from the yama niyama pranayama pratyagara dharana then going for the vigalpa samadhi in the samadhi itself vigalpa nirvigalpa samadhi in the nirvigalpa samadhi one must know the desa that is a atma jnana atma darshana from the atma darshana is converted into the temple the atma darshana converted into the sculpture in my family tradition the extended foundation and the well beaten roads which were instituted by my ancestors by emphasizing the vedas vedas has given me foresight to understand and interpret the shilpa shastra in the right perception how to understand the shilpa shastra there were thousands and thousands of shilpa shastra in the before the 6th century the barbarians attacked our temples are demolished for continuously for thousands hundreds of years so our shilpa shastras were gone but still it is that we are the party of shilpa shastras available what what we are calling as the shilpa shastra the shilpa shastra is a extended foundation that is a well beaten road which were instituted by our ancestors by emphasizing the veda had given me the foresight understand and interact with shilpa shastra in right perception the shilpa that is the architecture and the sculpture and painting is not the profession it is a tapas it is a means to attain the moksha that is the main idea of the vishwakarma community in all over india in the vishwakarma suktas of the rigveda are revered as a source of divine inspiration direct revelation and vigorous power of creation and the expression what means of the veda veda is having the capability to induce the subconscious conscious and the supra conscious level of each and every individual those want to understand the veda just mere repetition and recitation is enough for him to elevate his soul to the such an extent for visakarma community two suktas in the 10th mandala of the rigveda is most essential in which that is the perennial source of for us 
as well as for the elimination of the impulsion. In the second verse of the tenth mandala, eighty one sutta and rig number two. What was the basis or the primal matter that is adhistana? What was the material that is arambana? How was it done? How did the creator of all things, the Vishwakarma, fashion the earth and shape the glory mahimana of the heavens, beholding all the Vishwa? Earth, mahimana, that is a heaven beholding all the Vishwa Shakti who the mantra reveals the process of creation in the earth. The Vishwakarma Sutta in the tenth mandala is very much essential for each and every Vishwakarma families. In the Veda also mentioned about Veda also mentioned about the Shilpa. In the family, in my family, still we have certain secret Vedic prayers. That very pray every day we are reciting. Hundreds of time I have to recite that par that mantras. So what Veda says about the Shilpa? It says the Acharya Karma. That is act of wonder, Bahuruba, multi form, Bala, capacity, Chitra Rupa, illuminating form, Karma Kaushala, dexterity of action, Kaushala, dexterity, Samartya. Propensity, Suksha Karma, Satellite, Yoga, Contemplation and Concentration of the Thought. These term, terminologies are mentioned about Acharya Karma, Bhagavad Bala, Samartya, Yoga. It is mentioned in the Veda to give explain about the Silpa. The great Arya Samaj founder, that Dayananda Saraswati says that what is Silpa, he explains the taking from. The Brahmanas, is he says that Silpa Vidya Mahimana. What is the Silpa Vidya Mahimana? A Silpa Vidya Mahimana means a Silpa word that give emphasize that the Silpa indicates the science and technology used for the welfare of the human being. Without any attachment personally, so that is why Shivali ji told so many anonymous architects there is a no signature etc. That is why it is mentioned without any material greediness towards the material world. Our ancestors have done the work that was mentioned in the Veda. The extensive analysis, please go upwards. Sir, yes. next para. The extensive analysis of the above ancient words, ancient words in the Shilpa Sastra. What is the speciality of it? While my father teaching me the Shilpa text, he always insisted this word is ancient. While I am a very young man, young boy, I asked him why it is very ancient. He says that the word coming from the Veda. Whatever the words mentioned in the Shilpa Sastra, they have a capability to give the inspiration. That words mostly coming from the Veda. The extensive analysis of the above ancient words facilitate us to understand what Shilpa is and to understand the philosophical and the religious implications. The greatness and continuity of Indian architecture is a live in its aim. As expressed from the above words, the aim of Indian artist has always been to represent the most essential characteristics of the inner spiritual manifestation of the object. He wishes to represent in a in the Western world. They are opening their eyes. They are looking the nature, the manifestation of river, brooks, canals, mountains. Hill tops, etc., and they put in the canvas, or they are carving. But Indian system, Indian panels, Indian sculpture never express because nature and ourselves are the one and the same. 
that is why there is a no la landscape sculpture in our country the greatness and continuity of the architecture is a live in its aim as expressed in the above words the aim of indian art artist has always been to represent the most essential characteristics of the inner spiritual manifestation of the object what in indian system western system open the eye but what indian system says that close your eyes whilst if you are close your eyes you travel inside it the travel inside it it is a facilitate is a trying it is understanding of the atma darshana that is a great difference between the two closing open your eyes it is western close your eye travel inside that is the indian system according to arabindo the indian artist aesthetic suggestion is secondary to the spiritual realization people say very beautiful wonderful beautiful carving i never bother about it what about it is a spiritual idea whether he understood the veda whether he whether he has the idea about the uh, vedas and its implications so in our country there is aesthetic suggestion is a very very secondary than to that of the spiritual realization form is but a vehicle to spiritual emotion it passes not from technique to idea but technique from idea it is a not the technique to idea yellora best example ajanta this is a best example for it people say no cranes no nothing but how it was possible no no it is very ordinary mind thing like that but in our country the technique is not at all the value the technique to idea but technique from the idea the idea giving the techniques to that according to indian system the appeal of the indian art is a not to the eye and to the mind through the eye no but to the soul through the eye and the mind divya sakshu that is the idea bhagavan bhavan parmatma in the battlefield of kurukshetra giving the divine eye to the arjuna from the arjuna got the divine eye he visualized the vishwarupa of parmatma that is why in our system in the architectural tradition in vishwakarma tradition we are always insisting divya sakshu it is mentioned in the veda divya sakshu is essential so indian art never been content with the minor real realities of the sensation and major reality of the emotion but has striven to find the supreme reality of the spirit what joral karl jung says that the collective unconsciousness the collective unconsciousness is a divide derived by karl jung but it was been practiced for the millennium of years in our indian system the next is the shilpa shastras or upavedas of the atharva veda it is called the sabatya veda the text on architecture iconography and painting were written by the rishis who were experimenter experience and codified that codified the process of soul realization by means of shilpa what is the use of the shilpa for me i am a architect i am a sculptor why why i am doing this cultural art work not for the fame not for the money what i want it is a means for attaining the moksha i want to attain the moksha that is why i am using the architecture and the shilpa practicing it as a means that is the idea of, of my ancestors also so in old india it was ancient india in ancient india thousands of shilpa shastra extensively deal with the range of subjects from town planning irrigation system palaces and the temples etc now only a limited number of shastras say about 30 are available shilpa vidya ragasya upanishad a reward text of vishwakarma community says that spirituality is the secret of uh, 
शिल्पम बिकम या सैक्रिफाइस शिल्पम यज्ञ भवतु सैक्रिफाइस मींस इन द वेस्टर्न कांसेप्ट द मेस्टर्न वर्ड इट इज नॉट द सफरिंग बट इट इज अ जॉयफुल वन व्हाट इज सैक्रिफाइस दैट इज यज्ञ व्हाट इट मींस वी आर इनवाइटिंग द गॉड प्लीज यू आर माय मास्टर यू आर माय गॉड please take it at the time the sacrifice means yajna means it is a very clear very very extensive joy in our mind so the shilpa become sacrifice and the philosophical propositions become architecture there is one question that may arise how to approach india not the vishwagar was adopted a unique system soul realization is the method of creation and the soul realization must be the way of our response and understanding for visagarma doing architecture is a means to attain the self realization in other words that is the moksha now we have to analyze certain important word that mana measure how to measure measure is important measure everything is important how to measure for construction inch or the centimeter or the nanometer whatever may be measurement is very very essential we are taking clue from the veda itself the fundamental aspect of architecture is measurement and the veda mana is significantly repeated in the shilpa text they adopted the conceptual idea conceptual ideas from the veda shilpa text proclaimed that vishnu is stated to be the god of both the yaksh and the measuring rod according to rigveda first mandala 154 sutta says that vishnu measured not only the earth but measure the terrestrial space vishnu measured out the terrestrial space and made fast abode on high that is why we call the trivikrama mentioned in the veda similarly the host of veda mantras hails the act of measuring is secret and the architects have been doing the same act with the insight gifted by the gods still previously uh, professor vinay kumar says that vastu mandala something i have uh, different idea the vastu vastu purusha mandala it is not mentioned in the any text it is the creation of the western people vastu is the mandala is the vastu mandala but actually it is a padavinyasa so padavinyasa is a making demarcation of a place for the temple needs a measurement how it is coming the act of measuring each and every element of the temple is considered as a direct awareness of infinity which is which century after century have been reverently adopted by my ancestors the measurement measuring mana is adopted in the shilpa text brahmaniya chitrakarma shastra says that sarvam manena nichidam manena nichidam sarvam everything is measurable if god is so he is unmanifested he is immeasurable by doing so he is immeasurable by the word immeasurable i measured the god that was mentioned in the sadavada brahmana in the brahmana it is kalpa sutra and silva sutra ंग conclusion uh, yes uh, it is only 30 seconds needed yeah, thank you thank you for fourth sorry point. actually uh, we uh, uh, we have to measure time uh, though yes, yes, I, <laughs> actually I your presentation is so unstoppable thank you thank you yes please so it is i am concluding part only yeah yeah so it is quite natural the several words are arising like that of the mana measure mana pramana parimana unmana upamana manonmana all these are thinking of, uh, mentioning about the measurement those having such a knowledge about the measurement measured by the god trivikrama 
he is called as a mana yogi and what is this sculpture is called the pratiba all words have vibrant nature and guide the architects in the rightful way the word pratiba is mentioned in the rigveda as the likeness of all things vishvasya pratibanam the shilpa text indicating the meaning such as counter measure of the deity to who the vishwakarma mar his dhyana for this reason every mantra of shilpa shastra is not considered a description or the prescription for the construction of the temple but as the dhyana mantra going for the dhyana to attaining the nirvikalpa samadhi to merge with the god in this no knower and the knowledge merged and visualized the god traditional art is driven by the creativity that combines the heavenly inspiration with the ethnic geniusness also tradition is never restricted to expressing the mental visuals now it is more important to study the spirit of our ancients through their temple architecture and vedic studies than to analyze the means of construction it just like that of art history indian architecture will never be a mere construction it is an inspiration prophecy and a revelation of the spirit like my ancestor my consciousness is always fixed with the vedas and vedas only which alone capable of making me the true vishwakarma to build the temple for the gods thank you very much dhanyavaad ha if any question please ask thank you very thank much you. sir actually we are humbled uh, such an ecstatic uh, presentation uh, there are a few uh, questions i think uh, the this question is a little con uh, i think it takes longer for discussion if time permits let us take it why the erotic sculptures are placed in different temples in india is one question is south india in south india we follow agamas uh, for temple construction uh, is it true uh, if please explain another question by dharmarajan is uh, the traditional vedic scholars and sthapati community must closely work together to enrich the value of sacred uh, structures uh, actually is it happening is are the sthapatis uh, uh, closely involved in the temple construction today is the question from dharmarajan so uh, the erotic sculptures question <laughs> probably umapati yes, acharya ji may take a little long I, time to explain I, i will take little time for explaining it yeah please don't don't of right huh? yes. okay erotic i already mentioned the landscape there is a no landscape in our sculpture because we are always thinking tree as well as a god like the the erotic also certain marks we have the kama sutra also it is a part and parcel of our life that is why in kajra go some other places only 10% of this culture in the category of erotic so erotic it is a what we all call subandha in the sanskrit and it is a codification also how the inner walls are joined together it is a coding for the sculptures for the next generation if i visited your old temple i we have to notice some of the marks these marks are giving me the idea how to extend the temple how to extend the other works that is why erotic sculptures are there it is an part and parcel vamachara is also with us not only that's a vaidika puja we have the vamachara puja especially of the orissa temples made out of the yantras and they are more focused upon the tantric next question is agamas agamas are there agamas if you, for example uh, vimana archa kalpa in the vaishnava there are two type panjarata and vaikanasa in the all the almost all the agamas what says the sarya kriya yoga jnana in the kriya pada they mentioned it only few saibagamas explaining the uh, temple architecture and what it say always if you have any doubt 
you have to refer the Silpa Sastra. In my community, Vishwakarma community, people thrown their text, Silpa Sastra. Why? Because the skill only giving money to them, not the knowledge. That is why they are not read the Silpa Sastra properly. That is why they are Agamas Pandits are there, the priests are there. They are dependent upon the priests to give their idea. For in, according to Sai Vagama, I very clear that you go for Surendranath Banerjee's book to understand the Agamas. And Agamas, some of the Agamas only giving the idea about construction of the temple in very extensively. Rest of the Agamas, very, very brief introduction. If the Vaishnava Agamas, they clearly says that if any doubt arises, just you read the Silva Sastra. And another thing is closely associated. I am ready to closely associated with the other people. But our Vishwadharma tradition was systematically sidelined since 1947. I have to accept even the barbarians who are destroyed our temple. In the colonial rule, they are putting the inferiority complex among the scholars as well as that of the Vishwadharma community. But what happened? Only after 1947, my community was systematically sidelined. So I am ready to work with the every people. Very architects, modern, I am also taking classes for the architects as well as the design engineers also. So we are ready to cooperate with each and everybody. May I especially request uh, uh, um, Shefa Ji, Vaidya Ji, uh, you have to uh, take note of it, please. Uh, we have yes. to extend. We have to extend our cooperation because we have uh, because only few people are av available. Wherever the people are coming and asking me, sir, we want to construct a temple. Of I pose a question. Whether you want to construct a temple or a temple-like structure, hmm. if you want to construct a temple, I will be a right person for you. If you want temple-like structure, hundreds of peoples are there, go there and they will build. <laughs> that means the understanding of the Silpa text, the understanding of the Veta and Upanishad, without understanding of the Veta, Without understanding of Indian history, it is not at all possible for them. Sir, uh, this was one of the most mesmerizing talks and presentations that I have ever witnessed. I am actually feeling emotional. <laughs> Just give me a moment. It was, I what I uh, what I will always remember is when you said that Indian art is not concerned with the minor reality of senses. It is not even concerned with the major reality of emotions, but it is concerned with the supreme reality of the spirit. These words will be etched in my mind forever. And I think that is the greatest understanding about Indian arts that I'm, I'm sorry, I'm really emotional. Namaste. I am also emotional for hundreds of years, my community. Why 1947? After the 47, my community was vandalized. My community was a sideline. Even within my community, some people do not understand the Shastra properly. They are spread out. What the secret we have? What kind of emotion with me like Sifaliji? In my family, we have hundreds of Shastra with my hand. I am translating. What is his speciality? Just one minute I want to tell you. During the period of the attack. There is a no temple construction activity for 100 years in Tamil Nadu. Malika, yeah. four and other. The Madurai Meenakshi temple was locked for more than 40 years. But please think about the Vishwakarma community. For no work for 100 years, but after the Vijayanagara Empire, we have constructed a lot of temples in a magnificent size. How it is possible? My father told me thousands of stories. How the Vishwadharma family ladies, women who teach their sons and daughters, not with that of the models, just in the air. My father told me, our great-grandmothers 
considered the temple in the air that is why still in my family tradition each and every woman my wife and my child every woman in my family are well known that of the sanskar well known about that of the veda mantras they are all well aware of each and every significant word in the chitta shastra myself and my daughter she is actually a, a cost accountant myself my daughter both are worked together in the sanskar and we are making the glossary for it that is the tradition but my father told me one thing you do our work you are own work you are research everything you made it and keep it with my family because society may not come and praise you don't need the recognition just you do the work that is my father's work word that we are uh, still working with that of the shilpa shastra so, this is another I'm revealing not. aspect uh, uma pati ji uh, no, gender no. aspect uh, the, that your grandmother your mother and your daughter your wife all these are uh, educated in this i am also not getting words no so much of uh, revealing information from your personal experience thank you very much sir uh, we have to move on to the next paper otherwise uh, we can have you for the whole conference can go with you thank you very much namaste uh, uh, dhanyawad thank you thank you very my, much sir my respects to shifali ji and uh, <laughs> nagaraj also may humble sir sir i'll come to kumbhakonam and spend some time with you yes, at your feet thank, thank you so much Nagraji, <clears throat> I I think I'm muted. Okay, uh, uh, revisiting the role of Vishwakarma in Indian metallurgy, lost wax technique, case studies from Tamil Nadu and Kerala by Dr. Yes Uday Kumar and Dr. Dia Mukherjee. Thank you. Is, is the presentation visible? Uh, Not some, yet. Some screen is visible, but uh, the slide hasn't come up yet. You are able to see. Ah, uh, yeah. Now. Yes. Uh, now it's visible. Yes. Now Please turn it to a slideshow. Yeah, file is visible, but uh, you have to uh, convert it into full screen slideshow. You can either go to function keys or uh, it uh, will take you. Ah, it 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 came, sir. Ah, now it has come. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So good afternoon to one and all. Uh, I am Dr. Dia and my colleague Dr. Uday Kumar from a Heritage Science and Society Program of National Institute of Advanced Studies. We both are archaeologists, and we both are working in ancient Indian metallurgy. Uh, today's paper, we are going to present about the lost wax technique, the archaeological perspective of the technique, as well as the ethnographic study that uh, is an essential part of archaeology. We'll be presenting in form of case studies, as well as the role of Vishakarmas in Indian metallurgy. Uh, first, coming to the lost wax technique, uh, this is a technique uh, known to us. Uh, it is an age-old technique. Uh, it is uh, this technique that has been found in many ancient cultures like uh, Mesopotamia, Egypt, uh, and also in India. So uh, mostly in undivided India, uh, in the Harappan culture, we have seen this kind of technique. This technique at present are being used by the modern industries, right from uh, dentistry to jewelry industry. Everywhere it is used, and it is known as investment casting. So what is the technique is all about? It is a uh, wax model is made, and then uh, this uh, a mold of clay is made on top on top of that wax model. The wax is heated and it is melted out. Therefore, the wax is 
lost in the process of heating and hence the name, the technique of lost wax. Uh, now, uh, in India, uh, this technique is known uh, in various, from various cultures, even in India. However, uh, this uh, has been renamed, uh, this has been renamed uh, by the Britishers during uh, the Second World War, and it is now known as investment casting. So one of our aim is to upload uh, or upheaval an ancient culture that is, exists that exists uh, in our country from an ancient time till today uh, without the knowledge of many people. So this is uh, in ancient, we have examples uh, of this technique, casting technique from the Mesopotamia, Egypt, Greece. Even in India, we have this tradition of lost wax casting technique being continued. Uh, also, we can see after the uh, after the Harappan culture, we have seen this uh, technique being used by the Pallavas, Cholas, Guptas, etc., other dynasties. So the sources that we can study, of course, the archaeological sources, uh, the Harappan culture, and the examples can be cited as the famous dancing girl of Moenjilaro. Uh, we have one pendant uh, made from uh, this technique. Uh, from the site of Kuntasi. Uh, uh, we have some uh, chariots uh, made of this from uh, various sites. Uh, then coming to the literary sources, of course, we have Manasara, Shilparatna, Manasullasa. This uh, will be dealt with uh, dealt by Dr. Uday. And of course, the ethnographic approaches, uh, this technique is being continued and used by the traditional craftsmen in uh, some pockets of India. Uh, like, uh, for example, it is known in various names like Dokra, Brasquez in many parts of India. They are also using the same techniques. Uh, but in this paper, we are going to uh, focus only on two places in Tamil Nadu and Kerala. So uh, coming to the research problem, as I said, this technique is an age old technique. So how old it is? I have already mentioned this point, so I'll uh, be repeating it. So is there any continuity or break in the technology? Uh, has it really been revived by the Britishers or uh, the technology came from the West or it's uh, oriental? Uh, so uh, when we are talking about the continuity, as I mentioned, uh, we have, uh, we can, in India, we can see the first uh, trace of this uh, technology in the Harappan culture. We have seen in Gupta period, uh, Pallavas, Cholas, uh, there. If we talk about break or continuity in technology, uh, it is not like that the technology has been adopted from any uh, tra or transferred from uh, one culture to another. It has been uh, uh, indigenous development in every uh, the dynasty of culture, if I say. Uh, and uh, but uh, the and the technology may exist uh, in different space, same time or different time without having any contact between them. And also to indicate uh, the role of Vishakarmas uh, in the literary evidences, what we find, the methodologies adopted for this paper are archaeological excavations and published books based on systematic excavations and explorations. And uh, the literary sources, also ethnographic studies. Now, uh, coming to the Vishakarma, I would like to introduce to you Dr. Uday Kumar, uh, who himself uh, belongs to the Vishakarma community and School of Culture, Mahavalipuram. So, Dr. Uday, please say. So, I'm Dr. Uday. I'm from uh, uh, Dr. Diyasaram Vishakarma family, traditional family from uh, Karakuri and Devakote. And I did my graduation finance from uh, Women College of Sculpture, Mahavalivaram. And I trained under a uh, uh, great uh, Sapati, uh, Karapas Sapati, and uh, Dr. Balachana Sapatis. Um, so here uh, uh, in South India, especially in a uh, place of uh, most South India, like Karikudi, Madurai, Kaljavur, this kind of Vishwakurma, in Vishwakurma community, Vishwakurma plays major role in the each family. Even some com Vishwakarma community does not do uh, craft, uh, they lost their craft practice and they transfer to some other uh, uh, works uh, like uh, education, other uh, education academic purpose, but still they follow the uh, thread ceremony like we say Avani Atam. 
like avani under the month of tamil avani we put a th- thread sacred this uh, religious thread so still we follow the vishwakarma pujas and vishwakarma traditional even though we are not uh, people, some people doesn't uh, do the craft still they follow the uh, rituals of vishwakarma in the each vishwakarma families and the photo you are seeing right above the photo the vishwakarma which is a uh, 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 five faces and uh, uh, 10 hands uh, with the veenas so each uh, iconography has a uh, different uh, stories and different uh, philosophy and iconometry i know each everything as it, it will take a lot of time to describe each and everything so i'm uh, putting into a short thing so all vishwakarma family we, we, we have this photo of vishwakarma with the uh, five uh, sons like uh, uh, vishwakarma has five sons like they work in uh, iron wood uh, uh, like copper bronze and uh, gold and uh, 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 like carpenter and goldsmith even my family like i work on a copper bronze technology uh, still i practice and i do archaeology also but if you see my father and my great grandfather and uh, everybody they practice goldsmith and some my relatives they practice carpenter so in one vishwakarma family there's a lot of crafts are developing this, this can see only in a uh, particular like vishwakarma community we can see so like uh, like i'm not saying like other community but they have only individual uh, uh craft but here we can see one family they have a lot of a uh, craft which is still it is serving in a uh, vishwakarma family in south india and uh, uh, so we call sometimes we call in south india vishwakarma as a kamalar or kamalar so in this kamalar we have five uh, like uh, artisans is included and uh, these artisans are very plays very major role in the uh, temple is building uh, when uh, like a sculpture is done the uh, ashtabandram they in the paste of ashtabandram it's only a secret uh, as making a ashtabandram only knows vishwakarma community even uh, like other uh, artisans are like uh, they doesn't know how to take a uh, ashtabandram uh, how to do the ashtabandram so this particular uh, some secrets are still in the vishwakarma community i, I should say in this uh, uh, platform so again another thing we what we thought uh, there's a everywhere vishwakarma god is there in india so what are the iconography and iconometry differ so myself and dr priya started to a new project and uh, what are the iconometries and iconographies of different uh, uh, images of vishwakarma like south india if you take we have 10 hands in uh, uh, west bengal they are different and uh, even gujarat maharashtra delhi each and every uh, come like a uh, region have their own uh, uh, vishwakarma iconography like uh, in south india we have little uh, senior person vishwakarma look like had beard big beard and everything but if you see in uh, bengal uh, the will dis- describe detailly so we have started to a new project of the iconometry and iconography of vishwakarma of different region of the uh, india so this main main uh, new project myself and started now uh, uh, dr priya will uh, give the iconography of uh, iconometry of uh, uh, vishwakarma in west bengal dr priya thank you dr uday uh as you can see this picture the uh, below picture here uh, vishakarma god vishakarma is shown as a young energetic and dynamic god who is the god of engineers and architects and uh, he is associated as the son of lord brahma uh, he have four hands and if you know uh, goddess durga uh, goddess kali uh goddess jagadhatri they are also portrayed as four hands and uh, elephant is the vahan for uh, god uh, vishakarma and uh, in west bengal kite festival is a uh, flying of kites as a festival is associated with uh, vishakarma puja generally uh, it is arranged on the 17th september and in the bengal end of the bengali month bhadra so uh, this is uh, uh, vishakarma god is worshiped by not only the engineers and architects weavers manufacturers melters everybody participate and here if you can see uh, in one hand uh, he is holding uh, iron instrument tools and implements and it is very important uh, for all those who work in any kind of craft activities this puja is very important for them Now moving on to the next uh, slide about the cases. Okay, Doctor Uday will be continuing. So the technological process of uh, metal craft or South Indian bronze is very important in Vishwakarma uh, studies. Uh, like one of the Vishwakarma son is doing this uh, uh, craft. Uh, like uh, the technological process of bronze casting is the best explained in the three Asian texts, which deals with the step by step of uh, bronze casting followed by Asian text method casting, like Manasura and Silpatana and Manasala. So these three texts, like especially Silpatana, is gives uh, each and every uh, details of uh, how to make a sculpture, uh, what are the philosophy of the sculpture. what when the we should make a bronze sculpture when we should cast the image 
um, how much percentage of metals each and everything has mentioned in a silver graph. So iconometry is like a talas, like a, uh, for doing a sculpture, there's a like thumb, tala is like one, one face, one face uh, measurement. So like uh, there's a lot of different types of uh, measurements like Kutamadas Tala, Matidasam Tala, and other Madras Tala. So each and everything that plays a very important role. So like if a like, common person, if you go to temple, they see the sculptures uh, and they uh, think that uh, all sculptures are made into the same structure. It's not like that. Each and every sculpture, like Vishnu, uh, Shiva, Parvati, everybody has their own measurement. The measurement still the traditional family of Vishwakarma community of uh, artisan or other artisans are following the uh, like uh, measurements which is uh, mentioned in uh, Asian text uh, like uh, Uttama Dasadala 124 Ankulas, like uh, Madhidas 120 or 116. So each and every Ankulas uh, is uh, taught in uh, our schools and uh, how to draw. So like before doing a sculptures, uh, any bronze sculpture, wood or sudai, anything like uh, making a uh, temple, that measurement plays very important role. And each and measurement we need to do and directly. So already certain the Asian text, just we need to follow the measurement. We need to understand the measurement, understand the math understand the philosophy that's it of the uh, uh, literature as mentioned so if you want to do as any sculpture measurement plays very important role the measurement not only for fingers and legs the measurement is started from the nail of a sculpture also start from the nail of sculpture and from the head of the hair when the hair also has to be to get the measurement so measurement plays very important role in making sculptures so like uh, Ganapati, like Uttamada, Pajamada, Stala, Ganapati has different measurements. Can you see the right side as uh, like uh, even the length, the breadth, everything there's a minute measurement is given in our Asian tech. Just we need to follow and, uh, follow and do the sculpture. And this uh, measurement has completely taught from the basic to upgraded uh, to the schools of Mahabalipuram, Tanjavur, Kumbhavanam, the schools also. Even in Karikudi, there's a Kovil, Kovilur schools are there. They are teaching us to do the sculptures, how to in the traditional form of uh, Asian text. So here is the first case study is the Tanjavur and Swami Malik Kumbhavanam. So uh, it's like uh, in this sculptures now, nowadays it is in Tamil Nadu, there are a lot of places of uh, Southern bronze sculpture is going on. Like if you see Pondicherry and uh, Mahabalipuram is uh, one of the good uh, places of uh, bronze sculpture, like uh, Kumbhavanam, Swami Malik Tanjavur. So I take the case of uh, Kumbhavanam, Swami Malik Tanjavur. So here uh, we need to follow the six steps, like a uh, traditional sculpture drawing. It's not a drawing of moon or tree or something. You need to draw a complete traditional drawing. There's a so that is very important. Unless until if you can't draw it, it's very difficult to make a wax model. So preparation of wax model. So preparation of wax model, with this wax making a wax is not like a candle wax. We can't buy in any market anything. The artisan will prepare his own wax by a bee wax and a resin and a melt it into almost 400 degrees Celsius and filter it and just to purify. Then we should make a um, the wax model and de-waxing, uh, casting and final products. So I will say the detailed uh, process slowly. So again, drawing is uh, uh, Mr. Balachandra from Mahabalipuram. He's a retired teacher from the uh, school of uh, Mahabalipuram. So he draws this, uh, he make any sculptures. He start, first, he starts for drawing. If we, if we give an order of uh, like one feet or two feet of a uh, sculpture, he draws completely in the, according to the measurements. So drawing plays very important role. So the second, the preparation of wax. How the wax is already set, the wax, the resin, the coconut oil. So we should mix and with that uh, proper structure wax will be get it. So pre preparation of wax model. So here also we have secrets of making wax model. So just we can't make our own, uh, like a, uh, we, immediately it won't come as sculpture. So sculpture also to make into different process. An important aspect that a sculptor has to use the measurement fresh measurement leaf. So before, now only we have the scales and everything. In ancient times, there's no scale anything. So our artisans are like, we show them our community artisans, have, they have the uh, coconut leaf as a measurement. So this also 28, 24 folding set that this is a very secret folding, which so many artisan doesn't uh, see outside. So it has to learn by the uh, genetic, uh, learn by the school set. Uh, so the, uh, fo uh, the, fold, the folding uh, leaves is very important. A uh, sculptor has to prepare, first to prepare a rough skeleton in wax, different parts of the images. Later it can be joined together warm by the wax. So it has to be go in systematic way. So say, this is a wax model what I'm doing. So I do a wax model regularly, not on the uh, commercial process. I do a uh, school uh, workshops and uh, museum workshops. So for the teaching the uh, uh, students, so I take a workshop yearly, like a four or five workshops and teach uh, almost uh, 2,500 students to learn about this technology, to learn about the, the value of issue firmas among the, uh, among the community, among the society of uh, Indian society.
So this uh, process, how we immediately do one come uh, here. We need to do very slowly, like fax model. First, we need to do uh, skeleton, then slowly, slowly test, like, enhance them uh, fax. So of it, uh, preparation of wax molding. Method of molding includes a uh, different types of molding media. So like uh, immediately we can't make a mold of a rough clay, just very fine clay from the river bed, and it has to be again it has to mold by hot clay. So it has to be uh, mold by layer layer base. Yeah, the mold of uh, method of molding, the fine clay has to be applied on the wax mold evenly. After it dry, apply semi hair hot clay over it and dry it again. When it dry, apply hot clay and bind with the iron wrap and over this again. A hot clay until the mold is done. Why we need to make a mold very strong? Because it has to going to tolerate almost 1500 degrees of upper liquid. So it has to be uh, more, the mold has to be very strong. You understand the mold is not strong. Sometimes it did accident and it blast. So uh, the mold has to be very strong. So this is a way of outlet. Uh, you can see right side, uh, uh, right, right, which, is a, which, which is outlet to remove the wax. When you heat the mold, uh, it's called de-waxing. After the mold is dried, then the clay mold has to be kept in the uh, pit. You can see the pit, uh, pit and uh, fire it. So the mold from the mold, the wax will come out. It slowly coming out, and almost it almost it take two hours to de-waxing. So inside will be hollow, but the impression of the uh, fine uh, sculpture will be there. So then casting in South India, of, uh, in South India, especially the fine metal were used for the production of the ideal, which is. Uh, Panchalokas, like it's called a mixture of silver, copper, gold, and zinc. This, uh, this, uh, this secret also, uh, Vishwakarma community has that. Like, how much percentage we should uh, involve is like uh, making a bronze, uh, like 80, 20. That according to the each sculptor, each sapati has uh, their own um, uh, style of making a mixture of uh, copper. Like uh, before casting the image, the ratio of different metals, like 100 grams of wax is equal to 1 kg of bronze. So, this minute secrets will be have still be having our hands in Vishwakarma community. So, casting. Uh, so casting plays very important role. We should not wear slippers. That is the main aspect. We should not wear slippers and we should not wear shirt. And because of the older person can you say photo is wearing shirt, but we should not wear uh, uh, slippers at any cost. Even it is accident, we should not wear slippers. We should be uh, wear, we should not wear slippers and it should be like a uh, dhoti, not like other jeans or anything. We should wear dhoti and should we do pujas. Uh, uh, pujas plays very important role. We should do puja for Vishwakarma and uh, for Agni Abhirti. Then only we can start for casting. So this is what we, uh, after that we get a rough uh, uh, bronze items. So then again, we need to process this process done by experts. So this, so this uh, chiseling, everything can be done by uh, uh, media, like uh, trained chief uh, stapathis or uh, sculptors. But the face, the face plays very important for face and opening eyes is only done by main chief sculptor who's like a proper stapathi. So how he has experienced, they only can touch the face. Unless until they are not experienced, they can't touch the face of their uh, sculpture. The complete images you get it uh, with a different uh, attachment, everything. So, case study second will be discussed by Dr. Yamukuchi. Thank you, Dr. Uday. Uh, so, the second case study is uh, in the state uh, of Kerala. I have chosen the study area as the Manar region. And uh, so, this is the beeswax that are used, and uh, this is a scrap brass that are used in this workshop for making sculptures. Now, this is the wax model. So, uh, the details have already been told by Dr. Uday, so I won't go into it. However, I would like to mention that uh, the object uh, that has to be made, the integrate details of that object has to be made in the wax model because this is the negative impression of it, which will be actually the object after uh, the molten metal is poured into it. So, therefore, this is the first step. And as uh, Dr. Uday has also, uh, already mentioned that it has to be made step by step. Uh, even here, you can see that uh, the intricate designs uh, are already given. So then uh, the process of molding, as uh, uh, Dr. Uday have mentioned, that uh, there are uh, layers of clays that have to be added, rough, fine, uh, medium, hard. So this here, you can see this is the clay. And he, uh, this addition is preparing it. And you can see how smooth is this clay. Again, if you see this picture, uh, you can see the crudeness of the sculpture after uh, after a uh, mold is made. And uh, here, but still here also, you can see the intricate designs have already been laid out. So this is very important stage for making any sculpture. These are uh, the molds when they are bro uh, broken. Those uh, clay particles or the clay parts, broken fragments of molds are not wasted by the artisans. 
they are powdered and they are reused. So again, here also we can learn uh, the use of recycle. And uh, this is uh, where we do not, this evidence we do not find in archeological evidence. Therefore, through this, uh, like ethno-archaeological or ethnographic surveys, we can understand that why we do not find moles uh, in archaeological assemblage. So this is how this is uh, uh, broken into powder and this they are attached. This is again uh, to hold the clay in place. Uh, pot shirts are being small pieces of pot shirts are used and runners and razors are kept projectile so through which uh, they will pour the molten metal. This is a de-waxing process. Uh, the wax, uh, are he uh, the molds are heated so that the wax can be melted out. And this wax are also recycled and reused. So this wax are also not thrown. But in case of small, uh, skull, uh, small objects, the wax are not collected. However, for big uh, sculptures, large sculptures, uh, this, uh, the process are done prior to the casting. And uh, also for fuel, charcoal is used, but as in South India, we can see uh, coconut uh, are available in uh, plenty. These coconut shells are used as fuel. This is again a regional variation that is noticed. Also the using of the material that is easily available. So, uh, and uh, the this is a uh, molds are heated in a separate furnace as well as uh, Brass is heated in crucible in a separate furnace and uh, brass uh, is almost heated for two hours. Uh, so this is uh, then a peat is dug and the mold is kept uh, inside the peat for uh, keeping the runners and raises projectile through which the molten metal is poured. Once it is poured, see you can see here that once the wax uh, metal is poured, how it looks, then it is covered completely and left for cooling down. The next day, the mold is retrieved, and you can see here the addition is breaking the mold. And this is the uh, rough casting uh, after breaking the mold. This is what have been retrieved. The next process is the polishing. So generally, the artisans now use uh, machine polishing. But uh, these intricate designs are uh, done by hand polishing only. Coming to the furnace, as I mentioned, they, have, uh, they are using two different kinds of furnace. Round furnace with the rods in between are to hold the molds in place. And this is heated. This one is only for uh, heating crucible with the metal. Now you can see there are uh, one outer line of the furnace, outer wall of the furnace and inner wall of the furnace. So crucible is placed here and uh, it retain, it gets heated from below as well as uh, from the, this portion in the sides. So the heat is retained within the crucible. So this is the crucible, modern crucibles. These are found in the bazaars. Uh, these are made of graphite and iron particles. So what, uh, what they do, they cover it with burnt brick powder. Those were actually the uh, remnants of the moles, clay and laterite soil. They cover it, they make it like this, then cover it with a newspaper and make a lead of uh, this mixture again and cover it completely. And the tools are very simple. Tongs of various sizes, piles, uh, chisels of various sizes, hammers, etc. Coming to the conclusion part, I would uh, like to refer to this. So, uh, the paper is regarding about the technological aspects. So, why we choose the two different, like in South India, also there are two different, uh, like Mannar and uh, uh, um, Mannar and uh, uh, Samay Malay, because they are. Uh, they are near to there in the lands region, but still there's a lot of varieties. How Dr. Diya is saying about the furnace and what is about I saw in town, uh, Swami Malay furnace, there's totally different uh, using materials, but the outcome is one. So the, the, I will say the tree is different, but the fruit is one. So like that, there's a lot of uh, comparative studies is there, but still in uh, South Indian bronze technology, a lot of uh, research is uh, we need to do, but still we are doing. So it is a, uh, it is of the great importance that India still preserve the traditional method of bronze image making with various developments in technology use. This continuity is traditional methods and en enables us to investigate the variability in the development of this 
techniques which began with the indus civilization and continue through pallava and great chola period in particular the town of tanjavur uh, swami malai kona mahabalipuram mannar uh, was the and still it was important center for the manufacture of such images right from 10th century to 13th century onwards the major contribution of this work is to show the continuity of bronze technology within the families and the whole families involved in this work in the modern era of the missionary products and this particular art of bronze class is dying out very fast in a few years tradition manufacturing will come to an end the major aim of this work to make a people aware of the legacy and importance to create a social awareness among the people and future generation as well as to keep the tradition of bronze class techniques before it lost so what i was saying here so we say that the legacy everything is right but same time Uh, there is a time to we need to bring awareness of among the society of uh, Vishwakarma and their uh, craft and tradition which used to be alive still it uh, long is there so that is a main uh, my aim uh, like uh, last ten uh, uh, years I am doing a workshops for myself my brother Dia Mukherjee is doing a workshops for schools and colleges to uh, make a social awareness among the youngsters to know what is the importance of the uh, tradition craft of India and uh, uh, value of the Vishwakarma. Uh, uh craft in india uh, i would like to acknowledge dr abayan and dr sv rajesh from university of kerala trandapuram artist from mannar artist from tanjore and somi balai and uh, finally i thanks to uh, national institute of advanced study which always support us in every uh, research to complete in a success manner and there's a lot of vishwakarma uh, images which is uh, available in online and we get on in our sculptures in schools so major like a few drawings which like impress me on the like a uh, right side is a uh, five uh, uh, families they are doing the sculptures and left side you see doctor uh, drawn by uh, the shamp sthapati of standing show thank you thank you thank you very much uh, dr uday uh, kumar i am uh, so glad that uh, you uh, youngster Uh, is there in this lineage and uh, you are conducting these workshops to keep the technique uh, alive uh, and uh, i think uh, if there are more of uh, more like you in the community in the lineage of uh, vishwakarmas uh, the community and its uh, tradition will survive i will be very glad to know if there are more people like you Uh, yeah. who are uh, doing uh, preserving the community tradition in family lineage uh, actually i don't know youngsters both of you whether you are aware of what you have achieved or not there is a field called ethno archaeology in what yes, uh, in which what yes, they do is uh, they uh, reconstruct a past uh, culture from their archaeological research but what you have achieved through your paper is the reverse of it you are informing archaeology through ethnology uh, yours is an ethnography informed archaeology that you are doing and you are uh, showing the fallacies and the flaws in the present archaeology uh, where they are not aware of what they lost uh, your ethnography is uh, revealing to the flaws in present archaeological methodology uh, where for example if they don't find something uh, in their site in the excavation site uh, why they are not finding it you are informing them so please publish it in international journals please inform them uh, about what you have contributed through this paper to the methodology of archaeology basically Uh, that's a great achievement all my admiration for both of you, uh, that's, you why, uh, that, yeah. that's why that's why i trained from the school of uh, sculpture but i stopped doing a uh, sculpture for any commercial purpose so last uh, like 10 years i'm doing i uh, trained like almost 200 uh, students school and college to know about this craft so at least they get the basic idea of what is this when they go to temple uh, mool over how they make they know that's the main aim of our research and uh, activities in yes yeah uh, parallelly both has have to happen uh, vivek kumar ji uh, uh, general public also has to have a hands on understanding of what is happening but the community 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 yeah. has to survive please preserve the community yeah, the lineage okay. the families family traditions thank you very much you. and uh, we uh, have to now move on to uh, 
Dr. V. P. Raghavan ji, a doyen in this field, uh, heritage and culture in a creative economy, the Vishwakarma craftsmanship of Kerala. Sir, shall I sh try and share the screen for you? Yes, sir. It is already. Okay, sir. Thank you. Okay, so I think I think uh, you can see me and my uh, PPT also, right? Hello. Kindly make it a slideshow mode, sir. It is ah, yes. slideshow mode. Okay. Where is it? Slideshow mode. Eh? Yes, please. Yes, sir. Is it okay? Yeah, now it's it okay, sir. Okay, okay now thank it's you. Okay, sir. okay, okay. So, uh, at the very outset, I am thankful to you all for having been invited me to present a presentation at Indica Conference. I am Dr. V.P. Rahavan, uh, Tagore National Fellow, offered by Ministry of Culture, Government of India, at uh, uh, Indira Gandhi National Center for Arts, Regional Center in Bangalore. And my topic of research under Tagore National Fellowship is traditional artisans in a creative society, the marvels of Vishwarma craftsmanship in India. And this is a part of my ongoing research. And uh, I am so much happy to be here and uh, respected uh, Nagaraj Pachuri, sir, respected Shafali Vaidya, madam, respected my guru like friend KP Mapadi Acharya, and fellow participants. My topic is uh, the already given and uh, uh, the heritage and culture in a creative economy, the Vishwarma craftsmanship of Kerala. My presentation is confining to only lecture part. I could not uh, give you any uh, pictorial assistance due to some technical problems yesterday night. night. Therefore, kindly uh, bear with me. Now, first, uh, I am giving an introduction of who are the Vishwarmas. Vishwarmas are the traditional class people of India. They are really the entrepreneurial class. Embraces the five occupational categories of blacksmiths, carpenters, sculptors, coppersmiths, and goldsmiths who manufacture for the development of the economy and society. They are the forebearers of the manufacturing economy, which increases economic growth for the sustaining development by generating wealth and promotes welfare for the people and the nation. They were the knowledge and science people who articulated the material culture for promoting wealth creation in a creative economy. In the distant past, Vishwakarmas were leading a prominent living among the society with the spirit part of their creative skills. Vishwakarma community is often described as a unified groupings of five subgroups, namely blacksmiths, carpenters, graziers, uh, shilpis, and goldsmiths. The size of the Vishwakarma population is approximately to the extent of 18 to 19 crores in India, which comes to about 13% of the Indian population. Since there have been hardly any census of which our population in India, the figure is a rough estimate drawing from many personal discussions. Which our population with community people time to time and whose figures are hardly identical. Material culture can be described as any object that humans survive. Define, special, uh, define social relationship, represent facets of identity, benefit people's state of mind, social or economic standing. Creative economy, what is creative economy? I'm giving a smaller definition. 
Relative economy refers to an economic system where value is on the novel imaginative qualities uh, rather than traditional resources such as land, labor, and capital. Then the traditional craftsmanship of Vicharma community is magnificent uh, manifestations of their creative skills which have acquired through hereditary transactions from generations to generations since distant past. Now the progeny. Vishwakarmas are the descendants of the artistic community of Harappan Mohenjadaro, where the earliest human civilization flourished to be the highlighting developed human settlement fluorescence. The Vishwakarma craftsmanship is an intangible cultural heritage passing from generation to generation since human days. The Harappan artisans were the creative, creative people who were well versed in science and technology as the artifacts showing the letters and writings excavated in the Harappan regions that he found. Traditional artisans in the Indian state of Kerala called Vichavarmas form a prominent Hindu sect whose socio-economic credentials have not been acknowledged by the political class among the ruling India after independence. So, just before K.P. Umapati Acharya has categorically stated that Vichavarmas were systematically sidelined since 1947 by our political class. Vichavarmas in India are necessarily the indigenous builders and makers of engineering marvels and technology like expertise par excellence transcends the scientific realm of modern scholarship. The creative skills and scientific knowledge of the Vishwarma is pivotal in creating worlds, the earliest of all human civilizations, the Indus Saraswati civilization, the human settlement of which are, is comparable, uncomparable to modern habitat in contemporary world. Now the culture of creativity. The Vishwarma community inculcates culture of creativity. Which, is which necessarily forms the civilizational foundations of human society. It is the creative people who makes history on the move. Everywhere, the world, the builders and makers infuse creative orientations among manufacturing crafts. The crafts people articulate the artistry of enjoyable and comfortable for society as a whole and peoples at large. The Vishwakarmas were not having attached to any caste hierarchy in India and they are having a social placement beyond the realm of Parna system. They are not belonging to any caste of hidden socially exclusive hierarchical pyramid of the Varna system. The craft people articulate the history. The creative craft people collectively referred to as Vishwakarmas at present. At present form, a unique artisanal collective, collective cutting across caste divisions. Social identity of whom is drawn from their community than, the, than from their caste formulation. Vishwakarmas are not termed as caste and are not belong to any category but to Kula. They are called Kula or clan or community. Majority of the medieval inscriptions to build Vishwakarmas belong to Vishwakarma Kula or Vishwakarma Kulaja or Kamala Kula or Kamala without detailing their caste affiliations. Vishwakarmas are thus a unique of five unique class of five disparate occupational groupings coming together in a collective identity community that transcended the caste groups to form a larger community of caste groups. Vishwakarma creative economic system is about the system of market orientation with an exercise proposition where they produce materials for an exchange economy. The Vishwakarma system of production has been developed for a well-framed format of market economy. The artisanal Vishwakarmas are the subservient to not to, are not subservient to any old caste categorization in Indian social system. The Vishwarma ideology is the ideology of the creative entrepreneur, entrepreneurship, where workers and owners are the same. They are synced with the process of production and the distribution. The Vishwarma economy of econo, econo, economy, the economy of equality, as the owners and workers are one and the same person. The societal framework of Vishwarma in conclave is social equality and economic inclusiveness. As such, the unique system of Vishwarma productive economy does away with the economic inequality in the society. The Vishwarma system presupposes equality among society. It entails the model, in, model of inclusive economy orienting towards integrating material culture. Now, the hereditary craftsmen belong to the Mushari community of filmmaker workers in Kerala, produces traditional products such as water container, 
is a nozzle called kindi, the shallow cooking vessel, and the like. Then the traditional class persons produce a famous metal mirror called Armula Kanadi in Armula in Kerala. Goldsmith produced the famous holy ring called Payinur Pavitra Modiram in Payinur in Kerala. And the craftsmen belong to both community called Hojaris, also called Hojaris in Adilabad in Telangana, produced the bell metal casting products. It includes the idols of deities, bells, dancing figures, and the like. Now, the professional expediency and the hereditary craftsmanship, which underlines the theory and practice of the indigenous technology of the Vishwarma community, have not been recognized by political class already mentioned. No professionals or engineering institutions in the state of Kerala asked. And also, as a country, uh, country of offering programs of inguments having from Vishwarma craft community. The artistry and artifacts of Vishwarma community are cultural heritage. It necessarily plays a key role in the development of their livelihoods. Cultural heritage is often expressed as either intangible or tangible cultural heritage. Cultural heritage is the legacy of the physical artifacts and the attributes and intangible cultural heritage attributes community that is inherited from the past. Traditional source of livelihoods of the various groups of which are in our community are iron bars for the blacksmiths, woodworks and furniture built for the carpenters, the metal bars and bronze, metal bars for the bronze smiths, gold and jewelry bars for the goldsmiths. The sculptures are not having any in Kerala. The sculptures are not having any community tag in, in and are hailing from different communities, including its Varmas. Now, the, what is the objective of study? The study aims at examining the cultural heritage of its craftsmanship and their economic achievements for creative livelihoods of the hereditary craft community of creative livelihoods. We study about the Vishwarma artisans in the state of Kerala. The analysis the role of intangible cultural heritage of the traditional craftsmanship of the hereditary artisans of Vishwarma community. It further examines the historical importance and contemporary relevance of the underlying need for making the traditional arti artifacts, uh, artistry and artifacts of the Vishwarma community in Kerala in fostering creative industries and sustainable development perspective. It unravels the underscoring the opportunities for generating jobs in creative sectors, wherein Vishwarma community plays a significant role. The study scripts how inventing, how reinventing the creative economy for sustainable development is under the Indian state of Kerala, which case which with the case analysis of the Vishwarma heritage, then uh, with the case analysis of the Vishwarma heritage village. So I am um, making the study by case by case analysis. I have a, I took eight case studies, among which Vishwarma Heritage Village of Village Kunyamangalam, the Payanur Divine Finger Rings in Kannur district, the Goldsmith Lineage of Armula in Patanamkitra district, the Carpentry family producing the Divine Bow for Onavil in Malayalam. In Karamanath, and the uh, Adakaputur metal, metal mirror craft in Palakkad and metal smithy in Manar village. These are my case studies. Then, <coughs> now the case analysis. Uh, I am uh, studying the case analysis of the this eight uh, Vishwarma craftsmanship. Okay. Then uh, the creative marvels and the technological fluorescence of ancient science structured in indigenous craftsmanship of the Vishwarma is their age old cultural heritage. The Vishwarma artisans of the artisans comprises in, in Kerala. Ironsmiths are called Pollen, carpenters are called Ashari, braziers are called Mushari, the goldsmiths are called Katan, and uh, the silpids are the idol makings are by Pipis. The study mainly focuses on the unique creative characteristics of work, workmanship of the metal smiths and carpentry. We identify the select master crafts, craftsmen among the copper smiths, iron smiths, carving artisans, goldsmiths, and woodwork players, and metal mirror workers. Now, the case analysis. I am not uh, giving the detail, uh, details uh, because of the time. Now, uh, 
Metals play a prominent role in human existence. The civilizational cultures of mankind have a history of experimentation and exploration using the alloys such as brass and bronze, precious metals, gold and silver, and more recently, iron and steel. Uh, uh, they become the parts and parcel of the human cultures all over the world. Metal casting is a time-tested process. Now, the earlier presenters, presenters uh, that is Dr. Udaya, Uday Kumar and Dia uh, Mukherjee has made a clear uh, picture about that process. So I am not giving you much. Then ancient Sanskrit texts such as Silpa Shastra, Yendra, Sarvaswa, Silpa Ritna, and Mansara mentions about uh, metal casting. The earliest evidence of casting was found in the Indus excavations such as, such as dancing girl, cast ornaments, figurines, and items of copper, gold, and lead as well as pins for smelting copper in, in golds and casting tools uh, as described in Artha Shastra nearly uh, about uh, 5000 BC. The state of Kerala, which is popularly known as Goers on Country, in the lexicon of global tourism, a place where we could find one of the oldest artistry of metal casting. And that casting uh, process are done by the Muchari community of, of uh, bronze smiths. So it is what is called bell metal casting. And it is a delicate task. And uh, I'm not giving you much about that because the earlier presentatives made it. Then uh, metal cast, I have done. Then Armula metal mirror, the marvelous creation of Vishwar Martis. The exquisite Armula metal mirror of Armula Kanadi is a special type of metal mirror produced only in Armula, a small village in Patanandita district in the city of Kerala and made a, a general understanding with the methodology of uh, uh, giving them uh, discussing them with, with uh, their uh, uh, expertise. Then, uh, large number of uh, processing as uh, uh, examined, and uh, the third case is about the metal mirror craft of the alternative technique of Kalakapur artistry. And there is only one single man, Mr. M. P. Krishna Kumar, uh, in Adakaputur in Palakkad district, have been innovating the metal craft sector technique for mirror making for the four years along with his father on the lines of Aramula metal mirror. So this is an alternative to Aramula metal mirror. Then the fourth case is about the Payinot Pavitra Modira, that is the divine ring of the divine ring of Payinot, uh, which has been produced by the hereditary uh, uh, goldsmith's family called Chowar Tuvalapil. Chowar Tuvalapil family in Payinot. And the, there is only one family uh, which is producing this uh, uh, iron, I mean, gold ring. Now, uh, then uh, the regarding the craftsmanship, I am explaining that. And uh, the case number five is Armula Palliodam, the sign course of crafts. The Armula Uttratadi Vallamkali or sign court race is one of the early years, biggest festivals in the village of Armula and one of the oldest traditional races in Kerala. This linked to the Parthasari temple and takes place every year on Uttratadi day in the month of Chingam of Malayalam calendar, that is in August and September, four days after the one. Kundan Vallam or weaked goat known to the outside world as Kerala snake boards are one, among, one, of, the, one of the Kerala culture used in Vallam Kali. Then snake boards, I am explaining more, then Palliodams. Then the case study of six is the creative business of metal craft of Manar. Manar in Alapura district in Kerala is a traditional commercial center for the well metal craft products. The craft people of which belong to the Mushari sector, se sector uh, section of the Vishwarma community in Kerala. Then the making of metal, metal weights, I am explaining raw materials, the tools, etc., the hammer, fills, etc., etc. Then the process, I have been explaining much, and the uh, Products, the lamps, bells, kitten, cells, uh, nozzle, and the like, these are the products. Then, then there is an artisan, uh, I met an uh, artisan, Rajin Ajayri. Then the case study of uh, case number seven, Vonavilu, the artistic splendor of the divine bow. The Vonavilu, the ceremonial bow, is a glorious specimen of artistic splendor created by Vishwarma, which is being traditionally carried out towards the, uh, 
to carry it forward in a disciplined way for ceremoniously prepared by the descendants of Mayan, the artistic successor of Mishwarma. This divine was depicted the Lord Mahavishnu's uh, Veera Shayana and the other of his uh, incarnations. For generations after generation, this was prepared by a particular family called the uh, Vilayil Vidu family in Karamana in Devanandavaram district. Then in uh, the last, uh, the woodcrafting crafts of Pirivanam. Pirivanam is a gifted village in Thrissur district where the gifted artists who are leading their livelihoods by early creators and the artistry. They are hailing from Trinity families of Ashari or carpentry uh, subgroups from Vishwarma community whose ancestors came from Tanjavu, Tamil Nadu for building Pirivanam. A temple some 300 years back. Now I can do. Now, Vishwarma tools for creative livelihoods are called furnaces and crucibles. Artistry and craftsmanship form the cultural foundations of a creative economy. Creative economy assumes prominence in the contemporary era of globalization as creative industries are developing new ventures of economic achievements. Creative class people class help pave the way for sustainable livelihoods for the artisans and The, 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 the Vishwarma craftsmen laid the civilizational foundation of the creative economy uh, in the, of Indian culture of ethics and morals. We may call this as Vishwarma uh, economy. With a non-violent workmanship, Vishwarma economy, economy of creativity, which aims at enhancing sustainable livelihoods for the artisanal participants. participants. Vishwarma craftsmen fosters the economy of creativity with little provisioning of institutional engagements in Now, I am concluding. Vishwarma economy of creativity, which is necessarily a non-violent economy with the working principle of a Ahimsa Paramodharma. Non-violence is the righteous mean. He promoted for achieving sustainable development goals by ensuring creative livelihoods for the traditional artisans and craftsmen. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Raghavanji. Yes, sir. Uh, there were a few questions uh, to the earlier speakers, Uday Kumar and uh, Dia Mukherjee. These uh, questions are from Ajay Dagat. Uh, he uh, wants to know, is there no other way to make these brand bronzes? Uh, will it be used for silver uh, uh, idols also? Is the question from Ajay Dagat, and there is a question from Oja Verma. He wants to know uh, about Pala period bronzes from Eastern India. They too probably use the lost wax method. And uh, Oja Verma also know, uh, wants to know about Kukihar bronzes of the 9th and 10th century. Uh, they also probably use the same technique. And uh, uh, Ajay Dagat wants to know. Is there no alternative method to make such uh, images? Uh, only this method, lost wax method, is the only yes. method. Uh, and uh, there is, uh, yeah, uh, um, Oja Varma also wants to know artisans were described as Karukushi Lava Karma in the Artha Shastra, and uh, they were not described as outside the social system. So, to talk about outside the social system is not correct. It is a modern interpretation. And uh, uh, is there any digitization being done? Uh, awesome questions. For all the audience, uh, please remember the whole conference is getting recorded and the recordings are going to be uploaded to the Indic Academy website. Uh, so, you can watch those. And those who are interested may get the contact numbers and uh, email IDs of the speakers and directly get in touch with the speakers and uh, uh, through the through phone or email ID, whatever the speaker permits you to do uh, yes, and yes. get in touch with them and interact with them outside this conference. Okay, okay. And so, now, so, Kumarji, please yeah, answer. The... Yeah. Uh, so, method, we have a uh, same method. We have no any other method is written in any relation text. But yes. we have a, a holocaustic Mm -hmm. Holocaust is the one method we have. Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, but uh, you know, like all bronze of Pala, Pallava, Chola, everything has made only in this process. 
but now the recent development of uh, western inclusion and other uh, technology there is a laser this sir but whatever you do by laser anything it won't come like what we do in by micro minute hand fingerprints mm. it's a very important in sculptures and there is no other way to do a sculptures a bronze sculpture solid hollow casting or solid casting only the last wax method and we have evidence from the harappan times rich uh, vedic time and uh, historical time and right now current aspects also we have same method there be a material changes like a bronze silver we see silver we can we can do small or a maximum one feet that also according to the economical condition so if i am yeah. earning 50000 per month i can have a little bit small if i am earning yeah, like 5 yeah, yeah. uh, crores i can have a big uh, image so according to the economy there is not a harm to do silver or gold but it is uh, bronze is a which mention in the ancient text so yeah. uh, tapati sa vishwakarma family people they follow the method which is mentioned only in the text and still they are following and yes. every sculpture of every dynasty has made by last wax method there is no yeah. such other ways as not yet found and we can't found this is a only That's unique right. aspect which indian craft culture has in their hand which That's we should absolutely. not forget that shit yes yes absolutely and uh, i have been uh, seriously observing uh, udev kumar and uh, ms mukherjee uh, about their presentation because i had a i i can have a one particular chapter on this particular uh, methodology and the last wax uh, process i have been studying much and so you have beautifully analyzed in front of our uh, presentation um, people you, therefore sir. i have left it because of uh, time uh, also <laughs> yeah, forecasting yeah. is also there and uh, nowadays the industrial people are saying about investment casting hmm. so that is uh, that is why this uh, our last uh, 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 process has has a lesser important but in a traditional methodological aspect yeah whenever i have visited almost all parts of kerala i have visited i am also a, a, i belong to visharma community the gold yeah. <laughs> so like uh, investment casting and they are again by uh, by infiltrating with investment casting these people are what is called avoiding the visharma traditional people as uh, our kumavadi okay, acharya has categorically stated but i i support you or i agree with you that only the last wax process is technically and uh, what is called uh, scientifically the best one that is my understanding yes i would uh, like to mention uh, that uh, the last wax technique and investment technique both are same the technological process is same the name is different and the mold in last wax technique what we see mainly clay sand are used as a mold mm-hmm. but in case of investment casting that are preferred by the industries now they are using aluminum mold so it's mm-hmm. faster and you uh, can use one mold for many objects mm-hmm. so uh, that is the only difference between the process it's mm-hmm. same process same technology only the name is different and uh, this name has been uh, given by the britishers during the second world war and the process of last wax technique or cire pardieu technique in french exists long long before that oh, that's absolutely. the only difference ah, that is another thing sir ah. investment casting is a cut copy paste and the last wax method ah, is a yes, yes. coming from the bloom so yes on baby or cut copy paste you have to ah. so i am so much i anyway when i am uh, i am in bangalore and in ignc yeah, yeah. then yeah. i want to meet you because somebody most mostly when most when comes to yes. so i want to meet you both then yes. uh, one more point in the case of metal mirror armula metal mirror mm-hmm. and now there is a alternative because this metal mirror class people in armula is uh, basically they are not uh, revealing they are uh, what is called proposition or proportion of this mixing therefore this uh, adaka putur one family person came for uh, came for understanding that but they would not they would not uh, give given them then uh, by, uh, by what this called uh, uh, trial and error method they have been using they have been uh, experiencing for 6 or 7 years and finally they made uh, adaka putur metal mirror and that is an alternative 
and they told me that uh, he is ready to give this technology to everybody who wants and uh, he is he is uh, in need of he asked me whether we can start a, an institute or uh, for presenting or training these people in such a way now uh, incidentally i am saying this so anyway uh, thank you for thank you very much raghavan thank, thank you sir thank you kumar ji uh, we'll thank you to all such a wonderful conference to... thank you sir so okay yeah thank you thank you thank you very much okay sir uh, i am so much happy and thank you sir uh, our um, uh, nagaraj pathuri sir uh, shabali vaidya sir vaidya madam and uh, uh, others thank you thank you very much raghavan ji on metal mirrors we can have a, uh, i think a full conference on metal mirror itself so yes sir because, because, because that is such a proud achievement of keralites Ah, uh, yes, uh, acknowledged all over uh, the world in archaeological mm. and other research about yes, uh, things. We can do that. We can do that. I, I will associate. Yeah, yeah. So that that's a great achievement. We'll Because have it. And uh, regarding keeping secret, uh, all of you, please remember, we are now worried about data security. Data security in so many areas. <laughs> and when we do data security, we are very proud that we are doing data security. But that when a community true. does that, uh, we consider that to be uh, wrong mm -hmm. and dangerous. But I think the community has every right to be secretive about their. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, so there is data security ISS. community. If you open for everything, the community so that is intellectual property. Value. Yes, yes it is their intellectual. Yeah. You, you know it to lose our validity. Value. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, actually, yes, why should we uh, consider them to be hiding, denying, and all that unnecessary? Uh, yes, it has to be like that. But they, we have to take care from mm. uh, a very general Hindu society's point of view that the community has to survive. The families yeah, have yeah, to survive, yeah. yes, yes, and uh, the uh, secret has to be passed down to at least their lineage and some other family members. Absolutely. Why should I know all the secrets, and why should I intrude into mm. uh, their intellectual property unnecessarily? Mm. Uh, that's my view. That's my personal view. Now mm. I invite uh, Rupa Vijay ji to uh, present. We are running behind time. so probably we can have this paper and have lunch and the last paper of the session can be taken up probably after lunch uh, or something like that but uh, now uh, the paper is going to be on a comparative study of hindu foundations in natya shastra and vastu shastra you are muted uh, rupa ji ஆச்சாரியாரி and also a research scholar and a bharatanatyam artist uh, so i want the slide to be shared next slide please uh the topics like natya shastra and vastu shastra need no introduction natya shastra just treatise on traditional dance drama and music attributed to bharata muni vastu shastra is that compendium where there are panchabhuta samanvaya management of prakita shaktis and rules for building buildings as per the persons living in it the basics in almost all the concepts in them have an approach followed by the hindus spreading knowledge of the good ideas and shastras was important one of the ways to achieve effective communication was the stage by the performing arts so the design of the natya griha was crucial this paper mainly has two parts the analysis of vishwakarma's theater as in natya shastra and vastu shastra and finding similarities and differences with respect to the various concepts next slide please what is the objective rethinking the shastra literatures in natya and vastu analyzing the ancient art and architecture and find the similarities and differences 
in Vishwakarma's ideas as told by Bharata and by Vishwakarma himself. What is the need or the significance? Several authors write about the Shastras, many of them mention them separately, but the analysis of the Nati Shastra using the Vastu Shara would add to the increased scrutiny of this topic. Hence, this paper is written so that this hopes to be a pathway to solution. Also, to study and analyze those ideas that exist in, in the ancient Indian literature, to promote the study of our rich heritage in Vastu tradition, according to Vishwakarma. The research design is of the descriptive type. Information is mainly obtained from the primary sources, like the three texts in Samstrutam, Nati Shastra of Bharatamuni, the Vishwakarma Prakasha, and Vishwakarma Vasu Shastram. Various online and offline secondary sources, like research articles, papers, and other data were analyzed. The beginning of the presentation of Nara starts with the Nati Grima, the analysis of Vishwakarma's ideas through the analysis of the theater planning is also illustrated in the paper. Following this are the similarities and the differences. Next slide, please. Now, in the Shastra, the first chapter, Bharata has explained the origin of Natya. Tata cha vishvakarmanam, brahmo vacha prayatnataha, kuru lakshana sampannam, Natya veshma mahamate. Brahma called Vishwakarma highly intelligent, and requested him to design a Sarva Lakshana Sampanna Natya Grima. In the second chapter, Bharata has explained the planning and construction, form and other details of the Natya Grima as was carried out under the guidance of Vishwakarma. And Pramanam Chanirdishtam, Lakshanam Vishwakarmana, Prekshagrihanam Sarvesham, Tachayva Hinibodhata. Bharata considers Vishwakarma wise and that he designs based on Shastras. He feels that what Vishwakarma has told ought to be followed. The third chapter is regarding the worship of the deities. Next slide, please. Having analyzed Bharata's and Vishwakarma's ideas, I have designed the Vikrishta Madhyama type of Natya Griha. And in this is the ground floor plan. Here uh, to the right is the, I mean, to the east is the entrance, the main entrance for the Prekshakas. And from that is the steps which are for the Prekshaka seating, that is called Supita Dharini. And next is the Matavarini, that is for the honorable guests, which is eight hastas wide. From that is the Rangapita, which is again eight hastas wide, which is the main stage. And after that is the Rangashirsha, which has also the Vedika on top, which is eight, eight hastas by eight hastas wide. And behind this, to, through Stambhadwaras or uh, will be entered the Nepatya Griha for both men and women separately. And there is also an access, uh, access from behind. Each one has different floor levels, like Nepatya is same as Rangashirsha, Vedika is one hasta from the Rangashirsha, and Rangashirsha is same as Rangapita, or maybe one hasta from the Rangapita. And uh, Matavarini and Rangapita can be at same level, or maybe a uh, little lesser. And Supita Dharini goes from zero level to one hasta high, two hasta high, like that it goes on till the entrance. This first floor plan shows that there are three shalas which are accessed by the rear entrance. And there is also a double height uh, uh, seating area as well as the stage. I have done a lot of literature study and analyzed design according to Abhinava Gupta and Abhinava Bharati and Manmohan Ghosh in Natya Shastra, and H.V. Sharma, and also uh, Mr. Chappaklal Shah, and so on, and, and come up with a design. Also, theater design as per Vishwakarma in Vastu Shastra. There are two types mentioned. One is the Natya Shala, Ranga Shala, and Geeti Shala combined. This is not given in detail. And there is one more type, which is Manushya and Gandharva and Daiva combined, where the entry point is to the east, and that is via the Mahadvara. Then between the Gandharva and the Manushya types is the Brahmadvara, which leads to the stage in the Gandharva area. 
and from there is the madhya netra which leads to the daiva portion that is the nepatya griha next slide please further next i think after four slides because uh, i explained all this and then uh, yeah these are what i have already referred to next slide please and this is what i just now told you that is uh, the three gandharva daiva and uh, uh, manushya parts which uh, is found in vishwakarma's vastu shastra next slide please now about the findings so regarding similarities one is the vedic influence natya shastra is called natya veda and compiled from the four vedas and vastu shastra is derived from sthapatya veda and upaveda of aparna veda atharvana veda and second is this is written as if they are incidents that occurred in some time in the past natya shastra is written as if bharata answers questions of atreya and other munis and vastu shastra grantha the incident seem as if it was happened in kailasa both the authors seem to have developed some great ability to compose the verses next slide please both start the granthas with the mangala charanam both have the mahatva or the prayojanam a uh, next slide please both are siddhantas both uh, natya shastra has rasa siddhanta and uh, in vastu shastra there is siddhanta of the panchabhuta samanvaya prakritika shaktis and the vidhi pravidhi for building according to the person there is also value for purusharthas in both shastra ani dharmartha kama moksha parani bhavanti natya shastra is a way full, to fulfill the purusharthas like dharma artha and kama being the purpose of natya as well as the purpose of life and good vas to lead to pursue goals all these dharma artha kama and once the person gets more of uh, yeah, higher levels of jnana and bhakti then the person can go to higher levels of consciousness and then it is said that they reach moksha and both have similar mythical stories one is the origin of natya and one is the story of the vastu purusha the positions of deities during the origin of natya is very similar to the incident of controlling the vastu purusha next slide please um both the shastras contain all this information good results if vastu puja is performed punishments if not done correctly auspicious time consideration it is told ada kalam parikshita sarva karyas sarva karyartha siddhaye kalo hi jivana shubha shubha palaprada both went on during the treta yuga each part of the natya griha and its structure is mentioned in vastu shastra as well as natya shastra the site selection soil examination confirmation of proper direction and measurement with the string or the sutra is given importance in both the shastras now regarding vastu pada vinyasa next slide please Uh, this is the mandala according to natya shastra in this uh, all the eight directions are in the surrounding and brahma is in the center so uttara ishanya apurva agneya dakshina nairutya paschima and vayavya these are in the surroundings and uh, there are a set of deities in each of these squares and uh, next slide please and this is the present uh, mandala of the ekashidhi type which is of the 45 squares and in this there are around 32 squares on the uh, boundary and there are around 13 squares in the interior all with important deities who have tried to control the vastu purusha and this is uh, considered as the vastu purusha mandala next slide please the theater forms suggested in natya shastra are based on shapes that is vikrishta of the rectangle chaturashtra the square and threshya dasra the triangular next slide please the theater forms suggested in natya shastra based on size jeshta is the biggest 
108 hastas long, this is for the devas, madhyama the medium, 64 hastas long for the kings, and avara kaniya, which is 32 hastas long for the human beings and other prakritis. Next slide, please. Table showing measurements. One is of Nati Shastra and one is of uh, Vishwakarma Vastu Shastra. The measurements are the same in both the Shastras. Both Shastras consider accuracy in these measurements. Especially the Hastas, Dandas, and also Rajadanda, Brahmananda, and so on. Next slide, please. Regarding the foundation, ceremony is done at Good Mohurta, I mean at the auspicious time, Yoga and Mula Nakshatra, dug at the right place. Sound of conch, Panava, Mridanga, Dundubi, and all go on. Gandapushpa, Palopeto, Dishodasha is mentioned in the Natya Shastra. That means the uh, incense sticks or the dupa, flowers, fruits are given to all the ten directions. Bali or food offering with mantra is given. Then regarding walls, pillars, doors, and nepatya, they are raised in auspicious titi or karana. And puja procedure is tying the green leaves, swasti, swasti goshana, punya goshana, jay shabda, and so on. Giving gifts to brahmins like jewels, cows, and cloths. Musical instruments sounded. Then bali or food is offered and mantra is chanted. Even in case of the Vedika, Rangapita, and Rangashisha, this goes on. Next slide, please. The colors used according to Varnas are similar in both the Shastras. They mention the same colors. Like East, it is white for the Brahmins. West, it is blue for the Sudras. South, it is yellow for the Vaishyas. And North, it is red for the Kshatriyas. All the food, flowers, everything is given in that particular color. Next slide, please. Regarding decorative work, there is given a lot of importance in both the Shastras. They are of two kinds. One is the Shilpa, which refers to ideal, idols, Dao decor, decorative pillars, the Shaddaruka decor in the uh, stage, Uha, Pratyuha, and so on, the Salabanjika ladies, Vyala, Chitrajala Gavaksha, and Kutima Vinyasas, and so many. And also, Chitra refers to the Viti Lepa and Sudha Karma after it is done on the walls. They will be painted with pictures like creepers, flowers, men and women, and so on. These are mentioned in both the Shastras. Now the differences. In Nath Shastra, the deities have had to take their position to protect the actors and the mantapa. But in Vastu Shastra, the deities who have been taken positions are somewhat similar to the Bharata, as Bharata mentions, but Rudra, Nandi, Mitra position are changed. Divokasa is not mentioned, and there are much more number of deities. That is from it varies from one square to even 81 squares. And in Nati Shastra, there is no mention of Vastu Purusha, but most of the deities have stood in the same positions. But in Vastu Shastra, Vastu Purusha's birth and control of deity is uh, very important. And uh, in Nati Shastra, Shiki is Ishanya and considered as Shiva. The same word Shiki refers to Agni in uh, Vishwakarma Prakasha. And uh, the, in Nati Shastra, the site should be searched, flowed, and cleared up like bone, legs, kapala, and pot pieces, and so on. But in uh, I think it is not considered a problem for building the Nati Griha. But in case of uh, Vastu Shastra, the existence of pot pieces, bones on the site is considered a problem, and it is considered unsuitable for a residence. And shlokas for the worship of deities mentioned are different in both the shastras. The theater design is mentioned is different in both the shastras. Nati Shastra informs of the triangular plan, but it tells is not the best choice. But in Vishwakarma Vastu Shastra, it is told Trikarna Karabhumi is one of the agreeable types. But Vishwakarma Prakasha tells it is Ashub and Putrahani, and it is to be a Vastu Tyaja Bhumi. So, there have been a lot of uh, similarities and a few differences, uh, having analyzed all these uh, books. Now, the conclusion, Vishwakarma Prakasha does not directly contain uh, any information on Ranga or Prekshagriha. In Vishwakarma Vastu Shastram, a different type of Ranga Shala is formed. So, Nate Shastra is the main proof of, for the Nate Griha by Vishwakarma. 
The overall idea of planning is to produce the desired effect of the dance or drama on the spectator so that he is transported into the world of performance and be involved. So the Rangashala or Natya Griha was intended to serve as a tool for mass communication to impart knowledge and entertainment. Vastu Shastra has been an unproven science for many. Some say it is outdated pseudoscience or superstition, but it is a good analysis to build with brick stone without the cement or concrete. Next slide, please. There are a number of similarities and a few differences, as I already told you. Also, many Hindu ideas are involved. The idea of puja method, crying green leaves, naivedya, punyaha, mantra chanting are typically Hindu procedures. Building construction as per Vastu is a very common thing in the life of, daily life of uh, the followers of Hinduism. Vastu Karma, Vishwakarma Prakasha has a lot of Jyotisha Shastra involved, like Nakshatra selection, Chandra Masapala, for various stages of construction, and Vakuna, Aya calculation, Nadi Gyana and Pala, Vastu for Griha, Bhavana, and so on, which are very commonly done in uh, lives of people, of Hindus. Many tables and chakras based on Jyotisha are given in the book. Puja Vidhi, Homa Vidhi, Bali, Dana, and other offers are mentioned in the slokas. So all these have a Hindu basis. Um, people have to read Vishwakarma's ideas and more research and study need to be done to explore in the field. These are very ancient granthas and many parts of which may be lost. There is no mention of staircase or shala to the shalas and the toilet position is not told in the Nati Shastra. Two mythological ideas seem connected. Bharata in present to Nati Shastra does not mention about the Vastu Purusha. Maybe this was the first time and the deity stood spontaneously. But later, Vishwakarma may have known the concept of Vastu Purusha and may have requested the deities to be summoned in those places. And this incident may have occurred later in time in Treta Yuga itself. This research helps to promote the study of our rich heritage in Vastu tradition of Vishwakarma. Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you, you very much. Mukhaji, uh, that was a very interesting uh, comparative study between uh, two uh, Shastras, two Upavedas. Uh, if there are any questions to Rupaji, or there are actually many questions to Devamandi and others also, uh, people are talking about. Uh, uh, okay, let us take up those questions uh, after lunch. Uh, questions if there are any to Rupaji also. And I think uh, it's a good idea to uh, move to lunch now. And uh, instead of having a one hour lunch, we probably can cut it short and uh, have a half an hour lunch and come back at two o'clock uh, to take up the paper by Shankar Tripathi ji, uh, which is the last paper of this session. Uh, it is in search of the Chola temple and it's a composite reality, a study of the Chidambaram Nataraja uh, temple, uh, my favorite uh, uh, temple. So uh, let us have this paper uh, as the first paper for the uh, post-lunch uh, session because we are uh, running behind the time and uh, people have to move uh, for lunch. Uh, let us break for lunch for half an hour and gather at uh, 2 o'clock again. Thank you very much. I think it's a great idea. Yes, let's meet at 2 o'clock.
We Thank you. 
Ocho meniles todo con tu blue lo
हेलो हेलो हाँ जी आई एम ऑनलाइन Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, it it seems he uh, is going. It is going to be delayed for Navraj sir. Can you please uh, start the session? Yeah, sure. One. Thank. Thank. Yeah. Hello. 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 Namaste, everybody, and um, I. We are back after a good lunch. I hope this is usually a tricky session because it's immediately after lunch and everybody's energy is kind of low. But we have a very, very, very interesting session planned out. Uh, it is about the Temple of Chidambaram, and it is by Professor Shankar Tripathi. I would request him to start his presentation. uh thank you ma'am and uh, just a clarification i am not a professor i'm probably one of the youngest here i'm currently pursuing my masters right now okay <laughs> artificial but you know you uh, have a very you have a very uh, weighty name so i oh. didn't <laughs> i didn't think you would be this young actually uh, i hope i live up to the expectations then <laughs> so is it visible now yes it's visible yes right so so we've had a lot of precise and very complex i wouldn't say complex rather but very technical ways of understanding how the artistic cultures have developed over uh, our particular history in terms of hindu innovations crafts art uh, temple and architecture right but i want to kick it back a bit and before i proceed with my whole paper and presentation which is titled in search of the chola temple and its composite reality a study of the chidambaram metaj temple i want to ask just a very basic and fundamental question so how do you exactly label the presence and space of a temple when we approach a temple when we come towards an architectural aspect of a particular civilization or a dynasty how do you particularly call that that this is perhaps a chola temple is it's perhaps that the chola king perhaps patronized it uh perhaps it was found in the chola territory or perhaps it carried any certain sense of stylistic innovations that were particularly you know associated with that dynasty but the point is that all of these are still speculative and general in the in the sense that there is no general consensus that when we apply a dynastic label this is precisely the reason why we are doing it there is this over utilization and just an over simplicity which comes when we try to associate or like place a name a dynasty or just understand the nature of a temple per se so through this presentation i'm seeking to highlight the very problematic aspect of how we currently use the nomenclature and by taking the example of the chola dynasty seek to understand what really constitutes a chola temple so when we look at the chidambaram temple which would be my example i will see dynastic labeling and identify it with contextual realities these realities would be religious it would be social they would be royal and it would be in these contextual realities that not only did the cholas function but also we, how we need to adapt a newer kind of methodology in terms of assessing what the temple is like so to begin with it is important that we bear in mind the extent of the imperial cholas rise to power so i'm not going to bore with the details of like the narrative history of from where did the cholas came and what did they do but if you just focus on the map that i've highlighted here just focus on the blue region of the latter part of the indian subcontinent that is the area of focus and the reason i want you to keep this map in mind is because there were a lot of dynasties which were vying and they were fighting for power supremacy land control right in the time when even the cholas came i mean so for this particular section there are a lot of scholars and they have done a lot of work so i have particularly taken up nilakantha shastri's work and nokru karashima and uh, nilakantha shastri he has coined uh, coined this one term uh, the three crown which was essentially the fight between the rashtrakutas and the chalukyas with the chol so right at the onset when the chols came from the pallav dynasty there were already these three four dynasties that were in contention with all of those areas there and obviously then you have the rise of raja raja one and his successors vijayalaya and all of those people ultimately till kulotunga 
after which we see a general decline with the dynasty. So we've established that this was a point and a place where a lot of dynasties and a lot of kingdoms were establishing a foothold. And this foothold wasn't simply economic or political or social, right? It was also visual. So all of these created a sense of visual artistry and an idiom of temple architecture and construction. That is why today, if you go to this region, you will say that, oh, this is a Pallav temple. This is a Chol temple. This is a Hoysal architecture, right? So you can associate and you can imagine something like this. What I want to posit is that the very same methodology that we use in identifying these elements, these temple architectural structures are problematic in their very basic fundamental understanding. So if we take this example here, you have two temples which are seemingly very similar and that's perhaps the first point I want to raise about the problem. On the left, you have the, Vijanarayan, uh, the temple in Vijanarayanam and on the right, you have the temple at Sendalai. Now, Vijan, the Vijanarayanan temple is at the southernmost tip of the Pandya Nadu region and the temple on the right is in the middle of the Chola Nadu region. And the, the actual the Encyclopedia of Indian Temple Architecture, which is supposed to be the great book, which classifies all these uh, temples and indexes them according to the style and structure, right? So the book, the encyclopedia calls that the temple on the left is in the middle Pandi Radu style. So therefore, it means that it is part of the Pandya culture. But the same encyclopedia characterizes the temple on the right in the Chola style of architecture, which is interesting for me because if we formally try to understand why is the temple named particularly so? The formal aspects are very similar, if not the same. You see the same shallow niches, you see the same Brahmakant pilasters, you see the same Padpanda base that are there. So on one particular understanding of the formal reading, it just feels really truncated and redundant to, to imagine that these two will be stylized in different aspects when their formal characteristics are literally the same. And the problem gets even more compounded when you come to the same region. Now, these two temples, if I had removed the caption, it would seem that they're actually the same temple, or just of different views. But we know for a fact that, okay, this is the Bala Supramanium temple and this is the other temple. So these two temples are found in the same Pudukotai region. The times are also like similar and well, they're in the same lineage. But the point here is that the Bala Supramanium temple has been understood to be in the Pandya style because it was found in erstwhile Pandya territory. And the Sundareshwara temple has been understood to be in two iconic uh, visual idioms. One has been no, the no, no. Idiom, no, no. And no, no. One, one has been the late Mutarayar idiom. These two have been associated with the Chol dynasty. But again, the problem still persists here. You see the Padbandha base, you see the brackets, you see the cornice, you see the Brahmakanta pilasters, even the shallow niches that are found in the Chola temples, the temple that we ascribe to the Chola dynasty, shouldn't necessarily have shallow niches because the whole idea of putting an image, a figure of a god or a deity or of any kind was introduced in these niches by the Cholas. So by assumption, you would imagine that they are carrying a similar idiom that the Pallavs or people before them created. And that doesn't make sense. If they are carrying the same feature, how are we really stylizing them as Chol? Something which is different, right? Even Susan Huntington has uh, noted this one stone temple at Nartamalai. Now she uses this inscription from a Pallav, from a Pandya king who says that this temple was uh, consecrated for the Vijaya, Vijaya Cholishwara. That means it was made by the Vijaya king that was there in 1228. But its form and design are also very similar to what the earlier Panda and Pallav temples used to be. So I hope I'm, you, you're realizing that this problem of attributing a dynastic label is very inherently truncated and very problematic. Because if you look at it from the formal point of view, it just doesn't make sense that there is a difference. And if you do not figure out a formalistic difference, you cannot ascribe it a royal distinction because not every temple will have an inscription with it. Not every temple will be visually identified that this was made by this particular king. And the problem is very similar. The reason I showed that map initially was to make all of you realize that because every dynasty was fighting in the same region. Now it could be because of a problem of convenience, because of perhaps conserving resources. They did not decimate the temples or the idiom architectures that were created before them they built upon or rather they just subsumed and appropriated those temples with, you know, their new dynastic culture. 
so to really truly understand how do we access or how do we classify newer uh, cultures or newly excavated or discovered temples i am proposing a new kind of coda or a methodology here that if we really want to look at temples we need to realize this contextual realities that are now seemingly lost and that is why i am taking the case of the chol temple chidambaram now i am identifying that there are three major tendencies that chol temples usually exhibited and that was particularly unique to the chol dynasty there you had the emergence of temple towns which is very visible in the visual in front of you you have the chidambaram temple right in the middle and then the city evolves around it you have the elevation of dance hymns and procession the idea that a religious procession can emanate from a temple emerged from a chol dynasty and it had large repercussions for the way the temple would be consecrated and created and then finally you had a characteristic development of the size and importance of the gopura so you now keep these three things in mind and we can now even begin examining a chol temple we have to look beyond the basic aspects of dravidian temple construction because all of these temples had a uh, you know had a garbagriya or their plan about the viman or the gopura they were all present so you need to go into the finer details for example in the chidambaram temple we know in the religious aspect the temple is dedicated to lord shiv but then that itself that plane itself can be consecrated can be dissected into much more finer points and those finer points will actually help us realizing the true contextual reality of what a chol temple could be uh, so right now here just to recap as is in a general sense you have that the chidambaram temple is consisting of these various sabhas right uh, the chit sabha kanak sabha dev sabha nrit sabha raj sabha there are several tirtham tirtham are essentially the water bodies that are found there uh, interestingly beyond the shaivite aspect you also have the image of the govind raj perumal there so you have vaishnavite deities and devotees that also come to the temple uh, chidambaram in itself is really important for its nataraj association so anand ki kumar swami wrote in the dance of shiva that the essential significance of shiva's dance is threefold not only does it has its rhythmic play not only is, does it release the countless souls of men from the snare of illusion but he very clearly identifies that the place of the dance is chidambaram chidambaram is the center of the universe and this place this temple carries that anand tandav mythological construction of how the nataraj dance even came to be so that is where you realize that you do not simply look at a temple and you see that oh this is the deity so that is why this deity because this deity is associated with this di- dynasty this temple is of that dynasty this cannot actually hold true because you have the confluence of various religious uh communities coming together various dynasties would patronize various kinds of religious communities so you cannot simply ascribe by saying that it was this shrine so it was this dynasty uh then you like i said the emergence of the gopuram that is again an innovation that only comes with the chol dynasty so i have taken jc harley's monumental study and the picture here you see is of the northern gopuram now the reason i have picked up the northern gopuram is to highlight another aspect of a contextual reality out of the four major gopuras that are there the northern gopuram has a picture of krishna dev raya which is from the vijayanagar dynasty so here you can again see the problem of formalistic association if someone had simply come to the gopuram and saw the image of Vijay, uh, the krishna dev raya you would have naturally associated it with krishna dev raya's rule or vijayanagar rule whereas that would be falling into the trap of just the formalistic you know over dependence or over burdening of formalism so that is why gopurams again become a really important point because now you're connecting with the whole temple compound you're seeing the importance that they are mirroring the women and then you're seeing how high they're going you can then also see what kinds of cultural traditions are coming onto the gopurams and this is again completely unique to the chols uh i'm taking jerd mevison's study here because he has very painstakingly identified almost the 300 sculptures that are there Uh, you come to a gopuram and you can divide it into two tiers you have the lower tier which has around 175 to 200 sculptures and they are mostly classified into various mandals you so you have the i've shown the navgraha images here so you also have the ashtikpal mandals you have the rishi mandals and these are basically non shaivite sculptures then you also have the shaivite sculptures which cons- constitute in the upper tier 
a hundred more sculptures have been identified based on the particular style, based on the iconographic traditions. Like we studied uh, initially the lost facts technique and how they're creating the various iconographies of the various cultures. Those are very particularly visible here. So again, you did not have to see the temple. You only had to focus on the contextual reality of what the Gopuram was talking about. And from there, you can deduce that because this temple is of for Nataraj, the dance forms, the forms that are taken here are from the Nati Shastra. So they form a natural corollary. And that is where you attribute the significance. Here's another picture I've taken from the Durga panel. Here. So naturally, now that we've covered up the religious aspect, here comes an important aspect of it being social in its nature as well. Uh, the image on the left here, you can see the poster for the movie Nandanar. And the image on the right, uh, right is the uh, statues and the sculptures from the festival image of Tirupan. Now, these are mythological uh, stories associated with the poet saints. And interestingly, they were both coming from this untouchable lower caste communities, which weren't necessarily allowed to enter or visit the temples, right? So there emerges this notion of exclusivity as well as inclusivity. I say exclusivity because the poster on the, right, on the left is very emblematic of these two people. Those are worshipping the idol, right? So those depict the Chidambaram Dikshitar, the community that is actually present in the Chidambaram temple today as well, who are taking care of every uh, internal aspect of the temple. Now, these communities, not just the Dikshitar, but other communities as well, were very close-knit groups. And they were the ones that controlled who would be able to come, who would be able to visit the Gargadriya, who would be able to even step inside the temple. So there is a notion of exclusivity here. But at the same time, the other contextual reality is the realization that with Chol temples emerged not only temple towns, but the concept of a procession. Now you had the deity in front of you, which was not only immobile and present in the Gargagriya, but was actually coming out to greet you. There were mobile forms and these were called Utsav Murtis. These were processional idols, like the image that you see here on the left is the mobile form of Parvati. And the image on the left is the immobile form of Parvati, which is static inside the temple. So from here emerges the concept of inclusion, which you can see in this painting here, a Shaivite procession at night. So this is a company painting. So this is well in the 1800s, so 1830 exactly here. But you can see the essence of the idols being taken in a procession and the various kinds of clothing depicts the various communities and the community members that are now able to reach this close to the idol. They are able to take their blessing. It is as if the God has come out of its womb to actually bless the people. So that element of inclusivity is also coming only with the Chols there. So even if the basic stylistic aspects are similar to other dynasties, we can examine the temple layout, the plan of the whole city there, and we can associate that this kind of a reality used to be there. And this is how then we classify this temple to be so. For example, the, another contextual reality with processions was how the architectural forms of the sabhas were created, the halls. So on the, on the left image, if you can see below, there is this cultural image of an elephant there. And the same thing on the right, you see that there is a wheel there. So you have had scholars like Huntington herself. So she tried to classify that these were again emblematic of the fact that the temple was no longer a immobile structure these sabhas were symbolically portraying that they go out. So the chariot, the concept of a chariot or the concept of a rath here, it, it denotes that people do not need to be hesitant of the fact that the God is away from them. And this again is very peculiar to not only Chidambaram, but to Chol temples essentially. So now that we've even covered the social aspect, now comes a big question, right? Royal significance. Because at one point, someone can argue against me that the reason I picked up Chidambaram is very easy and convenient for me because we know that Chidambaram was very highly patronized by the Chol. And that is true for the biggest temples that are there in the Chol dynasty. You have the Gangai Kondi Cholapuram temple, you have the Raja Rajeshwar temple. There you see that there has been concerted effort by the Chol royalty to establish a royal idiom. Uh, you have had various scholars that have you know, done a lot of studies on. Paul Younger had classified such a practice as one of the two pillars of the religious policy of the Chols. Uh, you have uh, Pletchler Prentice and you have Gita Vasudev and they write that the Raja Rajeshwara temple was to serve as a benchmark for subsequent Chol temples. Even Vidya Deheja mentions the practice that Raja Raja 
used to not only did he donate 22 images himself but he used to ask people in the village to remit a certain amount and to donate it to the temple's construction so that the temple can be vast in its splendor and understanding and that is true for a lot of instances in these temples. Uh, so the, the, on the image on the left, you can see the golden roof of the Chit Sabha at Siddhartam. So this golden roof was established by Kulutunga too. So you have the Kulutunga Cholan Kula, the inscription that is there. And it talks about the uh, just the ways that Kulutunga too and his family used to work on creating the perfect image of the Chidambaram temple. Uh, you have also have studies which talk about local commanders, military leaders like uh, Naraloka Virat. So he was a military commander under the Chol army and he also uh, made a mark by donating various images and various statues and various cultures. And, uh, then the image on the right you have. So you have Shiv as Chandesh Anugrah Murthy and Raja Rajendra Chola sitting at his feet. So you see the image of that royal idiom being very clearly constructed there. Because not only is Rajendra Chola placed in the whole you know, scenario here, but you can see that Lord Shiv is actually blessing his head. So now this kind of an image construction shows the people that the Chol kings were rightly ordained by their gods to rule. So they're carrying a particular sense of not just a royal dictate, but also infusing a religious idea with a royal idea. Now, till here, it makes sense that you can ascribe a sense of royalty or like a royal association to a temple and call that because of this image, this is a Chol temple. But here is where the problem deepens with more and more revisionist idea, with more and more scholarship that is very particularly studying the sculptures and just the temples that are there. You see that there are very little inscriptional evidence which directly relate to a Chola patronage beyond these three major temples that are there. Before Raja Raja's consecration, we only have one instance that is from Parantaka 1's Tondai Mana temple. Apart from that, there are no particular inscriptions that say with absolute certainty that this temple is aspired to this dynasty. Moreover, Gangai Kondi Cholapuram and Raja Rajeshwara temples are wholly unique and singular in scale. And that then refutes the particular point initially where Gita, Vasudevan and Parantis said that the Raja Rajeshwara temple was to serve as a model for, for the subsequent temple. It isn't a model because we know for a fact that the Raja, Raja Rajeshwara temple is completely unique in itself. And even beyond that, if we argue that there is a royal idiom that is created with the image of Rajendra Chola here and uh, Chandesha Anugrahamurti, beyond that, we have absolutely no clue if there was any particular royal image that was created that used to highlight that, okay, that this is the seal of the Chol, that this is the uh, dynastic emblem, which if we come across on any inscription or on any temple architecture, we can associate with the Chol. That is also nowhere to be found. And interestingly, it is not with the kings, but rather with the queens that we actually have more instances of direct royal patronage. So you have this MB and Mahadevi phase that came up. She directly provides inscriptional evidence that she consecrated and patronized uh, temples like the Agasteshwara temple, uh, Teru uh, Aranari uh, Alvar temple. I apologize if I am mispronouncing a particular name. But essentially, the point is that even at the Nalur Kandaswami temple, she herself donated large amounts of jewelry and several bronze sculptures. Now, that's a completely different argument that with Sembian Mahadevi phase, there was a cultural desiccation. Uh, not only did she transform the stone materials that were used, but there was also a little bit of stiffness that emerged in the images that were there. They weren't necessarily very fluid as they were before. The yes, sir. Uh, uh, I think uh, you're approaching your conclusion. Right? Yes, sir. this is the last slide. Yeah. So, but again, the point is that even with the Chola customs of granting gifts and publicizing grandiose works of art, these were precipitated by the Pallavs and the Pandakis that came before them. So if we today come to the point of understanding a dynastic label and associate the dynasty here, the reason I've picked up the Chidambaram temple especially is not for my sake of convenience that it is directly associated with the Chol king, but rather to portray that it is highly problematic if we simply take a dynastic labeling at face value. So this presentation at the end is not a primary source work. I mean, I envisioned this whole idea right during the pandemic lockdown and it 
and all i had was working with the primary source documents that the scholars and researchers before me had come together but it is about an introspective understanding that we need to rediscover we need to revise the contextual realities of what temples really stood for and we need to go beyond the very basic uh, colonial ascriptions of just looking at a formal aspect now this formalism also came from a european point of view which is wholly dissimilar to how the indian scenario is so we need to shed away that new or post colonial thought and then come to these contextual realities this chidambaram temple is just one you have hundreds and hundreds of temples that are there and there is an absolute possibility and certainty that once we start contextualizing their unique realities we can do away with the western hegemony of how uh, the formalistic dynasty labeling has been introduced and bring about our own methodologies of how we can truly uniquely associate and understand uh, the hindu convention of temple architecture right thank you sir thank you uh, very much shankar ji uh, <clears throat> that was really wonderful amazing to see a youngster like you to be so rigorous academically uh, in studying and proposing alternative methodologies uh, alternative hindu methodologies to, so to say uh, to uh, study temples uh, all the best for you and uh, you probably are going to be an inspiration for mm -hmm. many youngsters uh, there i i was not able to see any specific question addressed to your uh, paper if more questions come up afterwards uh they let us uh, take up those questions after the next paper together right, for you and the other uh, paper presenter now we can move on to the other uh, the first paper of the second session uh, this is by mithilesh ji uh tabitics and uh, Ce uh, cecilior I am i rightly pronouncing it okay mithilesh is law <clears throat> yes sir thank you sir uh my screen is visible and i'm i'm clearly audible yeah yeah you are yeah yeah so i'll be speaking uh on the toretics as an artisan because i also have taken up this art uh, in fact to safeguard the art and to take it uh, further so the subject which i'll be speaking is in toretics uh, the art of process of working in the metal especially by in embossing or casing okay and uh i will be speaking uh, on the community who does this work who are from the himalayas they are known as kami okay and vishwakarma as well i would like to start with this quote uh yes neither wise men nor fools can work without tools you know this is a very very powerful uh, proverb that i found out which uh, can be relatable to the vishwakarma community there are many people who say like pen is mightier than sword you know uh, that is a kind of a condescending kind of uh, idea of a uh, proverb which i feel but uh without uh, bishopurma as being in the play from the ancient time i think both people even the wise people who use the pen or the fools who use the sword would not have come to an existence you know and of course maintenance and tool making is in the blood of bishopurma like every uh, problem or every kind of things and all which is related to technical things like tightening the screw or fitting the you know tap and everything and all we are like very good at it that is what i feel uh okay the word vishwakarma when i was interview interviewing uh, some people uh, regarding my paper which was submitted to government of west bengal uh, a lot of old people i went and interacted with a lot of elderly people and they gave this uh, allegory or anecdote of how the word vishwakarma came into existence uh, in back then you know and this is a very interesting anecdote which i would like to read upon so back then uh, uh, people who were in the agricultural society or uh, people who were into war and all those kind of things and all you know they had to have a certain kind of trust you know with the community members of uh, vishwakarma if you, if you wanted to win a war obviously vishwakarma the blacksmith played a very important role uh, with the tools and ammunitions and arms and all and as well in the agricultural society and all as well so 
if I was from an agricultural society and I went to somebody who a blacksmith, I mean there was a trust between both the communities, and that trust right now in this century, I think we lack uh, this uh, trust, and everybody is in the on their bandwagon, bandwagon, bandwagon. What is that called? I forgot. I'm sorry that, and yeah, and. This is how the trust was built up. They used to give the money, or they used to give um, some kind of uh, uh, alimony uh, to the Vishakarmas, and they had to wait for a month or more, you know, for the tools to be made. And the tools have to be very reliable, which I mentioned here. And that is how all the word Vishakarma was coined. And Uh, so when you when we talk about communities, I came across a lot of uh, authors, uh, researchers, research scholars, and all who have uh, who said that the community, the Kami community, who is the scheduled caste of the country, you know, who uh, who live in the Himalayan region, they are found in Nepal as well. They have been always, you know, discriminated uh, for their work, and their the anthropologists and the anthropologists also they have not considered them. They have just finished uh, their or art or their lifestyle in just in a footnote, which has been mentioned here. And the knowledge which uh, the Kami people have, the Vishwakarmas have, has been handed over through generations and generations you know, verbally. And it has not been documented. And this kind of art and all those kind of architects and all, we cannot learn. So there are many things that we cannot, everything is not in the book and we cannot learn from the book. And this is the best part of, about being being an artist, you know, uh, where uh, the things which are taught are imparted uh, verbally and visually. Uh, this is very, very important. Uh, ethnographers have generally neglected Kami and other outcasts, which I already mentioned. And the reason uh, we have been talking about Vishakarmas, Vishakarma families, and all those uh, points which was uh, presented by the Previous speakers are very wonderful, right? And what I feel is that uh, the art uh, is, you know, neglected, and the lot of like the previous speaker, our friend here, youth, who's an inspiration. You know, there there are a lot of uh, less people, educated uh, youth, who are taking this art because there's a lot of social stigma uh, with the art. You know, the respect is not given, and uh, youth, the coming generation, the youth, they are not taking. Art and that is resulting in in the virtue, in the extinction of the art and it is a time and the time is here to protect the art as well. Uh, no, when we talk uh, the authorities is embossing like this, which I have shown in the slide, and the hand which is used, uh, I have taken this from the Wikipedia. This is the hand of uh, Henrik uh, Gold uh, Goldius, you know. Uh, has shown like how to hold a burin or a chisel and to chisel, chisel uh, the em uh, emboss or chisel or engrave via copper or silver or gold. Uh, this is a picture here, and this uh, the picture at the uh, right side in your screen shows you can see his nose and face right, and the object is here when he's working. So there are certain times that no visual aid, like for working in like small miniatures uh, artwork and all, the magnifying glass is not used, and and that makes it a little uh, hard for the artisans to work. Again, okay, this is how the burins or the chisels are kept, you know, and these are made uh, from your uh, springs or the spring of a car. Okay, and most of the things are not used, and in over time it uh, catches rust, it becomes rusty, and there is no uh, like high metal or uh, the stainless steel which is used. That, that is what I found. But this is a very interesting thing which I want to share. Uh, I had an interview with a uh, with my uh, relative uh, who is an independent researcher and has very good knowledge about the Vedas and all, and here he talks about. In the Natya Sastra Natya Ved, how and how an instrument and was uh, invented or you know, gifted by uh, Lord Vishakarma. Uh, this here he talks about uh, Swati Muni, who 
had gone to fetch water there was this uh, rishi swati muni back then where he went to uh, fetch water uh, in the lake and it started pouring very heavily and the water droplets uh, that made that uh, drumming sound in the lotus leaf inspired him him and he came back to his ashram and he prayed to lord vishwakarma and and when lord vishwakarma appeared and he asked so what do you want and he said like i want a instrument which can give the same sound that the water droplet gave the water droplet made when it hit the lotus leaf and it was very fascinating and that is how this instrument madal came into existence and uh, the uh, in vedas also the madal is mentioned and and the madal is a family of pakhawas jani pakhawas but when it come when it came in the hill it became madal and this is the madal and why i'm talking about madal madal is uh, with our community the bishwakarma community hills uh, there are this uh, madal there is the madal is attributed to the bishwakarma community and there is a dance form that is also attributed to your bishwakarma community in the hills uh, this dance form is called a uh, maroni dance maroni dance this is the dance form all right which has uh, which has uh, its uh, genesis in the ras leela from the uh, mahabharat and this is a very sacred kind of form of art dance that has to be performed with puja and all those kind of things but uh, in this era all this art and all this uh, vedic uh, sacred art has been corrupted uh, due to commercialization and capitalism Now everybody comes for entertainment they just do it and all they don't uh, we in fact don't uh, practice the rituals and the set uh, guide of guidelines and all which is mentioned so oh, this is a mandala that i i uh, 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 Nag- uh nagra so was talking about the sand art and all this is a art uh, of buddhism this is a mandala and they use this particular uh, stones and all colorful stones and they grind it and they make this uh, mandala which is is called ashok ashoka baya mandala and it is for for, for concentration meditation and to, to pujas and ward of evil ward of evil spirits and all and they do this puja for one week and all and after that they spoil this and they destroy it right such a beautiful Uh, now coming to uh, the place uh, where I stay, Kanpung has a very rich history in uh, your art and culture from the right uh, from the time of Silk Route. You know there was a couple of routes, uh, Silk Route, uh, to from east to west, and uh, being from a very ancient uh, uh, town, uh, when the trade started from Tibet and Central Asia and China and all, you know, and with a lot of Uh, a lot of a lot of a different level of art started coming from uh, those passes you know on the horseback gold silver you know music and all those kind of things from the central asia and the art which we do here is related to only your uh, tibetan buddhism uh, the products which we make is related to your uh, buddhism only and you don't hear Uh, generally practice or make things which is related to hinduism or brahmanism and see the thing is there is this very good story which i want to share in the point number 2 uh, story of queen victoria and yeah colin uh, british has also played a very important role uh, shaping uh, the art and culture in this area i don't want to go in the details there was a queen victoria had visited back then in this place where i live kanimpong in district darjeeling and there was an artist vishwakarma i think his name was kalu singh or something i cannot recall the name and he was such a brilliant artist that he had made a jug a water jug out of silver and crafted jug a jug and he gifted that jug a jug to queen victoria and queen victoria was very very happy and she asked her, asked him asked him like okay what do you want you gifted me such uh, such a beautiful uh, gift do you want all of kanpu or do you want 100 dollar and that tap he said well, what will i do with all of kanpu and give me 100 dollars <laughs> 100 dollars and his family is still there right and this kind of innocence were there back then as well so the problems what the community is facing the artist is facing here in the hills i don't know about the other places are 
regarding the procur procurement of the you know uh, metals and all there is no proper subsidies the middlemen they the chunk of the those kind of thing and government schemes and all and government MSCM the budget allocation for your MSCM is not very uh, input at this moment as well and that makes it makes uh, your artist not very inspired with all those kind of things and all. Okay, these are some of the solutions that the God, that uh, I interviewed an artisan and he said like, okay, these are the things that can be worked on. If the government can manage certain things that is mentioned here, uh, the government can rearrange re or purchase of raw materials to the organization, relief of subsidies on certain raw materials and raw materials like we, pro we generally work with silver and copper and all, copper and every day the price is going up and up and there's no subsidies at all they don't look into that and that makes it very difficult for the artists uh, to make profit from there and there's like for establishment of uh, tourist procurement center would be a very good idea you know an arrangement to send craftsmen to trade fairs abroad i mean nationally and internationally as well and that would be a very nice method you know because i have seen that there are a lot of artists also who work with silver and copper like in other countries and all also. And it would be a very nice exchange program if they can do like a fellowship or something like that. Oh, in fact, Indica can come up with um, those kind of uh, uh, thing, things, right? And that would be very nice. Uh, could you give me one minute, please? Uh, there is somebody in the door who is knocking. I'll just open the door and come. Oh. oh. I'm extremely sorry for that. Um, yes, uh, we can run an awareness program in the government. The government can run an awareness program, you know, in the country, uh, taking artists from all, all over the country from different states and all, and they can be an exchange program, like a, a gap student kind of program and all. That would be very, very interesting kind of thing. And plus, uh, the communities here, they, the point number seven, the community, the organizations, even I'm a part of uh, Vishwakarma Silpakar Sansta out here, you know, and here there is no, you know, awards or recognition or fellowship, uh, fellow selection, which is given in the basic entry level, you know, which will motivate you know, the artist to do, uh, do, do, do good and uh, do work more. This is the point. I want to share this uh, 14 year, 14 century old poem, and this is a very strong poem. This is like an allegory, you know. And the, here the poem speaks about a nail, just because you left, you didn't think about a nail and how that nail uh, made uh, the whole army lose your war, you know. So that is, uh, this is how important the community has shaped uh, the the life of everybody like a uh, vanished uh, ancient a uh, vanished ancient silk route from tibet to kalimpong which is not just a silk route more important are those exchanges of diverse culture art people experiences economics and etc that came along with the trade on the heavy feet and hoof which walk miles and miles in their in their shoes uh, here what i meant is when the silk route started happening the community Bishopama community made a very important role uh, in this trade, you know, cultural exchange, you know, because uh, it used to take like so many months for uh, those traders from Central Asia to reach Kalimpong and from Kalimpong they used to go to the rest of India and they, and and with, with it, it came, like, like I said uh, in the previous uh, slide, like with it came a lot of things and all. If the community was not there to change the shoe or shoe or the mule shoe, then these things wouldn't have been possible, you know. Uh, now, this is the workplace. The workplace here are very like small. There is no, there is lack of ergonomic cement factor, orthon effects, ergonomics, 
immune factor and Hawthorne effect is something like uh, you give your uh, workers a good lighting, proper seating, you no know, proper drinking water facility, proper toilet and all. And, and that says that uh, because of that, the performance increases and they feel happy. Something like to do with your happy index, you know. And here what happens is like the workshops are inaccessible. Being from a Shalugas community and a Dalit community, me, myself also, back then there were a lot of discriminations and all and all those kind of things over there, social stigma and all. And we, we, we are still working on it. And because of that, uh, uh, back then, even the good lands and all which were in the roadside, were not, we were not entitled to that. And because of that, uh, we had to stay in like a hilly place or behind somebody's home where there is no access of road and all those kind of things. And most of the communities here live you know, next to the public toilet or uh, or behind somebody's home and you have to take one round and go to the road and all. And when we actually make like big products and all, which is weighing like 500 or one ton or two ton, and all, it's very hard for us to take to take those to the uh, road and um, take it, uh, uh, deliver it to the customers and all. The, those are the problems that we face. Right? And here I've shown a silver uh, product and here we are working in half of the inch. And here we don't use any kind of mag magnifying glass and all. People don't know, we don't know only. Okay, these are the small products, and I don't know. I'll show you like what products that we make. Huh, this one is also there now. This is a silver that has been uh, that has to be beaten. We don't use there is like a if you want to buy a machine, there is no good subsidies and all, there's no loans and all. And we cannot buy uh, those uh, flattening machines, sheet ma machines, and pinning machines and all. And we have to uh, mold this, take a cast and beat it and you know, make it into the silver of size of that size. That is like around eight inches, I think. And that's like pretty hard work. And a lot of time is spent on that, making that. And not only just one, we have to make three. When you see it in the right side, a left side, three of this, we have to melt it, melt the silver, make it and beat it, you know, and all those kind of things. Are very, too much hard work is there and there's no money in that. We need very less. Everyone, everybody wants to exploit. Here again, no safety measures will, is taken and all, and people are unaware of that. This person who is casting, we are working together. I was taking photo and all, and he's happily working. And later on, what happens is he pours everything in, on his hand here. And from tomorrow, he joins his work with, with this kind of hand. Also, no first aid. They don't care about first aid. They don't care about going to hospital, and all those kind of things are there. No? Here. This is copper. Uh, this guy is cleaning uh, your copper uh, plate. Uh, somebody had given this to clean the copper, uh, this uh, Ali. And they use concentrated uh, sulfuric acid, nit uh, hydrogen, uh, hydrochloric acid, or nit uh, nitric, concentrated, concentrated nitric acid, and all the fumes going in the face, and they are working happily, and that causes them a lot of sickness. And a lot of people who have community members, I have seen have died because of the chest problem and all those kind of things and all. And here there is a lack of uh, knowledge and the, 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 what to say, ignorance. The, the, a lot of people are ignorant, you know, because they don't have that education. And most of the artists are drunkards, the drug addicts, and all those kind of things are also there. Uh, this is again a very interesting thing. I'm sure we everybody must be knowing this uh, weapon. This is known as Kukri, which is uh, used by the Gorkha regiment. And uh, a lot of historians, scholars, and people have credited us with uh, this weapon. And Kami community are the people who forged this forged and make this. Uh, and you know, symbol of bravery. And this symbol of bravery is put in their head, you know, the batch is put in their head and they behind their heart and all, but there's no respect. Respect is not given because of that. Nobody wants to take up the job. And yeah, it is resulting in the verge of extinction. And this photo I took uh, when I was in, when I had gone to Bhutan, this is the three community, Kami, uh, Sarki, and Dome. These are the three scheduled caste community in the constitution of India. And 
very beautiful picture you know what, what i found was here three communities are working together here you can see the the tailor is there who are known as damai here at the bottom in the left side there is sarkis who do the work of shoes and uh, leather and here are the smiths kami bishokarmas you know working very harmoniously peacefully and within the three communities also there is like you know power dynamics like okay um, sarkis should come first damai should come first okay i'm more in the higher social strata and all those nonsense but this is my he is my master he is around his name is dinesh sankar he is around he has around 30 years of experience uh, the product which you see out there is not from any science fiction but this is uh, a tika of lord buddha okay he is also a shadow caste community but he has uh, renounced his condemned uh, hindu religion and he has become buddhist okay this is the project that he had worked on this is in sikkim uh he had met he worked in this project and made this uh, buddha statue which is around i think more than 30 40 feet and the tika which you can see here uh, in the right of the screen where i'm pointing okay and that tika is uh, this one which is gold plated and there's a lot of emeralds and diamonds and all those stones are there expensive stones are there and here also when artists and all when we work with this big uh, big project like this government project you know, there are a lot of hot spots you know, a lot of meeting people with the contractors you know, different kind of politic power dynamics are there you know for money and all those kind of things one work very peacefully i mean this is the sad reality and truth of the children of vishwakarmas and this is a pair wheel that that is around 16 feet and this person does he doesn't have formal good education and he must be like around class 6 7 pass and all he doesn't have that knowledge of menstruation menstruation you know time in work and all those kind of things but just seeing without measuring also they are so talented that they will just figure it out and they will just do it you know work and all and this uh, yes i'm about to finish just two minutes yeah thank you thank you welcome and this is then this is me here who is trying to take uh, the art into a different level and we are trying to inculcate i'm trying to inculcate different kind of art form okay like packaging making manchester united logos packaging i'm working on packaging and all as well and these are some of the products of this product which we work on this at the right side this is a skull, skull holder actual human skull holder where uh, tantric buddhists they use it and these are all buddhist ritualistic product made of silver right these are some of the products this is a water holder this is gold this is also related to buddhist gao and this is around one and a half feet or by uh six feet around one lakh rupees and all they'll just put it in your bag and all and they, they'll just take it you know your all right now this is a true story you know which was shared to me by my by vidati kazi singh you know there was time back then like 30 40 years back when you played madal and sang uh, the ragas from the vedas and all you know he said like rose used to bloom in front of your eyes and mango tree used to grow from mango stone i didn't believe for the first time but <clears throat> later on when i really spoke with him and all, i kind of believe it made he made me believe that this kind of miracles also happen you know when people used to go you know and be missing for many years and all and one ritual he only performed with madal and he sang with madal you know that person after singing after doing that ritual in one two months he came back he was i think missing for around 20 years and he came back and that was very miraculous kind of thing and all which we have to do more research and all like uh, the coming youths and coming generation can do better in this i think and yes uh the another slide Yes, this is the condition of the Vishwakarmas in here, and we being from the Vishwakarma family, we need to you know, get together and support each other and uplift the community who are in <clears throat> who are who are in need. And thank you so much. I would like to thank Nagraj Ji, Tefali Ji, and Indika for giving this opportunity uh, to present uh, this. Uh, present this paper and the conference is very wonderful i'm getting to learn a lot of things and thank you to all the speakers uh, thank you so much thank you mithilesh ji that was really amazing uh, 
presentation about uh, a very disadvantaged the sculpting community uh, and all the disadvantages that they are facing let us all work together to do something uh, to help them uh, there are these issues are very complex so probably we are shifting from one kind of economy to another kind of economy that is one of the reasons the older economy was able to sustain their happiness index uh, but gradually we shifted into money economy and uh, we cannot blame everything on uh, you know uh, all these things and uh, leave uh, these uh, hapless uh, great artists to their fate so we should do definitely something to help them uh, let us uh, keep in touch and uh, indica will also uh, do whatever it can in the direction of helping uh, these uh, artists uh, one for sculpting the community vishwakarma's uh, children um, thank you and uh, now actually we are supposed to move to a short film on swami malai by professor sharada srinivasan but uh, she had a medical emergency at her home she had to attend to her parents so now we move on to ponni shelvanathan uh presenting on migration of tamil architecture punni ji are you there punni amma punni amma irkanga okay uh, maybe if, by, while she comes back we can move on to the next paper gayatri shanmuga velan is going to present her paper on revealing the signs of underlying the sacred tradition hello sir um good afternoon like i am trying to call this is poli she is she has come no, online okay. no i am i'm sorry i'm here yeah i'm here so oh, yeah good evening sir good evening good evening yeah uh, so it's time for me to take up yeah 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 that that oh, okay. uh, shanmuga velan i was calling her because i was not able to find you oh, okay uh, so okay please go ahead yeah thank you sir so first i want to uh, uh, do a prayer for my guru om shri guru bhyo namaha guru varale tiruvaral so Welcome, esteemed scholars and friends. I am Pony Selvanathan, research associate from Dr. V. Ganapati Stapati Vastu Research Foundation, Chennai. I belong to a family of celebrated uh, Stapatis who designed and built landmark temples like Madurai Meenakshi Amman, South Gopuram, and uh, Pillayar Patti Rajagopuram, Tiruvannamalai Rajagopuram. Uh, uh and other uh, temples landmark temples in the southern uh, part of india and uh, at this uh, moment i would like to thank sri nagaraj paturi sir shrimati shefali vaidya shrimati jaya jetli and shrimati sachikla anand for inviting me to render a talk on the hindu arts architecture and artisan traditions from morning Uh, i watched all the speakers uh, who spoke before me shared all about the vishwakarmas their tradition and vishwakarma productions today i have chosen my topic as migration of tamil architecture where vishwakarmas have spread the art and architecture not only in india but outside india so we all know that tamil nadu the land of temples is spread with more than 40000 temples and variety of sculptures these temples and sculptures and other creative productions creative uh, uh, marvels have been designed and carved by the shilpis of your so it is evident that our hindu tradition is being preserved in art architecture and sculpture crafting since time immemorial when it comes to temple architecture and sculpture the living tradition of vishwakarmas had been playing major role in the migration of art and architecture through various magnificent structures such as angkor wat temple in cambodia ponnamala vaneshwari temple at kochi kadai kolombo and these are to list 
as examples. So this is being continued till today by the traditional Shilpis and graduate Shilpis with the help of high technology. So there are many such sacred edifices, constructions across the world. So I want to take you to a recent project uh, which we built uh, in the OSIS. And so let us take, uh, I want to share my, uh, just a minute, give me a moment. I want to share my, uh, okay, one minute. Can I share the screen, please? Uh, uh, can you give me the access to share the screen, please? You have the access. I have already shared the screen for you. I have. Oh, okay, because I felt uh, the meeting for me to, uh, yeah. Is that possible, sir? Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, I, I didn't understand. You want to control the screen when I am yes, sharing? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That may, not, yes. that may not be possible, I think. Oh, okay. Then can you go to the next slide? Uh, slide yeah, please. Sure. Sure, yeah. I'll do that. Okay. So now I want to take all of you to my paper, Migration of Tamil Architecture. And he is my guru, Dr. V. Ganapati Stapati. Please go to the next uh, slide. So now I want to take you all to a quick stroll around the recently built temple in the Oasis, that is at the Gardaline Island of Hawaii, to know more about their challenges during the migration of the architecture by the indigenous shapes of Vishwakarma tradition. Please go to the next slide. <coughs> And uh, so, Sanmarga Iravan Temple is the project uh, which was uh, uh, um, designed and built at Kauai Adinam, Hawaii. And this is a temple built by a Hindu monk named His Holiness Sivaya Subra Muniya Swami. So, he is the Guru Maha Sanidana, affectionately addressed as Guru Deva. So, once he had a blissful vision of Lakshiva as brilliant effulgence of light and slowly disappearing, disappearing at the present location of the temple. So he wanted to build a beautiful temple for the divine vision that, uh, that he had at the Hawaii Island. Uh, and he named the temple as San Margaret Temple. So this is a temple of uh, a rare of its kind, built in white granite stone, based on the Agama Vastu Shilpa Grama. So can we move to the next slide, please? So this temple, the presiding deity is called Spatika Lingeshwara. It is a Spatika acquired from a, a underground around uh, near Arizona. So uh, it is a massive, magnificent quartz crystal, Spatika Lingam, a shaft which is a spotless one, transparent spherical ingram. And it is also a rare of its kind in the whole world. So our Rishi Munis, they regard it, they regard the spherical ingram as the very representation, as the very representation of the cosmic space, that is Akasha. So we also address this spherical ingram as Akasha lingam. So Iravan Temple's spherical ingram is seen with the six sided, six saras, six facets and perfectly pointed. It weighs around 700 pounds, measuring 39 inch tall. So our Mayonic scriptures, they describe the lingam as the Mishkala Thirumini, the amorphic form. That is a symbolic representation which has no definite form. So in the context of Iravan temple, the crystal lingam uh, is considered as the Ratnaja lingam or money lingam since it is naturally formed under a small chamber 65 feet below the surface of the earth. So it is also regarded because it was uh, 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 quarried uh, from the, uh, not quarried, I'm sorry, it was from, uh, uh, from a small chamber 65 feet below of the surface of the Bhumi. So it is regarded as a Swayambhuva crystal lingam. Can we go to the next slide, uh, please? So the Gurudeva, he wanted the sacred form to be built in a beautiful temple and he wanted to uh, symbolize the concept of Saint Thirumula of Thirumantram, that is one God, one God. So he wanted this crystal lingam to be installed in a beautiful temple built only for Shiva, the crystal lingam, otherwise called the Spatika Lingeshwari. So the Guru Deva, he 
around uh, uh, in the early 80s he approached dr ganapati sthapati who was the then principal of the government college of architecture and sculpture at mahabalipuram so many round of discussions were held about the design concept of iron temple and finally it was decided that they are going to build the temple in accordance to the chola architectural style with intricate and rare kind of traditional embellishments next slide please and this is the design that was conceived by dr ganapati sthapati the renowned shilpacharya of india and uh, it is planned with a rutam bound architectural design based on vastu shilpa grama can we go to the next uh, slide please and uh, designing technology that ganapati sthapati uh, used uh, was uh, from treatises like manasaram mayamatham and uh, vishwakarmiya and this temple uh, design involves accurate measures and proportions that radiate purity and bliss in and around the built space so the proportions control each aspect in the temple design from layout to kalasham which we say from tashnadi to pradishtandam that is from the excavation of soil till the finishing of the uh, temple uh, project that is uh, uh, till the erection of the stupi kalasham so this we call in shastras as prasadam purusham mahatva puje mantra vitamaha so this means that the temple uh, is uh, 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 worthy that is a uh, priest regards at the temple and he does his chanting of mantras since it is designed to proportionately where the god resides automatically even well before the kumbhakshekam ceremony next slide please so uh, ganapati sthapati designed this temple to face south direction Uh, uh the south direction depicts the direction of uh, dakshinamurti lord dakshinamurti and surprisingly uh eleven temple is the third temple facing the south direction uh the guru deva wanted it facing the south direction since uh they are all moons and it is uh, uh, adinam so the adina karta wanted it uh, uh, facing uh, south direction and the other two uh, temples facing that south directions in the south india is chidambaram nataraja temple and the avadaya koyil of tirupirundurai in tamil nadu so you can see the layout plan which was prepared by dr ganapati sthapati uh, to meet the vision of uh, gurudeva and this was manually prepared and signed and recorded by both the gurus that is the shripacharya shripa guru dr v ganapati sthapati and the maha samidanam guru deva of hawaii adina so facing direction in vastu shilpa shastra has an important role uh, and uh, ganapati sthapati's uh, sthapatya veda the building architecture uh, text explains more about it and he says prak dwaram sugatam vidhi paschima pushti vardhanam danadam cha uttara dwaram varam yamyam cha mokshadam so like you see here the east gives us comfort west uh, marks the material growth and prosperity north brings wealth south is for moksha or the liberation so here the gurudeva wanted the temple to face the uh, uh, south direction of course it's for the liberation purpose so can we go to the next slide please so ganapati sthapati and uh, 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 he the master designer he planned the uh, uh, temple construction and he deployed uh, around uh, 75 craftsmen uh, headed by sthapati selvanagan he is the prime uh, uh, um, disciple and his nephew uh, to the carving work yard at bangalore where all white stones were quarried from the asrahada highway and it was uh, uh, carved and shipped to hawaii island so this project started around early 1990 and till the project is being continued of course it is completed but they wanted to complete in all respect uh, uh, this we are going to see in coming slides and uh, all the shilpis are traditionally trained they are uh, from uh, they are traditionally trained from father to son and later 
went through Guru Shishya learning system in the old way. Uh, of course, under the able guidance of Dr. Ganapati Sapati. Here, I would like to share something like uh, post independence <clears throat> to resurrect the lost uh, art and architecture uh, tradition, the Vishwakarma tradition, of course. Uh, an institution was established. Uh, under the guidance of Srimati Kamala Devi Chato Upadhyaya, the chairman of Pratt Council, uh, um, with the uh, advice of uh, the then Prime Minister, Mr. Nehruji. So this is to uh, preserve, to resurrect the lost, uh, the deteriorating uh, handicraft field, the art and architectural field. It was a serious issue during uh, uh, independence time. So this was the in institution that was established by uh, Srimati Kamala Devi Chakopadhyaya, was the one of its kind in the whole Asia. So it is a very proud moment to share that uh, Sri Vaidyanabha Stapati, our grandfather, was the, uh, he was the, Um, oh, I'm sorry, he was the chief stapati and the superintendent stapati of the institution who planned the syllabus. And today, this institution is affiliated to Madras University, and all the uh, shilpis, stapatis graduated from this uh, government college of uh, uh, architecture and sculpture are spreading their knowledge. Uh, through their projects across the world, not only in India. Can we go to the next slide, please? So now let's see uh, Erevan's uh, concrete foundation. Uh, recently in newspaper, I read that uh, uh, Ram Janmabhumi foundation was completed and they have planned it very uh, systematically with stone powder and stone fly ash, something like that I read. And I was surprised because something similar was applied for Iravan Temple's foundation. So it is a unique kind that existed in the remote past, like uh, the Guru Deva, he wanted this temple to last for a thousand years. So they were concerned with the uh, foundation because of the seismic area and the weathering part. They used to have uh, hurricanes very often. So they were planning to go for a superior uh, type of concrete laying. So the team, the engineering team and the architect team, they formed a concrete mix with post-long coat fly ash that was laid for the entire temple area covering around 4,000 square feet. And there is no reinforcement at all. And it was followed like in the past, uh, uh, not uh, 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 including any reinforcement. So this high volume fly ash mix is placed on 36 inches deep bed of compacted structural field. So that uh, it is a challenging task, of course, and this kind of foundation will hold for a thousand years uh, with the stone structure, the Indianized stone structure. So this type of foundation will, of course, last thousand years uh, as per uh, Guru Deva's expectation. Can we go to the next slide, please? Can we go to the, yeah, thank you. So now uh, the stones were quarried from Esradahali from Bangalore, and all these white stones are hand carved in India at Bangalore, and later it was shipped to Hawaii. So Gurudeva was very particular that these stones have to be carved manually using chisel and hammer of various capacitors. So the, he made no compromise. You know why? Because he felt manually carving uh, the stones will uh, transmit the Shilpi's inner feelings leading to the extraordinary forms, the embellishments, the beautiful intricate carvings. And this was an ancient practice also to maintain the stone's natural tone and sublime quality to last for long and here for a thousand years. So no machines were used at all in these carving works. Even the electric blower was not used. Everything was manually done like 
it was in the past in building like uh, temples like Brihanishwara, Dhrivanamalai, Panjabhuta Stala, Skala Hasti Stala, you know, all those temples, stone structures were manually carried out, carving stone structures, assembling these stone structures were manually carried out. So the same systematic uh, way of doing things were done in this project of Irevan Temple. Can we go to the next slide, please? Anyamma, are you approaching the uh, winding up of your uh, presentation? Oh, oh, okay. It's been 15 minutes now? Uh, yeah, uh, uh, you're uh, close to your uh, end of time. Uh, you may finish another uh, two, three minutes. Okay, then... You can uh, run you... the uh, remaining slides quickly. Yeah, can you just uh, go... Uh, let everybody see the architectural beauty of this temple. And I yes, wanted yes, to yes. go to the page where Vishwakarmas were honored. So I wanted to go to that page. Yeah, uh, all important points. That yeah, you, uh, yeah. So please move the uh, next slide. Yeah. So these are the architectural beauties. Please go ahead. Where the Vishwakarmas shilpis have transferred these architectural elements from India to the Hawaii island. So please go to the next slide. Please. So they can at least read this later. Can you move to the next slide? Uh, please. Uh, here, uh, can you go to the, yeah. Here I wanted to tell you something. This is the Dwara Gopura as the entry to the main temple. And here you can see a beautiful snake, with, uh, the serpent hole. So this is called Vyalavari, which comes at the terrace level. So the Guru Deva, he is a ballet dancer and a yoga practitioner. So he wanted to uh, have the uh, serpent design to celebrate the Gundalini Shakti. So this is a fitting structure that emulates the science of Yoga Shastra, which later all of you can go through and read it. Can you move to the next slide, please? Again, please. Please go to the next slide. Yeah. Keep going. Actually, yeah, please, can you stop here? Can you go to the previous uh, slide, please? Yeah, this, uh, uh, you must have heard about time capsules. So, Gurudeva here, he wanted how this temple was built. And all these selected scriptures like Gita, Tirukkural, and so many scriptures were there. And his teachings, he wanted everything put in a time capsule and buried under the uh, Garbhakudi, so that after a thousand years, it will be a record for the future generation. And another time capsule in the form of copper sheet, etched and spaced with the river sand, with the teachings and about the temple uh, constructions, also again for the uh, future generation. Can we go to the next slide, slide please? Yeah, now normally I, I have to take five minutes, so please do give me five minutes. Because this is the uh, important thing I want to share about the Vishwakarma tradition. Normally, uh, uh, Vishwakarmas are honored for each and every uh, 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 excellent contribution of, uh, in the temple projects. So here, our uh, craftsmen are honored by etching on the wall. Their names are uh, uh, inscribed. And there are so many ways, you know, all the Chera Chola Pandya Pallava dynasties, they had engraved the stone walls with the names of sculptors. And uh, uh, some uh, of the kings, they even, they sculpted the uh, sculptor's uh, uh, figurine. But Raja Raja Chola, please go to the next uh, slide. He had left so many uh, uh, messages about the temple constructions, and one of his inscription mentions about the chief architect who designed and built the temple, and he has given him a title as Veera Chola Kunjaramalla Raja Raja Perimbachal. So this is a great honor and recognition for the Shilpa Parampriya for the Vishwakarma tradition. So like you see the picture here, can we go to the next uh, uh, slide, please? So in these, uh, and these, these, uh, slide also explains about the recognition given to the uh, Shilpis of your. Can we go to the next slide, please? And in this century, 20th and 21st century, again, our Shilpis 
Shakti's, Vishwakarma Shakti's, uh, recognized with stone inscriptions, medals, and uh, uh, certifications. Can we go to the next slide, please? And like you see here, the is Tapati who built a stone marble or carved in single stone after the secondary function of Vivekananda Swami. And can we go to the next slide, please? And this is 21st century where the shipis are recognized with stone inscriptions. Uh, these are, and this is at Washington, D.C., Sri Shiva Vishnu Temple, where a tribute was shown to Padma Bhushan Dr. V. Ganapati Stapati for his contribution of the designing and making of this uh, huge temple complex of Shiva Vishnu. Can we go to the next slide? Now, this I want to explain to you. How oh, Iranian Temple has honored the craftsmen. They have done it in two ways. One, please go to the next uh, slide. One is to collectively awarding them, conferring a title of Hindu of the year 2012. So this has been given to the entire Shilpi team collectively, right from the Stapati, Sutrabrahi, Vartiki, and Sakshaka. So this is a beautiful, a very uh, memorable and uh, 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 recognizing uh, award for the tradition. Please go to the next slide. And this is the highlight of my talk, where I wanted to convey all of you that Gundeva Saivasiddhanta Adina has created a beautiful platform where life-size bronze icons are installed. And these bronze icons they narrate the making of the Irevan temple by the Shilpis. So it explains that they call it as Builders Memorial in Bronze Medium. And this explains, like you see here, the mission of the Gurudeva. And he transmits it to Padma Bhushan, Dr. D. Ganapati Stapati. And Dr. Ganapati Stapati, he depicts the plan <coughs> uh, 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 based on Gurudeva's vision of the Sukshma. And based on that, conceptualize the school of how this design. So, and again, this is built by Dr. V. Ganapati Stapati. And the surrounding bronze sculptures, they give us, they depict the shilpis and the various process of creating the temple with Stapati Salvanada, Ganapati Stapati's prime disciple. Can we go to the next slide? You can see here, Gurudeva is showing his vision, and Ganapati Stapati very gently, humbly bowing and listening to him. On the stone chain that you see uh, uh, at the feet of Gurudeva, it is uh, a symbolically uh, uh, indicating the unbroken spiritual lineage of the gurus of Kailasa Parampara. Like we see in our temple in India, in all our ancient temples, the stone chains are uh, let hand because this is to indicate the continuous lineage of that particular temple and the much or uh, the stapati, you know, like this. And, can we go to the next slide, please? Sir, I think you would have given us some 30 minutes. This is really not enough. Our subject is too long. So now you can see that. Uh, yeah, it, it, this is all, uh, uh, you know, these are all details. You can make them into points and uh, wind it up. Yeah, that's right. There are many details. All the details can be summed up into a point. Yeah, that's yeah. right. So these life-sized bronze sculptures are exhibiting the creation of each and every part of the temple. Like you see Salvanavan Stapati, he is doing the marking and instructing the Shilpi who is sitting down, Chalaya, to carve the uh, Tara Stambu, the beautiful ornated uh, Stambu. And can we go to the next slide, please? And these are the Shilpis. No, please go to the previous one. Yeah, these are the shilpis. These are life-sized bronze star statues depicting the work they carried out. So this we don't see anywhere else. Gurudeva believed that these bronze statues may be after thousand or more years later, when they unearth this, uh, excavate this, they will have an idea how the temple was built. So this is a beautiful uh, way of uh, uh, preserving uh, part of preservation of the temple and the sculptures. And let me go to the concluding page. Can you go to the next slide? So like I said earlier, Irevan Temple is the only temple built in white granite stones 
and it will dot the map of America as a pilgrim center to those who seek spiritual guidance. And it is, uh, it is of course, a temple without using modern machineries and in a country like America. And this is, this was possible only by our Shilpis from India. The, uh, it proves that Vishwakarma technology uh, belongs uh, uh, to a living tradition. So I would like to conclude this talk with the citation by His Holiness Tiruchi Mahaswami of Sri Raja Rajeshwari Mad Bangalore that the Eleven Temple is going to be to America as similar to what the temples of Chidambaram, Madurai, Rameshwar, and other great Saivai temples are for India. And of course, it is no doubt that migration of Tamil architecture keeps continuing across the globe through the Shilpa tradition in the preserving of the Hindu culture. And thank you all for your kind attention. Thank you, Terin. Thank you very much, Pranyama. Uh, this was really a very interesting paper. Uh, I was uh, very glad to see the word Hindu in the award also. Uh, great Hindu uh, and all that. So it's uh, really a good migration of uh, our tradition. And uh, uh, Gurudeva has done a good thing by uh, installing the sculptures of uh, the work in uh, progress. Uh, uh, the sculpt sculptures of the sculptors are very rare, uh, actually. Uh, I think nowhere else uh, people have installed the sculptures of the sculptors. Uh, there is such an acknowledgement of their help done. So now we'll move on to uh, the last paper of the session. And after that, we are going to have a screening of the film by Sharada Ji. Uh, before the screening of the uh, film by Sharada Ji, let us have the last paper of the session by Gayatri Shanmugadeva. Shanmugadeva. Uh, one second, uh, Nagaraj Ji. I just want to say something about Ponyji's paper. I found it extremely fascinating uh, to have a paper that actually details the amount of work that goes on into building a temple, even today, and how traditional methods, when they used uh, even outside India, how they can they can provide a new paradigm, new creative paradigm. It is a very fascinating paper. Thank you so much. Thank you. Gayatri ji, do we have yeah. a difficulty in uh, sharing your screen? Uh, our, no, uh, no, sir. No, it's, it's, it's fine. It's fine. Uh, uh, are you able to see my slides, sir? Yeah, yeah, but it is the file that we are able to see. You can switch on to the slideshow. Okay, I already switched on. Yeah, that is the uh, tab, a slideshow tab. You, you were, yeah, that was correct. But okay. Go to that. And, yeah. Okay. Fine. Okay. Is it okay, sir? Yeah. Now it's okay. Okay. Um, so um, the topic uh, given to me today is art and architecture of Vishwakarmas. The uh, the topics which we have heard quite through the day, and mine is uh, focusing on the science underlying the sacred tradition. Before starting my topic, I wish to uh, thank the organizers and uh, uh, dignitaries behind Indic Academy. And uh, also I uh, pay my respects to the panelists of today and also the August audience who have gathered for the conference. So the topic is the science underlying the tradition of Vishwakarmas. Uh, uh, to uh, start with the topic, let me give a short introduction of who is Vishwakarma, why they are called Vishwakarmas. What is the significance of their name? Actually, Vishwakarma, the name translates into, literally translates into the principal creator of the universe. Vishwa is universe and Karma is the creation. So one who has created the Vishwa, the universe is the Vishwakarma. And he is the primordial architect. He is the universal consciousness. He is the supreme Brahman. And out of which has descended the Vishwakarmas, the Vishwakarma community of today. And Vishwakarma, the Lord Vishwakarma, according to Puranas and Etihasas, has five faces, namely Sadyojatam, Vamadevam, Agoram, Tatpurusham, and Ishanam. And from the faces, respectively, we have the five 
sects of Vishwakarma, namely Manu, the blacksmith, Maya, the carpenter, the Twashta, the bronze smith, Shilpi, the sculptor, and Vishwatya, the goldsmith. And they all belong to, the five sects of Vishwakarma belong to a Panjarishi Gotra, Sanaga Brahmarishi, Sanatana Brahmarishi, Abhuvana Brahmarishi, Pratnasha Brahmarishi, and Suparna Brahmarishi. Uh, they have such a rich legacy, the Vishwakarmas. And in the uh, past, the society had Chadur Varnyam, the four uh, fold caste division of Brahmana, Kshatriya, Vaishya, and Shudra. And it is to be noted that Vishwakarmas were never under this caste uh, categorization. They stood apart. They were the Aboriginal creative tribe of India, and they were the, uh, the creators of this entire culture that we see around us. And a uh, few uh, verses from Mulastamba Purana, a very beautiful verse which leads us to the creation of the entire universe. Today, modern science is seeking the, uh, the secret of creation. And we have the secret right in our Mulastamba Purana, which says, Na bhumi, na jalam chaiva, na teja, na cha vayavaha, na cha akasham, na chittamscha, na buddhi krana gocharaha, na cha brahma, na vishnuscha, in short, it says that when the universe was nothingness, then when there was nothingness, when there was void, when there was no earth, no fire, no water, no space, no consciousness, no intelligence, not even the trinity of Shiva, Brahma and Vishnu, no stars. And when it was destituteness and all around and then arose on his own the supreme consciousness the supreme brahman the vishwakarman and he created the world through the panjabhutas and from his five faces he created the five uh, uh, full tribe of vishwakarmas to make the other creations which would facilitate life on earth so the Panjabhutas and the Panjamar, the five sects of Vishwakarma go hand in hand uh, uh, following the fivefold and uh, rule of the nature. We have the fivefold rule everywhere in the nature, our five senses, uh, the Panchaloha, the Panchavadya, then uh, the Panchamukha of the Lord, Lord Shiva. So everything is in fivefold and Vishwakarmas also are fivefold in existence. And a few words about the great Brahmarishi of the Vishwakarma. I would say he is the progenitor of Vishwakarma tradition or the Vastu tradition. He is Maya Brahmarishi who walked the earth some more than 10,000 years ago. And he lived in Kumari Kandam, the, uh, the uh, single landmass which existed prior to what we are now living. It was the whole world was a single landmass. And in Kumari Kandam lived the great Brahmarishi Mayan and who has many works of supreme science like the Surya Siddhanta, the astronomical work, the Pranavanul, the Aintaramadam, the Agamam, the architectural treatise of Mayamada, and his disciples have given much more like the Manasaram, Kashyapam, Brihat Samhita, all these are done by his disciples. So we find a mention about this great architect and builder and technocrat in uh, Ramayana, Mahabharata, the Tamil works of Shalapati Karam, Jeevaka Chindamani, Sri Puranam, and Tolkapiya. And um, next, moving on to the next thing, like uh, I want to uh, uh, tell in detail about the iconography of Lord Vishwakarma. Why this uh, Lord Vishwakarma is seen with such a post in such a posture? In usually in sculptural uh, tradition, the, the deity is given a form according to the Dhyana Shloka of the deity. According to his Dhyana Shloka, Lord Vishwakarma has been given, the, uh, the, our Shilpi Rishis have meditated upon the Lord and he has given vision to them and accordingly his image has been envisioned and sculpted. And the, he is with five faces, Sadyojata on the top and the other four faces facing the four directions and with 10 hands and weapons in each hand. And this is a highly significant form because the five faces as such are not only representing the beautiful beauty of the form, but it has a very significant meaning that four, five faces represent the fivefold Vedic tradition followed by the Vishwakarmas. Vishwakarmas, as I told, are Aboriginal creative tribes of India who were pre-Vedic in origin. We have several literary evidences towards that. And the Pranava Veda, 
that is the foremost Veda, is represented by the foremost head of face of Vishwakarma. And from pra Pranava Veda emanated the other four Vedas of Shabda, Gandharva, Natya, and Stapatya. Shabda represents the poetry, Gandharva represents music, Natya represents mu uh, dance, and Stapatya represents architecture and sculpture. And Pranava Veda, this was the only one and only Veda which had the grammar for the creation of all these art forms and which had the meaning of Pranava, the Omkara, and the how the Om existed in two forms, as is Om sound and Om light. That is Nada Brahman and Artha Brahman. Nada Brahman giving rise to poetry and music, Artha Brahman giving form to Natya and Stapatya, and all these had a similar divine grammar, and that was why poetry, music, dance, and architecture and sculpture existed uh, harmoniously under a single umbrella of the temple premises. That will create a harmonious vibration within the temple that will attract more people into the temple. And the existence of Pravaveda is corroborated by Vedavyasa in Mahabharatam. Like he says, Ekayava Puraveda Pranava Sarva Vayanvayaha. In the foremost uh, period, there was only one Veda called Pranava Veda. And um, as I told, Vishwakarmas were also called the Panchamar, and they were also called the Kamar. Kamar means uh, the name derives from Kam. Kam means space. So, what is the significance of Vishwakarma and the space? Now, I'm uh, going deeper into their science, into the science handled by the Vishwakarmas. Space is the primal energy. It is the primal element of Panjabhutas and space, as per the Vastu tradition or Vishwakarma ca tradition, carries a significant place. Taitari Upanishad says, Akasha Vayuhu Vayu Ratni Agne Rapaha Adhya Prithvi. It says, from Akasha came the air, but from space came air, from air the fire, from fire the water, and from water the earth. So what do we see here? According to the Vastu tradition, the space, it is it is the embodiment of the unmanifest Supreme Brahman. The space we see around that surrounds the entire universe is the embodiment of the Supreme Brahman and it is called energy, Vastu. And it is in the subtle state. And through the process of manifestation, it comes down to the earth and forms the material forms. And here energy itself turns into matter. And the Vishwakarma Vastu tradition is a supreme science dealing with the conversion, not the conversion. It is the manifestation of energy into matter or the uh, Nirguna Brahman into the Saguna Brahman. And going further into the science of space, Actually, we are talking about space science and modern physics is now going deeper and they are yet to find the fathom of this, uh, uh, the depth of the science. The space or akasha that we that is that surrounds entire universe, it is called Bahir Akasha, the outer space. And the same akasha resides within every animate beings, every animate beings that is uh, uh, um, uh, in the universal world, and that has the antar akasha. We have that space inside, and that's why we speak and we move and we live. So the bahir akasha and antar akasha are one and the same. And what is the space? Is it space space a void? No, it is highly energetic uh, entity. It is made up of minute particles of energy. And that particles also has been identified by the great Brahma Rishis through their meditative powers. That is why Shastra says, Paramanu Riti Proktam Yoganam Drishti Gocharam. The Paramanu is visible to only those intelligible uh, beings who are yogis. So only they can see the Paramanu. And that Paramanu is the uh, basis of all the creation that is taking place in the world, that this Paramanu is what we call Om. And if we are in such a spiritual state that we can listen to the sound of the universe, it will be only the Omkara. It is the Om sound. Om has two forms, Om sound and Om light. And from these two forms comes the oral and visual forms that we see around in the universe. And now I'm still going deeper into the science. The the omkara or the paramanu, it has a form. What is the form of the omkara? That also has been deduced by the Vishwakarma Shastras, Vishwakarma Brahma Rishis. This om is said to have a square form. 
the Om or the space energy is called Vastu Purushan. Vastu Purusha Chaturashra Samstaha. The Vastu Purusha lies inside a square and the square is the primary form manifest form of the unmanifest and it is called the Nirguna Brahman, the Svatvika state. And that is why in architecture of Vishakarmas or the Hindu architecture, the rectangle and square is the most preferred form because the energy is in a subtle state. And the when the energy, when the Paramanu, when the Brahman wants to express itself, it undergoes a self-speed, it undergoes consciousness. It is an urge that takes place inside and it wants to express itself and it undergoes self-spin, it vibrates and it pulsates in rhythmic form and give way to material forms on the earth. And even a Shilpa Vidya Rahasya Upanishad, earlier Stapati Umapati was also mentioning about Shilpa Vidya Rahasya Upanishad, which is a unique Veda for the unique Upanishad for the Vishwakarmas. And it says that everything in this universe are shilpas that has been created because of the ideation of the mind of the supreme brahman we are all replicas of the brahman we are all shilpas not only we everything that, that we see around in the universe the water the stone the rivers the mountains the trees the plants the human beings everything are replicas of the the mind of his the brahman he has reflected as the universal forms. That, that is why it said, Jagat Sarvam Shilpa Meva Bhavati. The whole universe is but different forms of Shilpa. So beautiful is this Shilpa Shastra. And oh, so now I was talking about how the Brahman is manifesting into the different forms on the earth. So you might be thinking, why should I be going deep into the science of Brahman when we are discussing about Vichakarma tradition and their creation? The beautiful part is that the Vishwakarmas employ the same divine grammar used by the Brahman in his creation that this same geometry is applied by the Vishwakarmas and that is why every creation by the Vishwakarma is mesmerizing. It evokes a spiritual connect between the onlooker and the object created. And that is because he understood the divine grammar of the God. And the Greek uh, philosopher Plato has said, God forever geometrizes. How true he was. What is the geometry? How does God geometrize? What is that which uh, makes him geometrize? And this has also been found out by the Vishwakarma tradition. And Again, I have to start from the unmanifest Brahman, the space, and that is in Tamil, it is called Moolam. And the Moolam only transforms himself into the various forms. And the Moolam pulsates. And what inspires the pulsation? It is the time energy, the Kala Purushan. The, um, uh, Puran, uh, the Shastras call it Kala Purushan. Only the time factor makes this Moolam pulsate. And that pulsations are rhythmic in nature. And because of this, the moolam attains an order, orderly vibration, because of which it transforms into forms. And such orderly forms collectively form the nyalam or the cosmos. Such a beautiful uh, 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 hierarchy of uh, uh, pro process that the Brahman, uh, the space goes through to create the universal forms from moolam, the kalam, the shilam, the kolam, and finally, the nyala, the universe, or the entire cosmos. So now I am uh, coming uh, from the intangible to the tangible part of measurements. Now we have been dealing with the metaphysical plane, the intangible part of the Brahman. So we, if we see the British units of foot, uh, furlong, yard, foot, and all, all these are derived from tangible measures. For example, the furlong was taken by making a horse run from one end of the street to another. But in Indian architectural tradition, the beautiful part is that our basic measurement, the viral or the angula, the mana angula, the measure of a finger is derived from this paramanu, which is nothing but the manifest form of the Brahman himself. So this, this table of uh, Paramanu is there in the Vishwakarma text. It is eight Paramanu, starts from eight Paramanu, forms one car dust, and eight car dust form one grain of uh, one grain, and eight such grains form one sesame seed, and eight sesame seed together form one paddy seed, and eight such paddy seeds make one viral, the finger measurement, or the manangulam, 
and one mana gulam transforms to one and three by eight inches in the modern standards. So this is the uh, greater significance of our tradition of uh, deriving the measurements for our material creations from the uh, uh, form of the Paramanu. And see here we have the cubical form. Uh, the, the Paramanu, which is squared in two dimension, is a cube three dimensionally. And from that cube, when it when it is expressing in the subtle state, it has an eight by eight, by eight mandala. It forms an eight by eight grip. And when it comes out as material forms, it is a nine by nine grid. This eight by eight grid, we call it the Manduka Vastu Mandala and the nine by nine grid, we call it the Paramasaika Vastu Mandala. To make it more clear, let me tell you something. When a Shilpi wants to sculpt a form, first he uh, conceives the image within himself and in his inner space, this eight by eight, the, the form is made in that eight by eight mandala. His, his inner space first develops the form in an eight by eight form. And when he chisels it through his hand, or when an artist sings or says the poetry, or when it is out manifested in the material world, it becomes a nine by nine gross form, which is very much in action. See, this uh, this we call the eight by eight and nine by nine, we call the Ashtatalam and Navatalam. The Ashtatalam is uh, in the human form, we can see it very clearly. Uh, in the Ashtatalam, we see, the face is one unit, the torso another three units, legs another four units. Together it makes the eight talam. It is in the subtle state, eight by eight ashtatalam state. And when it is produced outside, the, the shikara, the, the space about the forehead, the neck, the knee joint, the ankle joint, the four one fourths together form one unit extra and eight plus nine, it becomes Navatalam. And this is the final gross form of the sculpture that we see outside. This is the beautiful geometry engaged by the Shilpis in their tradition right from the beginning. And <coughs> and this, uh, when talking about Dashtatalam, I'm reminded of one more thing, like, uh, uh, we were talking about the sculpture. What about the music? The what I is the base? Yeah, uh, yes, sir. I'm yeah. going to. I'm going to wind up. Yeah. Um, uh, in the in the in the music, uh, we have Adi Talam, which is also of eight beat, uh, eight eight beat, and that performs the rhythm that creates a rhythm for the music. And now the form of Om, again, I want to mention about a beautiful another beautiful thing of the uh, cosmic uh, uh, science. The cube, as I told about the Brahman, uh, the cube we have, it is the consciousness, the supreme consciousness as the Paramanu, and it has a cosmic thread of light going through the center of the Paramanu. And that is the, uh, it is called the Brahmanul, or it is called the Brahmanalam, or the, uh, the thread of light. And the entire energy of the Paramanu is concentrated around that shaft of light. And this shaft of light is what causes the creation. The time factor makes this shaft of creation to vibrate in a rhythmic form. And this, is, this vibration is rhythmic. And this is called the dance of light. And the Shilpis have transformed this thread of light into the form of Lord Nataraja, the dancing form of luminous Nataraja called the Oli Nataraja. And I am so proud that our science has been recognized in the world, in the West, where the dancing form of Lord Nataraja is seen in the premises, in the frontage of the CERN, the Center for European Center for Nuclear Research in Geneva. This was gifted by India way back in 2004. And that is where the, the, the path breaking discovery of Higgs boson particle, the God particle, was done in um, 2012. So, we, we have that particle physics with us long before the modern science has discovered it. We had the atomic science. We had the string theory. The thread of light is what, what transforms it. I, I, I cannot but uh, draw a parallel between the thread of light and the string theory of quantum, quantum physics. Such is the depth uh, of our science that we need to ponder more about it and think beyond uh, architecture. It is not really about architecture. Vastu Vedam is not really architecture. It is not about lines and lines and uh, uh, rooms and orientation and all those things. It is a science. And 
we have to learn the science and then come to the technology so that we understand our tradition we are we become proud of our tradition so that we can uh, take it to the rest of the world and also uh, preserve for the posterity thank you so much amazing paper uh, dakriamma thank you uh, this is uh, really uh, you have uh, looked at the whole vishwakarma shastra from a very scientific point of view that makes us all proud of our tradition now the last part of the uh, day for the conference uh, is going to be a film short film made by professor sharada uh, going to be screened now by indica academy temples were built and bronzes cast by the of the 10th century and here in swami malay 30 kilometers away from tanjore or tanjavur this tradition of making bronzes still survives in this little village of swami malay and we are now in the workshop of devasena sthapati one of the reputed families of traditional bronze casters Soften the wax. Give me two minutes so that there are no flaws. So a very crucial process is this whole matter of carving the wax model, almost sculpting it really. So it's a process of sculpting wax, and so all the details are first sculpted onto the wax, and then the wax is melted out. and that's really what the sire pedi process is that is it's first encased in three layers of clay to make a mold and then the wax is melted out so that it leaves a hollow in the shape of the metal to be cast and then the bronze metal is poured inside to give the casting and then the mold is broken and the metal icon is retrieved and in this process each icon which is made is unique because it is the unique specifications and the shaping of the wax model that results in the icon so in that way it's not a replication process measurement ella panni eppadi pandrenga wax model wax model vandu naanga vandu enna oyaramo andha oyarathu thanna oola illa adhu pola andha thanna oola illa eduthirran he uses a palm frond frond of the coconut tree karana sumare recording aagi and this is used for marking out the proportions of the icon thanna maram thana coconut which is thanna and then இது வந்து என்ன பண்றேன்னா இந்த ஃபீமே மேல் ஃபிகரா இருந்தா இத 124 பாகம் பண்றோம் 124 பார்ட் 124 பார்ட் பண்றோம் ஃபீமேல இருந்தனாக்க 120 பார்ட் பண்றோம் ஓ ஹி சேஸ் தட் ஃபார் a மேல் ஃபிகர் ஹி யூசஸ் 124 பார்ட்ஸ் அண்ட் ஃபார் தி ஃபெமேல் ஃபிகர் 120 பார்ட்ஸ் அப்படினா இது சின்ன சின்னதா 120 ல பண்ணிரலாம் இத நான் பண்ணிட்டு இருக்கதே 120 பார்ட் தான் பண்றேன் அது இந்த லல்லாடம் This is the forehead, face, 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 neck, face, torso, chest, nabi, navel, coming to the 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 top of the thigh, so this is two and a half, uh, and a half, பகுதி இதோடியே எல்லாம் பண்ணிக்கலாம் இதே மெஷர்மென்ட் தான் கைக்கு வந்துருது அந்த சேம் மெஷர்மென்ட் ஃபார் தி ஹேண்ட் 
So he's making here the Nataraja image as you can see. This shows the fire of destruction of Nataraja and this is the drum of creation and he's dancing on the Demon Dwarf Apasmara. So he has made this separately and he will join this. Yes. And then the Prabha will be made, the ring of fire will be made separately and joined. And the ornaments are made of, in the grade of wax, you remember? This is uh, honey wax. Beeswax. Um, uh, peace wax. Uh, this is soft wax. It is not ornament. Made of soft wax, uh, which is of beeswax. Beeswax. And this is of hard wax. Hard wax. Paraffin wax. This has got paraffin wax and beeswax. So there are different grades of wax that he uses. One very crucial process is that of attaching the runners because metal is, although it's molten, it doesn't flow very easily. So he's showing here how the process of joining runners to make the metal more castable is done. So this is our third day here when we are passing through Swami Malay again and we are looking here at the stage when the wax model has been made. You can see the runners of wax are also one is a screw another is uh, one is for pouring metal, one is for the escape of gases. So there are two, ven one vent and one sprue. And the whole mold has been covered with iron bands so that it won't burst and things to consolidate it. So that's exactly what we're seeing over here. And now they're getting ready to melt the wax out. That's what they're going to do. Ooh, this process we should see. Thank you. 
As such, the lost wax technique has quite an ancient history. I mean, in the Indian subcontinent alone, it is thought that the uh, very fine Mohenjo-daro dancing girl dating back to about 2500 BC may have been made by the lost wax process. But of course, there was a big break and it's really from the early centuries AD that images started to be cast very widely in India for Hindu, Buddhist and Jain purposes under the dynasties such as the Guptas and then the Pallavas in the 8th century and then the Cholas in the 10th century. And uh, in, in a sense, to some extent, the iconographic conventions have remained uh, to a large extent the same over the past thousands of years because they followed religious texts called the Shilpa Shastras which gave very specific very detailed specifications on, way the, on the ways the iconography of the gods and the goddesses should be portrayed. Uh, you know, the pose of Parvati and the dance of Shiva and all of uh, the Nataraja pose and uh, that is the, the Hindu god Shiva as a lord of dance and then Parvati that is a consort. And so many of these iconographic conventions and the mudras or the hand gestures which are also used in the classical dance traditions, those have remained the same. But we still maintain that the Chola and Pallavas made the best bronzes, which they don't replicate those anymore. <laughs> in the Tanjavur Art Gallery in the historic city of Tanjur, the capital of the Chola dynasties back around the 10th to 11th century. And we are looking at the celebrated Nataraja bronze images for which this dynasty has been most famous. And I first came here in 1990 as part of my PhD thesis when I was investigating the way these images were made and had also visited Swami Malay and visited the methods of making images even today. And to just explain briefly the iconography of the Nataraja bronze, as you can see, there is this representation of the so-called cosmic dance of creation and destruction, where the drum is held in the, in the right hand, the drum of creation, and the fire of destruction is held in the other hand of the dancing Hindu god Shiva. And around him are the cycles of perpetual creation and destruction represented by fire. And underfoot is the dwarf demon or Apasmara who is quelled. And so this represents the uh, universe in cosmic order whereby forces of creation and destruction are balanced and the forces of good and evil kept at bay. And these are the five activities of the dancing Hindu god Shiva. <coughs>
hope you all enjoyed the short documentary by professor sharada uh, let us just check if uh, there are any questions uh, okay so there are uh, compliments for gayatri uh, madam gayatri madam pranam very nicely presented Vishkar, vishwakarma's mahatma after a long time witnessing someone presenting it in a meticulous manner prakash uh, you is saying gayatri ma'am the presentation is excellent and uh, uh, there are other uh, comments about uh, the panni amma's uh, paper also sridharan ji enjoyed panni amma's paper so these are all comments and compliments so because there are no questions to be taken up uh, let us uh, i think wind up for today and let us uh, join again tomorrow uh, for the second day session shafali ji Please. Yeah, uh, I would like to extend a huge thank you to all the speakers for today's sessions. They were, uh, one second. Yeah, I would like to th thank all the speakers for today's sessions. There were some really, really interesting papers and presentations. And I thoroughly enjoyed, uh, and there was a lot of passion as well as a lot of knowledge being disseminated. And I look forward to the sessions tomorrow, particularly the question and answer sessions with two stapatis who are trained in two very different traditions about how Hindu art and the philosophical moorings behind it are perceived. Thank you so much. Thank you, Nagraji, for all your comments and for all your help. Thank you, Srinivasji, for all the technical help. And uh, I look forward to seeing all of you tomorrow. Shankarji, did you want to say something? No, no, sir. Yeah, okay. So, Namaste to all of you. Angikam bhuvanam yesya vachikam sarvavangayam ahadhyan chandrakaradi tamvade sattvikam shivam.